Thank you. Um, we now come to presentation of Bill Paul Maynard. Yeah, 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 yeah. House of Lords elected Senate Bill. Uh, second reading, what day? Friday, 9th of September. Friday, the 9th of September. Thank you. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, second reading. Now, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I need to inform the House that the reasoned amendments have not been um, selected. And before um, I ask the Foreign Secretary to move the second reading, um, I do want to reiterate how important it is for members who wish to speak in the debate to be here at the beginning, um, to hear all the opening speeches, to stay in the chamber for the vast majority of the um, debate, and to be there certainly for the wind-ups and to be there in good time. It's very discourteous uh, not to follow those rules, especially on an important debate like this. Um, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss to move the second reading. Yeah, 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 yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I beg to move that the bill be now read a second time. We are taking this action to uphold the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which has brought peace and political stability to Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland Protocol is undermining the functioning of the agreement and of power sharing. It has created fractures between East and West. It has diverted trade and meant people in Northern Ireland are being treated differently from people in Great Britain. It has weakened their economic rights. This has created a sense that parity of esteem between different parts of the community, an essential part of the agreement, has been damaged. This bill will address these political challenges and fix the practical problems the protocol has created. It avoids a hard border and protects the integrity of the UK and the EU single market. It is necessary because the growing issues in Northern Ireland, including on tax and on customs, are baked into the protocol itself. Our preference remains a negotiated way. solution, and the bill contains a provision that allows for negotiated agreement. But the EU has ruled out, up front, making changes to the text of the protocol. I'll give way to honourable friend. I'm very grateful to the Foreign Secretary, and I congratulate her on her very patient and good diplomacy. Will she confirm <laughs> that this very moderate measure is completely legal and essential to the peace and goodwill of Northern Ireland? I can absolutely confirm to my right honourable friend that this bill is both necessary and legal, and the Government has published a legal statement setting it out. I'll make a bit more progress and then I'll allow some further interventions. We continue to raise the issues of concern with our European partners, but we simply cannot allow this situation to drift. Northern Ireland has been without a devolved government since February, due specifically to the protocol, at a time of major global economic challenges. Therefore, it is the duty of this government to act now to enable a plan for restored local government to begin. It is both legal and necessary. This bill fixes the specific problems that have been caused in Northern Ireland, whilst maintaining those parts of the protocol that are working. It fixes problems in four areas – customs and SPS, a dual regulatory model, subsidy control and VAT, and governance. On customs and SPS, the bill creates a green and red lane system. All those trading into Northern Ireland will be part of a trusted trader scheme. Goods destined for Northern Ireland will not face customs bureaucracy. Goods for the Republic of Ireland and the EU will go through full EU-style border procedures. And all data for both the green and red lanes will be shared with the EU in real time as the goods depart from Great Britain. This means the EU will have this data before the goods arrive in Northern Ireland, ensuring that the EU single market is protected. I'll give way to the honourable gentleman. 
Can, can I thank the Secretary of State uh, for bringing this forward and for uh, her comprehensive understanding of the position of many people in Northern Ireland? Someone who has had businesses contacting him from those who have openly stated they are from a nationalist tradition and yet feel afraid to voice complaints to their own MPs, as an example, due to fear of reprisal. That I speak with confidence, and I can assure the Secretary of State of this issue, that Northern Ireland as a whole needs this bill not simply for cultural identity, which is imperative for financial viability for the small businesses and the effects of the EU's vindictive approach to block VAT and state aid. Really, Secretary of State, this bill is long overdue. Just to say that interventions should be fairly brief, because we've got a lot of people wanting to speak in this debate. Foreign Secretary. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was talking about the data that we are sharing with the EU, and I'm pleased to say that we already have this system in place. We're giving demonstrations to businesses and the EU to show how it works, and I'm very happy to make those demonstrations available to members of Parliament as well. Any trader violating the lanes will face penalties and would face ejection from the scheme. I'll give way to the Honourable Friend. I'm, I'm extremely grateful to the Foreign Secretary for giving way, and I have an immense amount of sympathy with what she is saying. And it does seem to me that the EU is not being particularly constructive in trying to get the solution that we all want to be, see achieved. But can I say to her that many of us are extremely concerned that the bill brazenly breaks a solemn international treaty, it trashes our international reputation, it threatens a trade war at a time when our economy is flat, and it puts us at odds with our most important <laughs> ally. Can she say anything to reassure me in my anxieties on these points? Well, as I said at the outset, our preference is for a negotiated solution, and we have sought a negotiated solution for 18 months. But as recently as last weekend, the EU have refused to change the text of the protocol. That is why there is strong legal justification, as set out in our legal statement, for us taking this action, because our priority as the United Kingdom Government has to be political stability within our own country. And whilst we put this bill through Parliament, we will continue to seek a negotiated solution with the EU. And in fact, there are provisions of the bill to deliver it. So I would strongly encourage my right honourable friend to raise this with the EU directly and to encourage a negotiated solution because there is a solution to be achieved. We have laid it out very clearly with our red and green lane proposal, but we do need the EU to agree to change the text of the protocol. That is the fundamental issue that needs to be addressed. I'll give way to the honourable lady. I'm grateful to her for giving way. Um, the government's legal position um, prays a need the international law doctrine of necessity, but the International Law Commission says that where a state has itself contributed to the situation of necessity, that doctrine can't be prayed in aid. Now, given that the Prime Minister signed the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol, in the yeah. knowledge that it would give rise to precisely the difficulties yeah. of which they now complain, which we debated on the floor of this House, <laughs> doesn't she see that there's a pretty big hole in the legal advice that she's been given? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we set out the case extremely clearly in the legal advice, and the doctrine of necessity has been used by other governments in the past where there is a severe issue and the other party is unwilling to renegotiate that treaty. And that is the position that we are in with the Northern Ireland Protocol. And what I would say to the Honourable Lady and indeed other members on the opposition benches is given the EU refuse to reopen the Northern Ireland Protocol, and those issues such as customs and tax are specifically baked in. What is their solution to dealing with the real issues in Northern Ireland? We have looked at all the alternative solutions, and the only solution that is effective is this Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. In the absence of the EU being willing to negotiate a new protocol, I'll give way to my honourable friend. I'm most grateful to my right honourable friend. She could also point out that the protocol itself contains provisions for it to be changed, and the EU refuses to contemplate using those provisions. 
And may I also just point out that at the time we signed the protocol, we did not know the shape of the trade and cooperation agreement, and it was reasonable to expect the EU to give mutual recognition of products and standards and mutual recognition of SPS standards, as, for example, they have with New Zealand, and they refused to give us those provisions. The problems in the protocol would be much less if they had given us a better trade deal. Well, my, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely right about the fact that the protocol isn't set in stone. And this is why, for the past 18 months, this government has sought to achieve negotiated changes in the protocol. But in the absence of the EU being willing to change the text, the only way to resolve this is for us to legislate. Now, I'm going to make more progress, and then I will take more interventions. We fully understand and respect the legitimate concerns of the EU that the single market should be protected, and our solution does just that. The Bill will also establish a dual regulatory regime, so businesses can choose between meeting UK and EU standards. This removes the barriers to goods made to UK standards for being sold in Northern Ireland, and it cuts the processes that drive up costs for business. It prevents unnecessary divergence between two parts of the UK internal market, and anyone who trades into the EU single market will still have to do so according to EU standards. The Bill will also ensure that the Government can set UK-wide policies on subsidy control and VAT, overcoming constraints that have meant Northern Ireland hasn't benefited from the same support as the rest of the UK. For example, at present, people in Northern Ireland are not able to benefit from the VAT cuts on solar panels that the Chancellor announced in the Spring Statement. These are essential functions of any 21st century state, but they are especially important in Northern Ireland, where the UK Government plays an outsized role in the local economy. We will maintain, I'll give way in a minute, we will maintain the arrangements in the Protocol on VAT, which support trade on the island of Ireland while ensuring Northern Ireland can still benefit from the freedoms and flexibility available in Great Britain. I'll give way to the Honourable well, Lady. I'm grateful to, for giving way. I wonder if she understands why so many people would accuse this government of the most rank hypocrisy. First of all, this is a predictable outcome of the agreement that they negotiated yeah. Yeah. when they didn't give a fig for the situation <laughs> in Northern Ireland, quite yeah. frankly. Secondly, if they were serious about negotiations, they could be using Article 16. And thirdly, at the very same time that the Prime Minister is glad-handing G7 leaders in Bavaria and extolling the virtues of a rule based international system, his own government at home is riding a, co a horse and coaches through a rules-based system. Does she understand the concerns we have and what kind of reputation is the UK going to have on a global stage as a result? Well, as I made clear, we are very clear that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement should have primacy. The fact is that it has been undermined over the past two years, and we can see that in the fact that the institutions of Northern Ireland aren't up and running, and that is why the Government needs to act. And we're doing so in a reasonable and legal way. I'll give way on my I'm very grateful for my right on friend give way, and I accept entirely her desire to achieve a negotiated settlement, if at all possible. I know how much work has gone into that. But taking her back to the legal point, she will know that the application of the doctrine of necessity implies, requires uh, both the legal tests being met but also the evidential base, because it is largely fact-specific to show whether or not those tests have in fact been made. I know that the, the Government has been working hard to assemble that evidential base, uh, but can she tell us as to when that evidential base is going to be available to the House so that we can form a judgment uh, as to whether or not those legal tests are met and that therefore proportionality and necessity is actually met. It would be very helpful to have that perhaps before we find, come to a conclusion on the Bill. Well, well I thank my right hon. Friend for that point. There are clearly very, very severe issues in Northern Ireland, including the fact that the institutions in Northern Ireland aren't up and running, which means that the UK has to act and cannot allow this situation to drift. And I don't think, uh, I don't think Madam Deputy Speaker, we've heard from the opposition about what their alternative would be, apart from simply hoping that the EU might 
suddenly negotiate or come up with a new outcome. I'll give way. Maybe the Honourable Lady can give us an idea about what her alternative plan is. Over the past six years, I've given several alternatives, including as a shadow minister. My, point, my question to the uh, Secretary of State is she talks about the institutions. Can she give the House today uh, the, uh, the details on the agreement she has secured from the political parties in Northern Ireland that they will return to Stormont on the completion or even indeed the completion of second reading, any point during the committee stage or on third reading? What in this bill has secured that going back and what role is there for anybody in Northern Ireland with the powers going to the Minister of the Crown? Well, I note the Honourable Lady hasn't come up with any alternatives to this bill to be able to move the situation forward. And the, the approach we have taken with the four areas that I'm currently talking through is we've identified what the practical problems are for the people of Northern Ireland, and we have come up with solutions that address those problems whilst protecting the EU single market. And it is our expectation that the passage of this bill will result in the institutions being re-established. I will, Madam Deputy Speaker, make progress on talking through the elements of the bill, and then I'm very happy to accept further interventions later on in this debate. The bill will ensure that the Government can set UK-wide policies on subsidy control and VAT, overcoming the constraints that have meant Northern Ireland hasn't benefited from the same support of the rest of the UK, as I mentioned. It will also maintain the arrangements in the protocol on VAT which support trade on the island of Ireland, whilst ensuring Northern Ireland can still benefit from the freedoms and flexibilities available in Great Britain. It will remove the role of the European Court where it is not appropriate, including its role as the final arbiter of disputes. This is in line with normal international dispute resolution provisions, including in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. The Bill will also enable courts to seek an opinion from the European Court on legitimate questions of the interpretation of EU law, ensuring that it can still be applied for the purposes of North-South trade. The Belfast Good Friday Agreement is based on consent from both communities. All unionist parties have cited the European Court as a main cause of a major democratic deficit. Together with VAT and state aid rules, it causes unionists to feel less connected and less part of the UK. This is not a hypothetical issue. The European Court has already become one of the most controversial elements of the protocol threatening to disrupt everyday lives. Mm. The EU has brought infraction proceedings against the UK in five areas, covering issues like parcels and transporting pets. And to be absolutely clear, the Bill only changes the parts of the protocol that are causing the problems and undermining the three strands of the Belfast Good Friday mm. Agreement. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm very grateful to the Foreign Secretary. It's a very short question, really, which is simply this. Um, she says that the Bill is legal. Um, lots of other people disagree with her, including lots of very eminent lawyers, both in this country and elsewhere. Which body will arbitrate on that decision as to whether this bill is legal? Well, we have published our government legal statement, which clearly states the reasons that this bill is legal and the necessity of pursuing this bill. And I do return to my point about the lack of alternatives being proposed by the opposition. This, we have exhausted all the other avenues, and this remains the course of action that is actually going to deliver for the people of Ireland, Northern Ireland, and re-establish the institutions. I give way to my honourable friend. Yeah, I, I thank the honourable lady for giving way. And I, well, there's a lot of talk about international law here. Can I take her to clause three of Article two of the UN Charter? that says all members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. That's incumbent on us and the EU, and they need to, they need to engage with us and negotiate in order to, that the peace is not threatened. Well, my, my, my honourable friend is right, and it is very clear from the legal advice that one of the issues is that the EU won't change the text of the protocol, even though when the protocol was negotiated, it was very clear that it wasn't set in stone, that it should be subject to change because of the very unique situation in Northern Ireland. 
But, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are very clear that there are elements of the protocol that are working and that we do want to maintain. We will maintain the conditions for north-south cooperation and trade and uphold the common travel area. We will maintain the functioning of the single electricity market, which benefits both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And the Bill provides specific powers to implement technical regulations as part of our solution. And today, we launched consultation with businesses to make sure that the way this bill is implemented works for the people of business in Northern Ireland and will continue consulting with businesses and the EU over the coming weeks to make sure the implementation works. On that point. One of the fundamental purposes of this long-awaited bill is to uphold the critical Good Friday Agreement, which, as the whole House knows, completely underpins the maintenance of peace and political stability in Northern Ireland. That being the case, for those who follow this matter closely, including in the United States, we should confirm that one of the strongest advocates for action on this has indeed been Lord Trimble, the Nobel Laureate, who helped to negotiate the Good Friday Agreement in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my, um, my right hon. Friend is absolutely right. We all know how hard won peace and political stability in Northern Ireland was. And we all know how important it is that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is upheld and is not undermined. And that is the discussion I have been having with colleagues in the United States around the world. And those who experience the situation in Northern Ireland fully understand how important it is we act and cannot allow this situation to drift on. I know there are those across the House who want to give negotiation more time. The problem we face is we've already been negotiating for 18 months. We have a negotiating partner who is refusing to change the text of the protocol. Meanwhile, we have a worsening situation in Northern Ireland. So it is firmly the view of this government that we need to act. And we are pursuing this legislation as all other options have been exhausted. Our first choice was and remains renegotiating the protocol text with the EU. And this is in line with the evolution of other treaties, which happens all the time. For example, both the EU and the UK are currently renegotiating changes to the Energy Charter Treaty. Given the unique nature of Northern Ireland and the unprecedented nature of these arrangements, it was always likely that flexibility would be needed. In fact, this flexibility was explicitly acknowledged in the protocol itself. But despite the fact that we have been pursuing these renegotiations, we have not seen the flexibility needed from the EU. As recently as this weekend, the EU said it will not re renegotiate the text of the protocol. And members across the House will have seen that the EU put forward proposals last year and again a fortnight ago. I think it's worth pointing out that those proposals will actually leave the people and businesses of Northern Ireland worse off than the current standstill arrangements. Their proposals would make the situation worse on the ground, adding further to the tensions and stresses of the situation. So goods going solely to Northern Ireland would still face customs paperwork <laughs> and SPS certificates. I'll give way to my honourable friend. Thank you. Would my right honourable friend agree that this bill is born out of necessity, necessity yeah. to act in our national interest, to provide for a permanent solution to a temporary measure, to preserve the Belfast Agreement, to preserve the constitutional settlement that keeps Northern Ireland as part of the UK and prevent a democratic deficit, and a necessity to use international law to safeguard, protect our essential interests whilst protecting those of the EU? Well, my my hon. Friend is absolutely right. And we still face a situation where the EU have refused to change the text of the protocol, and their proposals do not even address many of the issues of concern, namely over governance, subsidies, manufactured goods, and VAT. And without dealing with those very real issues for the people of Northern Ireland, we're not going to see the balance of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement restored. We're not going to see 
the cross-community support that we need to get the political institutions back up and running. I'll give way to the honourable gentleman. Grateful to the Foreign Secretary. The Foreign Secretary knows that the three things that need to be resolved are the friction with trade, repairing the harm to our constitutional position within this country, and erasing the democratic deficit at the heart of the protocol. And the Foreign Secretary has fairly outlined the myriad of steps that this government have taken, and that this bill is required, it can have our support in resolving these issues. But the Foreign Secretary will also hear a lot of opposition from this side of the House. In hearing that opposition from colleagues to my right and my left, can she identify one of them who advocated using Article 16 or the provisions of the protocol, or have they simply no issue with trying to resolve the issues that are affecting the people of Northern Ireland today? Well, the, the Honourable Gentleman makes a very good point, and those who are advocating further negotiation with the EU do need to persuade the EU to change their negotiating mandate so that the text of the protocol can change, because we know that those specific issues, like the customs bureaucracy, like the VAT, can only be addressed by addressing the text of the protocol itself. And I wanted to come on to the specific point uh, the Honourable Gentleman made about Article 16. Of course, we have looked at triggering Article 16 to deal with this issue. However, we came to the conclusion that it would not resolve the fundamental issues in the protocol. It is only a temporary measure, and it would only treat some of the symptoms without fixing the root cause of the problems which are baked into the protocol text itself. It could also lead to attrition and litigation with the EU while not delivering sufficient change. Now, I want to be clear, Madam Deputy Speaker, we do not rule out using Article 16 further down the line if the circumstances demand it, but in order to fix the very real problems in Northern Ireland, in order to get the political institutions back up and running, the only solution that is effective and provides the comprehensive and durable solution is this bill. I give way to the gentleman. I am very grateful to the Foreign Secretary for, for giving way, and I suspect that when she was campaigning for Britain to remain in the European Union, she never in a million years thought she'd be standing here proposing a bill of this sort. In, in the light of the comment she has just made about Article 16, why is the Government not proposing to use the legal method to raise these questions with the European Union through the treaty that it signed, rather than one claiming necessity when the Foreign Secretary has yet to give me a single example where the British Government has claimed necessity for abrogating a treaty that it has negotiated and signed. Well, Madam Speaker, the reason I'm putting this bill forward is because I'm a patriot and I'm a Democrat. And our number one priority, our number one priority is protecting peace and political stability in Northern Ireland and protecting the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And nothing the Honourable Gentleman has suggested will achieve that end. Madam Deputy Speaker, I will finish off my remarks. The only way that we will uphold the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and fix the problems in Northern Ireland is to pass this legislation. And we've heard on the opposite side of the House all kinds of complaining about the solution we're putting forward, but we've heard no alternative solution that will deliver. We've heard no alternative solution that will deliver. I want to be very clear this is not my preferred choice. But in the absence of a negotiated solution, we have no other choice. There is no need for the EU to react negatively. They will be no worse off as a result of this legislation. These issues are very small in the context of the single market, but they are critically important for Northern Ireland. I'll give way. I'm very grateful. The Foreign Secretary knows 
that I have grave concerns about her bill. But could I ask her just to coolly reflect upon praying in aid patriotism as a defence of it? Is she seriously impugning the patriotism of colleagues across this House who have concerns about her bill? I find that a false conflation. I was, I was directly responding uh, to the point of the Honourable Gentleman asking me why I had campaigned one way in the referendum and now I'm working to make sure that the Brexit negotiation that we achieve works for the people of Northern Ireland. And that is because I believe in the union of the, of the United Kingdom. I believe in the relationship between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and I want to resolve those issues. And all I am pointing out, Madam Deputy Speaker, to colleagues around this House, is that I have negotiated in good faith with the European Union, but they have refused to change the text of the protocol. I have looked at all the options, including triggering Article 16, to see whether that would work to resolve the very serious issues in Northern Ireland, and I have come to the genuine conclusion that they will not. As I have said, these solutions work for the people. I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. The, uh, I thank the Secretary of State for uh, giving way. Will the Secretary of State now commit that never again will a government stand at that dispatch box and change the Act of Union in a way which is detrimental to this United Kingdom that we all adhere to and all admire. Will she also confirm that over 300 hours have been spent in negotiations with the EU and they have resisted any change whatsoever, such as their animosity towards Northern Ireland? Well, the very clear reason we are acting now is that there has been a refusal to change the text of the protocol that is causing the very real problems in Northern Ireland. And as I've said, these issues are very small in the context of the single market, but they are critically important for the people of Northern Ireland. And that is in whose interest we act in putting through this bill. Once this legislation is enacted, we can draw a line under this issue and unleash the full potential of our relationship with the EU. Fundamentally, we share a belief in democracy, in freedom and the right of all countries to self-determination. We are natural allies in an increasingly uncertain and geopolitical world. I won't give way any more. I'm I'm almost at the end of my remarks. The House will be uh, pleased to hear. We want to work with the EU for the betterment, not just of Europe, but the world and to focus all of our efforts on tackling external threats like Putin's Russia. Once this legislation is through, we will have a solution that helps restore the balance between the communities and uphold the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. That is the purpose of this bill, and I commend it to the House. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lamb. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Less than three years ago, the Prime Minister stood at that dispatch box seeking to persuade the House to support the withdrawal agreement and that he had negotiated it with the European Union. It was, he said, a great deal for England, for Scotland for Wales and Northern Ireland. He urged each of us to show, and I quote, the same breadth of vision our European neighbours had with whom he had struck the agreement. He reassured us that, above all, we and our European friends have preserved the letter and the spirit of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. His deal, he argued, was in perfect conformity with the Good Friday Agreement. Today, 18 months after it came into the force, the government is taking a wrecking ball to its own agreement. 
before giving way, and I refer to the comments that were made by the member for Leeds. Uh, 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 indeed, a, a very good proposal that was made just a few moments ago that uh, he would trigger and should trigger Article 16. Is the opposition, Her Majesty's opposition, agreeing with that proposal? Do you believe, does the Shadow Secretary believe that Article 16 should be triggered and triggered now? Well, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, this opposition thinks that there is a better way forward through negotiation, but at least the proposition he suggests is legal, and I'll come on to that in a moment. I will give way. I'm grateful. Given that in all this the most important thing is peace and getting power sharing up and running, will the right honourable gentleman acquaint the House with the discussions he's had with the DUP as to what his solution is to uh, resolving this issue? given that they are refusing to rejoin power sharing unless a protocol has been dealt with. I'm sure the Honourable General has discussed this with the DUP. Will he acquaint the House with this problem? Can I say that the DUP, uh, in our discussions, has consistently said that they wanted a negotiated settlement until this bill was published today? I'll make some progress. In so doing... <laughs> and it is doing so... And, uh, Point of order, Ian Paisley, but I do hope this isn't a way of disrupting the debate. Order, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, is it an order for the Shadow Secretary of State to indicate that he has had negotiations with the Democratic Unionist Party when no such negotiations have taken place? What it, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order. Needs to sit down. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman knows that it's, it is, he is well capable of asking to intervene again on the Shadow Secretary of State, if that's what he wishes to do. It really does undermine our debates if we just constantly come up with these endless points of order that um, interrupt the debate, and it's not, really not a fair way to do it. The Honourable Gentleman is trying to catch my eye later, and I really suggest that you know, we try to respect each other in the Chamber. David Lammy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I won't give way. I'm going to make some progress. Yeah. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, in bringing this bill to the House, the government is doing so because it objects to the text that it negotiated and the choices that it freely made. It is asking each member of this House to vote for a bill that flouts international law. Madam Deputy Speaker, that is never a proposition that should be put to honourable members. This bill is damaging and counterproductive. The strategy behind it is flawed. The legal justification for it is feeble. The precedent it sets is dangerous, and the timing could hardly be worse. It divides the United Kingdom and the European Union at a time when we should be pulling together against Putin's war on the continent, and it risks causing new trade barriers during a cost of living crisis. I will give way. Very grateful. The protocol makes very clear the primacy of the Good Friday Agreement for peace in Northern Ireland and says that the EU will respect our internal market. They are doing neither. What is his policy to persuade them to do so? Yeah. Yeah. Negotiate. Yeah. Just yeah. as this does as this opposition did to get the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. We negotiate. Yeah. You do not break international law and alienate our partners and allies, not just in Europe but across the world. And yeah. the honourable gentleman should know better. Yeah. Yeah. Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker. As we debate this bill, we should ask ourselves some simple questions. First, will this bill resolve the situation in Northern Ireland? Second, is it in the best interests of our great country? And third, is it compatible with our commitment to the rule of law? Now, let me take each in turn. I won't give way at this moment. Let's deal with Northern Ireland first as context. None of us in this House doubt the situation in Northern Ireland is serious. 
uh, on this side of the House, we need no reminder of the importance of the Good Friday Agreement, one of the proudest achievements of a Labour government achieved together with parties and communities across Northern Ireland and the Irish Government in Dublin. It was the result of hard work and compromise, of graft and statesmanship, a relentless focus on the goal of peace. It was born six months after Bloody Sunday. For more than half of my lifetime, Northern Ireland endured the pain and violence of conflict and division. More than three and a half thousand people were killed, thousands more were injured, cities and communities riven by intolerance and division. I remember what this conflict brought to my own city, from the Baltic exchange attack to the Docklands bombing. And Madam Deputy Speaker, above that door and others to this very chamber are plaques to Airy Neve, to Ian Gow, to Sir Anthony Berry, to Robert Bradford, and most recently to Sir Henry Wilson. Nearly a quarter of a century has passed since that hopeful Easter in 1998. Since then, we've seen transformational progress. A generation has grown up in a new Northern Ireland, harvesting the fruits of a hard-won peace. That legacy demands that all of us act with the utmost responsibility and sensitivity. We need calm heads at this moment and responsible leadership. We recognise that the operation of the protocol and the barriers and checks that were inherent to its design have created new tensions that do need to be addressed. Unionists feel that their place in the UK is threatened, and we must listen to all concerns of all sides. We all want to see power sharing restored, both the UK Government and the European Union and parties across Northern Ireland need to show willing and to act in good faith. But at its most fundamental level, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Bill will not achieve its objectives. This House cannot impose a unilateral solution when progress demands both sides agreeing. This is not an act of good faith, nor is it a long-term solution. Only an agreement that works for all sides and delivers for people and businesses of Northern Ireland will have durability and provide the political stability that businesses crave and the public deserve. Instead, this bill will make a resolution more difficult. By breaking its obligations, the government dissolves that little trust that remains by taking this aggressive action, we make it harder for those on the other side of the table to compromise. And on that basis alone, this bill should be rejected. I give way. I, I thank the uh, Shadow Secretary of State for giving way and uh, recognise the comments he has made about the uh, Belfast Agreement and the need for consensus. And he is aware that there is not a consensus in support of the protocol and never has been from day one in Northern Ireland. And I gave time, a lot of time, for the negotiations to progress, and that didn't work, because the EU fundamentally refuses to change the text of the protocol. So will the Shadow Secretary of State, if he is serious about getting a solution that works, go to the EU and join the government in making the argument that they need to agree to a negotiation where they are prepared to change the text of the protocol. Well, I'm grateful to the right honourable uh, gentleman, um, and obviously for his experience uh, in these matters, and indeed when the protocol was being negotiated in the first place. Can I say to him that I did meet um, uh, with um, EU ambassadors in London last week and made that very point and can I point him to the speech that I made uh, last week as well in which I highlighted exactly what he has just said. I'll give way to the other one that makes him very grateful and I don't think anyone in this house can doubt his personal commitment to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement after the remarks he has made and as someone whose father was nearly blown up in the Grand Hotel, I share that passion. But the problem he's got to grapple with, 
He wants a negotiation. What if they will not negotiate? What would he do then? Because that is the position we're in. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. cannot elevate the protocol to be more important than the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Yeah, and yeah. that is the necessity we face. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I accept the sincerity with which the Right Honourable Gentleman makes his remarks. Uh, let me just say that they have said that trust is at an all-time low. And the question for this House is, that, does this, this maintain trust or assist with trust, given that ultimately this will be an agreement and it will be negotiated? I will give way. I'm grateful to my right honourable friend who's making a, a brilliant speech. Is he aware of comments from the US Trade Representative, Ambassador Tai, and indeed from Speaker Pelosi, and indeed from a host of our American allies on Congress, who have been very clear with us that there will be no US-UK trade deal unless there is a durable way forward on the Northern Ireland question. So not only does this reckless approach risk destroying relations with the EU, it risks a deal with America too. My right honourable friend is exactly right. I have been to Washington on three occasions in the last six months and I can say that across the political divide, Republicans and Democrats have raised this issue. And on my most recent visit, they were aghast. They had not seen the content at that stage, but they were aghast at the proposition uh, of this bill. And perhaps, perhaps the Secretary of State, uh, when she rises to, or when he rises to conclude, might say what our American friends um, uh, and allies have said in relation to this bill now that they have seen the draft. But can I just make some progress? The second point that I wanted to make is, is it in the best interests of this country? As we stand here today, Britain faces the worst cost of living crisis in decades. Inflation is at more than 9%. Bills are rising. Energy costs are soaring. Supply chains are under pressure. It beggars belief why, at this time, would the government choose to risk new frictions in our trading relations with the European Union. The government cannot get away with abdicating responsibility for this reckless conduct. If we choose to break a contract, we cannot plausibly expect the other side to take no action in response. We cannot claim that we did not foresee the consequences in advance. Of course the European Union would respond, just as we would if the situation were reversed. And I wager that the Foreign Secretary would be one of the first people to complain if the ball was on the other foot. Madam Deputy Speaker, a game of brinkmanship with the European Union will only add to our economic problems. But it's not just about economic concerns, important though those are. We must also see the bigger picture. For four months, the Putin regime has fought a bloody war against Ukraine. As a parliament, we have been united in our support for Ukraine and our staunch opposition of Russian's aggression. NATO allies and European partners have stood together. How can this be the right moment to deepen a diplomatic row? How can be this the right time to tell our friends and partners that we cannot be relied on? I cannot help but note that some of the members opposite told us the situation in Ukraine was too serious. This was not the right time to change Prime Minister. But apparently it's not serious enough to stop starting a, a diplomatic fight Good with point. some of our closest allies. Third, Madam Deputy Speaker, is this bill compatible with international law? Quite simply, the bill breaks international law. The bill provides for a wholesale rewrite of an international treaty in domestic law. 
And one of the most troubling aspects is the dangerous legal distortion that is used to justify it. The doctrine of necessity is not an excuse for states to abandon their obligations. It exists to do precisely the opposite, to constrain the circumstances when states can legitimately claim their hand has been forced. It requires this action to be the only way possible to resolve the issue. But the government has not used Article 16 and still says a negotiated solution is possible. It requires a grave and imminent peril, but the government has chosen a route that will take months of parliamentary wrangling to fix issues like unequal VAT rates that no reasonable person could consider a matter of grave peril. It requires the invoking state not to have contributed to the situation of necessity, but the problems are as a direct result of the choices that this government made when negotiating with the European Union. If they were not, we would not need to change the text of the protocol at all. To the Honourable Gentleman for giving way, he's making a very powerful speech, particularly on the legal points. He's listed all the problems with the government's uh, legal note of advice. Does he, like me, find it interesting that whenever any of us raise these points, Nobody on the benches opposite are capable of answering them. Well, my learn the, learned the learned lady knows that there really isn't a serious Queen's Council in the country that would support the use of the doctrine of necessity in the way that the government has sought to. She knows that, and I think, I think that honourable members opposite do as well. For the honourable gentleman, he's just, in the course of his uh, words previously, said that um, indicated the government should use article should have used Article 16. I think if I didn't hear him right, he did. He said they haven't yet used Article 16. In other words, indicating that they should use Article 16 before going down this road. But it was, in fact, uh, the member for Sheffield Healy, who I think is the Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary, who said, and I quote, triggering Article 16 will prolong and deepen uncertainty in Northern Ireland and be another huge risk to stability in Northern Ireland. Does it now mean that they should have triggered Article 16 or that they shouldn't, or maybe there is a disagreement, or maybe it won't be decided until after this bill? Well, I, th I think the right honourable gentleman is putting words in my mouth. Article 16 arises in relation to uh, the defence that the government suggests of the doctrine of necessity, i.e. they haven't used it. Uh, and, 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 and the point of using it is, it, is at the very least, it would be legal. Exactly. Um, exactly. We wouldn't have had problems. to, we'd have negotiated. Madam Deputy Speaker, Pacta Sunt Savanda. Agreements must be kept. This is the essence of international law. The solemn promise of states acting in good faith and upholding their commitments to treaties that they have agreed. How would we react if a country we negotiated with did the same thing and simply disregarded the commitments we had mutually agreed upon them? I do not doubt that if an authoritarian state used necessity to justify its actions in breaking a treaty in the manner the government is proposing to do through this bill, the Foreign Secretary and so many of us across this House would condemn it. Since she became Foreign Secretary, the Foreign Office has issued countless statements or press releases urging others to meet their international obligations. Iran under the JCPOA, China under the Joint Declaration of Hong Kong, Russia under the Budapest Memorandum. In just the last fortnight, the Foreign Office, under her leadership, has publicly called on Bolivia, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Nicaragua, South Sudan, Eritrea and Ethiopia to meet their international obligations. Madam Deputy Speaker, hypocrisy is corrosive to our foreign policy, and I know members from across the House share these concerns. Very grateful, but I actually take two points from his mention of the Budapest Accord. The first is when the UK signs a document, it needs really to stand by it. 
We didn't stand by the Budapest Accord either. We didn't make sure that the text was proper before we brought it to Parliament. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we've got the problems that we're in today, isn't it? Well, the right honourable gentleman is absolutely right. Um, when we use the phrase honourable in this house, across this house, that means something. It's something about the integrity of this place, and it's something about the preeminent position that this parliament and this country finds itself in on matters of international affairs. And that's why this moment is such a very sombre moment. The Honourable Member for Giving Way, um, it's a thoughtful speech, and, and I think these matters deserve thoughtful consideration. But could he take advantage of the time at the dispatch box to, to tell us, would he change the protocol? If so, how he would change it? And how he thinks the process of negotiation, which has failed so far, would achieve those changes? Well, I'll make some progress, but I've said that this party would negotiate just as we negotiated the Good Friday Agreement. I give way. The Shadow Secretary of State has made much of the government ab abandoning its obligations. But surely the obligation in the protocol was designed from the EU's point of view to, to protect the EU single market. Now, how does this bill not give that guarantee to the EU when, first of all, goods going into the Republic will be checked? Secondly, there will be severe penalties on those who try to evade those checks. And thirdly, the, any firms producing in Northern Ireland will have, to be, uh, will have to abide by EU rules and comply with EU rules when they are sending goods to the Republic. Surely that safeguards the single market. The obligations have been met. Some checks are all right. Well, I say to the gentleman, yes, it needs to be improved. Yes. The question is how exactly. is the best method to exactly. achieve that? And is breaking international law is a situation in which our then. EU partners don't yeah. trust us. I mean, you, you do is that the best no, way? Let me just make some. No, let me just make some progress because I've been that's, on my feet for a long time, and good. lots of honourable that's, members that's, want that's, to contribute yeah. to this that's debate. We'll do it our country's reputation is a matter, Madam Deputy Speaker, beyond party. It's a hard won and easily lost. When this bill was first mooted, the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead asked what would such a move say about the United Kingdom and its willingness to abide by treaties that it had signed. As the Right Honourable Member for Bromley and Chislehurst has said in a very thoughtful piece on this legislation last week, our country benefits greatly from our reputation for keeping our word and upholding the rule of law. We should be very wary indeed of damaging that standing. And the Honourable Member for North Thanet has said, I don't see how any Member of Parliament can vote for a breach of international law. Lord Anderson and Lord Panic, amongst the most distinguished lawyers in the country, have called this bill a clear breach of international law. And I quote, it shows a lack of commitment to the rule of law and to a rules-based international system that damages the reputation of the United Kingdom. And Sir John Jones QC, formerly the most senior lawyer in government, has described the legal, I won't give way, has described the legal justification for this bill as, I quote, hopeless. This is, of course, the same distinguished lawyer who resigned the last time the government proposed legislation in violation of its own treaty commitments. On that occasion, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland had the temerity to tell the House the truth about the government's plan to break international law in a limited and specific way, to use his term. This bill breaks the withdrawal agreement in a broad and extensive way, while maintaining the pretense that it's somehow compliant. And I'm not sure what's worse, to be open about breaking the law or to dress it up as a treaty violation with this flimsy and transparent legal distortion. Undermining, I'll give way. He is making a thoughtful speech. So, can I ask him to confirm two things? One, can he confirm to the House he's actually read the Northern Ireland Protocol? 
and, uh, and if he has read it, if he has read it, can you remind the House what Article 13.8 says about the ability to amend or even supersede the protocol entirely? Can I say to the honourable gentleman, and you know he's been in this House for many years, like me, this is too serious for any shadow or minister not to have spent the whole weekend working hard on this bill, and he knows that. And he also knows that all of us come to this House hopeful, hopeful that we can reach agreement, but very, very conscious of the law-breaking that is going forward. And so, of course, I have. Undermining international law runs counter to Britain's interest. It damages Britain's moral authority and political credibility, and it risks emboldening dictators and authoritarian states around the world. It serves the best interests of those who want to weaken the rule of law. It is unbefitting of this great country. And Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill not only contravenes international law, it also affords this government extraordinary powers and denies proper respect to the role of this House. Fifteen of the 26 clauses confer powers on government ministers. The Hansard Society, not an organisation known for hyperbole, has called the powers given to ministers breathtaking. Professor Catherine Barnard of Cambridge University has called these powers eye-wateringly broad. Ministers may use these powers whenever they feel it appropriate. Clause 22 allows them to use these powers to amend Acts of Parliament. Clause 15 gifts ministers the power to disapply other parts of the protocol, even including potentially the Article on Democratic Consent in Northern Ireland. So ministers could use secondary legislation to change not just primary law, but an international treaty. This is a power grab so broad, Madam Deputy Speaker, it would make Henry VIII blush. Clause 19 allows ministers to implement a new deal with the European Union without primary legislation. To do our own backbenchers, I ask the question. That's without primary legislation. Do her own backbenchers really want to give any Foreign Secretary that power? Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a brazen executive overreach. It's an act of disrespect to Parliament, and all MPs should reject it. Will you give way? I will give way. Thank you. Excellent point. I wonder that the Secretary of State did not make herself about the power grab. But as well as disrespecting members in this House and Parliament taking back control, it is extraordinarily disrespectful of the representatives of people in Northern Ireland who have no say uh, in, in, in this now provision at all, as the, as the Secretary of State grabs all the power. Well, my honourable friend, my honourable friend makes a very, very important point, and I hope, should this bill reach committee stage, that that scrutiny about the powers that she is taking for herself and denying this Parliament uh, and Northern Ireland uh, is properly reflected on and considered. But I must make some progress because I'm very conscious that we will run out of time on this bill. Madam Deputy Speaker, as I've outlined, I believe the bill is damaging and counterproductive. I also believe it's unnecessary. We want to see checks reduced to an absolute necessary minimum, and there are practical solutions if we work to find them. Let's lower the temperature and focus on what works. For months, we've been urging the government to negotiate a veterinary agreement with the European Union that could remove the need for vast majority of the checks across the Irish Sea for goods travelling from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Um, Deputy Speaker, New Zealand has such an agreement. Why can't we? I do not believe it's beyond a British government to negotiate one. And that can be the basis of other steps to reduce friction, including improved data sharing. And I'm not one of those people that believes only the UK uh, uh, government needs to show flexibility. The EU has been too rigid as well. But the only way forward is to work hard on negotiation and compromise. I believe that with hard work and determination, with creativity and flexibility, we can overcome yeah, those challenges. Yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill is not the way forward. It will exacerbate the problems it hopes to solve. It will gift ministers unaccountable powers. It will divide us 
from our friends and allies in Europe when we should be united. It damages our country's reputation. It will break international law. The rule of law is not a Labour or a Conservative value. It's our common inheritance. Since Magna Carta in 1215, it is no exaggeration to say it's one of the greatest contributions our country has made to the world. No party owns it. No government should squander it. Britain should be a country that keeps its word. Let us stand for that principle and vote against this bill tonight. As will be very obvious to everyone here, there are many, many people who want to contribute to this debate. Um, I don't want to put a um, time limit on immediately. I think one will be necessary, but it would be greatly helped if backbench colleagues could combine their remarks to a maximum of 10 minutes, and I think they will be quite popular if they um, manage to say anything in rather less than that. Uh, Simon Hall. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, 10 minutes I'd always describe as opening remarks, and popularity is something I've always shunned. <laughs> the, the Shadow Foreign Secretary success. is right. At the heart of this is trust, or the absence of it, or, as she leaves, maybe the absence of trust. Is the, is, is, the protocol, is the protocol perfect? No, it's not. So it's not a question as to whether changes should be made, but how. And there are many ways to achieve change, but this bill is not one of them. The Office of Speaker's Council, Madam Deputy Speaker, has provided a legal opinion to all members of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, which raises enormous concerns about this bill's uh, legality. The Foreign Secretary and others have tried to conflate, have fallen into the trap of conflation, if you will, of the resurrection of devolution and the protocol. Those are two very separate and different work streams. We need to decouple them. Treaty making is reserved to this place. Devolution is the duty of the politicians of Northern Ireland. We can, we should be able to see the resurrection of one, negotiation on the other, but to conflate them and to fall into the trap, the result of that trap being this bill, is very sad indeed. It's not a well thought out bill, it's not a good bill, it's not a constitutional bill. The integrity of the United Kingdom can only be changed via the Good Friday Agreement. The protocol and trading arrangements does not interrupt or change the constitutional integrity of the UK. So for those who try to position this as a constitutional bill, I don't agree. Would, would, you, do, would you allow me? Because uh, I, I just want to make a few more things. I think this, is a, this bill is a failure of statecraft, and it puts at risk the reputation of the United Kingdom. The arguments supporting it are flimsy at best and irrational at worst. It's a bill that risks economically harmful retaliation, a bill that runs the risk of shredding our reputation as a guardian of international law and a rules-based system. How in the name of heaven can we expect to speak to others with authority when we ourselves shun at a moment's notice our legal obligation? A hard won reputation so easily played with. I'll give way to my neighbour. Full to my neighbour for, for giving way, making a very good speech. Uh, this is, of course, permissive legislation. Meanwhile, negotiations are ongoing. He refers to a failure of statecraft. Whose failure? Well, I think it's a failure, probably of both sides, yes. but a presumption that if I don't get my own way on everything, I'm going to take my ball off the pitch. I'm going to act unilaterally. I'm going to act off my own bat. That is not the way to do it. He knows as well as I do, as a former distinguished minister at the Northern Ireland office, most of Northern Ireland outcomes are based on compromise, of give and take, of finding the place and the path of least resistance. So it has been a failure of statecraft. I don't believe that this bill passes that international test of necessity. It has to pass all of the tests as set out in the, uh, in the statute, and it doesn't. So what is this bill? Is it a bargaining chip to try to browbeat the EU? Is it a bribe to honourable and right honourable members in the DUP to get back 
around the table at Stormont. Let me just finish what it, what it might be, and then, of course, I will give way to him. Is it a muscle flex for a future leadership bid to sacrifice on the, national rep uh, on the, na the, on the altar our national reputation for personal ambition would be, I think, shameful? Of course, I give way to the right honourable gentleman. I, I thank uh, the chair of the Select Committee for giving way. And the honourable uh, lady, the member for Bristol South, made a point earlier. Can I just say to the honourable member that what we have as a result of this protocol is a democratic deficit in Northern Ireland. Many of the laws that now regulate how we trade with the rest of the United Kingdom are made by a foreign entity over which we have no say whatsoever. Our VAT rates are set by that foreign entity. No taxation without representation. I don't need to be bribed to ask for what is the right of my people. Democracy. Democracy. To the right, that's a point with which I have much sympathy and which members of the committee discussed with the Commission when we were there last December. They are aware of that. And just as Norway, Norway has ministers of the Norwegian government in Brussels week in and week out discussing those things. The EU and he will know as well. Northern Irish business organisations are really keen to identify platforms whereby that democratic deficit can be in some way addressed. I agree with him entirely. I'm tempted to say to him, don't shout at me, sh shout at the ministers who advocated yeah, the yeah, protocol yeah. and that we should sign it all well, and mean, support it. I'm, 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 going to make some, I'm going to make some progress, uh, if, I, if I may. Four minutes. As a party, we have to be the party of the rule of law, or I would suggest we are uh, nothing. And I think it is sad in a way that we have to be reminded of that. This is a power grab. All of these Henry VIII clauses. Now, if we were being asked to pass this power to ministers who were asking us to polish what was already a superlative protocol, we might have some faith. But as they've already admitted that what they've negotiated, the results of which have either caught them by surprise, or they hadn't understood the import of what they were signing up to, they hadn't quite understood the terms of the words which we were meeting were told to expect that they were surprised that the other side would expect us and them to fulfil the obligations that we had negotiated. Now, I would suggest that given what we can all unite upon, I have little or no doubt, given our deep understanding, all of us, of the complexities and the difficulties of the politics of Northern Ireland, to have entered into something so lightly without understanding precisely all of the details and then say, well, we're having to do this because we didn't expect the other side to do it in the way that they want us to do it, is, I think, for the birds, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah. It is totally bonkers. <laughs> they told us that having reached a, dis a difficult compromise on the final text of the protocol, the government expected the EU to do something else. So with all of the history, all we were relied upon was expectation. These Henry VIII clauses really will not stick. Seventeen of the clauses give unspecified powers to ministers. If ta was taking back control, this Parliament handing powers to the executive for you to use for unspecified purposes, even worse, one of the clauses tells us that they are going to use powers to change powers that they might have changed in this bill if they subsequently think that those changes were wrong or ill-advised. I mean, it's not only just marking your own homework, it's copying somebody else's homework and then claiming all of the credit yourself. It just, of course I give way to my own friend. I do find it astonishing, I'm grateful to him, that he's got eight minutes into his speech and he's still not mentioned the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Well, my honourable friend was obviously not listening, because at the start I made very clear that the constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom is not touched by the protocol. The only, well, by definition, the only way that the constitutional integrity of Northern Ireland within our United Kingdom is contained within clauses of the Good Friday Agreement. Anybody who tries to position this protocol as, I won't if he, if he doesn't mind because of the time, um, anybody who thinks that this is in some way a backdoor to a speeding up of the reunification of Ireland is, I think, is, is, is fundamentally wrong. I, 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 I won't, and I know that uh, the Honourable Gentleman will understand me. 
The argument of necessity is clearly not made. The Prime Minister himself, and I agree, wants to see this done by negotiation. There is the option to trigger Article 16 if the government thinks that the necessity is there. And if, and if the situation is as bad as some ministers would have this House believe, one has to ask why they haven't used the emergency break of Article 16, but have instead suggested a very calm and tranquil Sunday afternoon walk through a bicameral system of legislative progress, something which is going to take 10 months. Now, either the data is as bad as they tell us it is, which incidentally, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is not, which then requires legal uh, uh, rapid action, or we are just going to do this, which then just suggests to me that this is all gamemanship and muscle flexing. Belfast Port is now handling a record amount of port, 25.6 million tonnes of cargo last year. The food and drink sector is benefit benefiting. More Irish business is buying stuff from Northern Ireland. This is good for Northern Ireland PLC. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Henry VIII clauses are wrong, the purpose of the bill is wrong, the necessity isn't proven. Can I just ask my honourable and right honourable friends on this side of the House this, can, this question, which I ask sincerely. Playing fast and loose with our international reputation, playing fast and loose with our adherence to the rule of law, an executive power grab with Henry VIII clauses, pandering and giving way to some sort of political brinkmanship on one side of that very sensitive divide in Northern Ireland, which can't be afforded as a plaything. If that side of the House, if the Labour Party were on the government bench and they were doing what is contained in this bill, what would our Conservative response be? We would say that this was a party not fit for government. We would say this was a party that does not understand our traditions, respects our traditions or understands the importance of reputation. For a fellow Tory to have to point this out to Tories, Madam Deputy Speaker, is shameful. Could I just ask my right honourable and honourable friends just to think about what this does to our party's reputation and to our nation's reputation, because both are in peril. Yeah. Thompson. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy <coughs> Speaker. I rise to speak, as it states on the, the order paper, in line with uh, what was uh, the basis of a reasoned amendment, uh, namely that uh, we believe that this bill breaks international law. Uh, we have already had to stumble our way through the, the consequences of a, a Brexit deal that was supposedly oven ready, and quite frankly, uh, what is uh, pr proposed in this set of legislation before us today is no better. Because the fact is, Madam Deputy Speaker, if this bill does not break international law, then it is an act preparatory to doing so. Now, I am going to start out my remarks with uh, being as, as helpful as I think I can to the, 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 the government here. And first of all, let me state that I hope I can understand and at least empathise with some of the concerns. Of, uh, of people in Northern Ireland over how aspects of the protocol are working or, as they would view it, not working. And secondly, I do not consider that it is unreasonable in and of itself that, in light of experience, the government should seek to try and renegotiate aspects of, of the deal that has taken effect. However, I am very firmly and clearly of the view that this is absolutely not the way to go about trying to achieve that objective. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I am bound to observe that uh, although we are here to talk about a bill in the Northern Ireland Protocol, the, the issues here do not only affect Northern Ireland. We are subject to a withdrawal agreement which does not work for Scotland, or I would contend any other part of the United Kingdom yeah, yeah. either. There is much uh, rhetoric that the, that the government uses about uh, a precious union, but it is a union I am bound to observe under the stewardship of this government which did not pay a great deal of attention to the concerns or priorities of the majorities in Scotland and Northern Ireland which opposed Brexit. And if relations and are to be rebalanced across these islands, whether that is cross-community in Northern Ireland or even cross-union, 
It seems to me that some recognition of those points is long overdue by the oh, government. Here, here, here. Yes. I was very fortunate, Madam Deputy Speaker, to have the Honourable Gentleman in my constituency where I gave him the opportunity, and I know he enjoyed it, uh, to meet some of the unionist community groups and to meet the fishermen, uh, to meet the elected representatives. Every one of those people, and the right honourable member will remember it very well, conveyed to him the, the, the um, unfairness of the Northern Ireland Protocol, the impact it was having on fishing, the impact it was having on community, and he will know, uh, the right honourable member will know, that the local community p- people that he met as well were very fearful of a future where the Northern Ireland Protocol was retained. Does he understand those issues, and would he express that in the chamber as well? Well, I thank the honourable gentleman for that inf- for that intervention. Um, I recall with great fondness that, that visit, particularly the, the discussions we were able to have in, in Port of Ogie, and I'm extraordinarily grateful to the honourable gentleman and indeed to everybody that I met when I was last in Northern Ireland to get the chance to, to, to discuss these issues. And as I've said, I, I, I certainly hope I can empathise and understand at least some of the, the issues that were there. And if the honourable gentleman will allow me to make some progress, he might see where there are areas perhaps of agreement, but also inevitably some areas of, of, of divergence in that. Yes. I'm, I'm very grateful to him because it seems to me the fundamental issue of debate this evening is all about whether actually the EU would move on the implementation issues that they claim are the only problem. It's not a, an issue of renegotiation for them, it's an issue of implementation. And they've said that they believe that actually customs formalities can be reduced by about 80 per cent, and the same with sanitary and phytosanitary checks. They believe that the expanded uh, trusted trader scheme could solve a lot of these problems. How confident is the honourable gentleman that actually these things will be delivered, given how long this has been going on for and the effect already evident in Northern Ireland? Oh, I thank the Honourable Member for Gloucester for that intervention. It certainly appears to me that there is a potential landing zone there uh, between what has been proposed by the European Union and indeed there is a, a bit of an overlap with what has been proposed by, by the UK Government. I, I would offer to come along with Ministers, but they might feel that reinforcements had arrived and, and somehow weakened their position. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, there ought to be a, 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 a landing zone here for, for those of, of, of goodwill and good faith. Now, I have to say, though, Madam Deputy, Speaker, that even as a supporter of Scottish independence, I find it utterly inconceivable that any unionist government would have signed up to the kind of arrangements which placed a trade border down the middle of the Irish Sea while denying it was doing any such thing. And I think that all of these issues inherent in the, the, the protocol that we have could have been avoided had the UK government maintained a a modicum of, of, of statecraft and respect for all parts of the Union by acknowledging the limitations of the mandate that they actually had from the Brexit referendum and by remaining in as close alignment as they could with the Single Market and Customs Union, thereby minimising the economic harms that we have seen to the UK since then and ensuring that no part of that precious Union was left behind. But even yet, it seems that the Government has not learned from its mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Scottish Government was not consulted by the UK Government before they took this action. And I believe I am right in saying the UK Government did not even afford the Scottish Government the courtesy of a phone call in advance to advise of these plans. It has also been reported that the, the UK Government did not consult with their top legal adviser, the First Treasury Council, Sir James Eady, on the legality of their move. So we have a, a UK Government which, it seems to me, is in contempt both of international law, as we have seen in other matters, in domestic law. And aspects round about the, the Prime Minister's current political travails are bad enough, but to, to stand up and use the, the full authority of a ministerial office to say that which is not seems to me to get right to the heart not just of the, the, the problems being presented by the protocol in its current form, but also about the, the fitness of the Prime Minister or anyone aspiring to replace him to hold office. I give way. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. It is clear the protocol is not working. Northern Ireland business is suffering. May I ask the Honourable Gentleman, um, in what way does this bill act to the disadvantage of the European Union? Because it seems to me it is a very good way forward. 
It seems to me that uh, whether it disadvantages or not is not something that the Her Majesty's Government gets to decide. And while I'm clear there are problems with the protocol, clearly there are aspects of the protocol that are working very well indeed. Indeed, yeah, the yeah. Treasury bench has admitted it. And if the Honourable Member will allow me to progress, I can set out some of the examples, particularly over trade, where it is not uh, having the impact that we, are, that we are told in all aspects it is. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I come from the point of view that trust has been broken both between the UK Government and the people of all of these islands, as well as between the UK Government and our international partners, which seems to me to get right to the nub of the issues about trying to renegotiate it. I don't think we should really need to say this, but it's absolutely vital that the UK Government should be able to respect the international obligations that it enters into freely. Lord Butler, who was head of the civil service for, for 10 years, has said that this country has repeatedly criticised states like Russia and China for breaking the rules-based international order, and yet now holds that it's perfectly justified itself to breach international law. And it seems we've gone from a, a limited and specific breach to something which in this bill is potentially extensive and egregious. Even General Sir Richard Barnes, a former joint Chief of uh, Joint Forces Command who served in Afghanistan, Iraq and Northern Ireland has said that what the government is proposing is short-sighted tactics which will do much harm strategically in the wider world. In fact, what is being done is particularly stupid. And he also went on to warn that these moves will empower adversaries as it will, quote, undermine us with our enemies by giving them the opportunity to accuse us of hypocrisy when we call them out for breaking the rules-based international order it will also undermine us with our allies who will doubt whether they can rely on us to keep to an agreement and keep to our word. Can we give way? Can we give yes. I'm very grateful to him for giving way. Listen to what he says with a great deal of interest. He's right to defend international law and international treaties. Did he raise the concerns he's just expressed when the European Union was busy breaking those treaties, for example, over subsidies to Airbus? What about three? Well, I, I, the, the Honourable Member for Edinburgh South West says it eloquently in one word, what about it? But I think we've been taken here by, by 40 years of political dysfunction in the party opposite and the various neuroses it's had over Europe. The exceptionalists of the punch above our weight brigade to, to be found extensively but not exclusively within a, a European research group that, where research seems to be at a, at a premium which has led us to this point and in the process I have to say shredding any reputation that the UK government might have preserved for either good stable government or adherence to international norms. Because whatever, the whatever the bluff and bluster and personal agendas that might be at play here and I, I notice that the, the Foreign Secretary is no longer in our place, yep. it is of course the, the UK's exit from the EU rather than the protocol which created this difficult situation because there were only ever three options which would allow this particular circle to be squared. That was either a return to a border on the island of Ireland, close alignment between the EU and UK regulatory standards to reduce the needs for checks, or for checks to be carried out at the main Northern Ireland ports. And of course, the further that there is a diversion from the single market and the customs union, the harder those, uh, that border then eventually becomes. Honourable gentlemen, if he was aware that de Valera himself in 1937 actually tore up the Anglo-Irish Treaty in exactly the same kind of way as he's accusing other people. You're not responsible for de Valera. The Honourable Gentleman seems to be, be confusing me with uh, a representative of the, the, government of, the, the Government of Ireland. I mean, it's an interesting historical uh, diversion, which I'd be more than happy to discuss with him later, but I'm not exactly certain how germane it is to this particular discussion that's here. It seems a little bit recondite, to, to, to say the least of it. Anyway, move, move, moving on, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the, legal, the government has presented a, a pressy of the, the, the legal advice, and the Law Society of Scotland has uh, identified a number of provisions in this bill which it believes to be inconsistent with the, the UK's international law obligations. Now, I, because of time is as it is, and we're in the, only in the second reading, I don't intend to go into these points in any great depth or delve unnecessarily into the horrors of the of the empowerment of ministers that this bill would, uh, would represent through the, the Henry VIII powers. But I would just highlight specifically in terms of Article 4 of the Withdrawal Agreement which, uh, the issues which this bill creates, given that Article 4 states expressly that the UK cannot legislate contrary to its commitments through primary legislation. 
So we get to the, the, the point of uh, necessity, which is ultimately the, the justification that the, the government is using here. And as I understand it, that rests on two key points. That there is, firstly, effectively, when viewed from London, no detriment to the single market from these proposals. And secondly, that it underwrites the government's wishes to protect the UK single market and also the, the Good Friday Agreement. Now, that was uh, an argument that I think was neatly eviscerated by my honourable friend from uh, Edinburgh South West in an earlier intervention. But there are three points, Madam Deputy Speaker, that instantly leap out to me from that. that firstly, as I've said, whether or not there is detriment is largely a subjective measure. And that whatever unilateral assertions might be made on this, whether or not there is detriment is something that requires to be determined uh, in another manner. Um, secondly, in invoking the, in an invocation of necessity it must also not seriously impair an essential interest of another party. And I think it's quite hard to argue that this isn't something that could at least be at risk of happening. But thirdly, it doesn't seem to me to be particularly credible now to cite the protocol as harming the single market of the Good Friday Agreement when it was cited by HM government as a means of protecting both of those yeah. things. And the Prime Minister wanting to override a deal that he himself was happy to claim credit for having got Brexit done during his 2019 election campaign really doesn't seem to me to be the, the strongest uh, basis for sustaining that argument. Now, in terms of the, the, the economic effect, Northern Ireland has clearly lagged behind the rest of the UK in economic performance in, in recent decades relative to the UK. Yet somehow, for some reason, it's currently outpacing every other part of the UK, except perhaps predictably for London. And there, there must be some reason why that might be. Perhaps I don't know if anyone can help me with why that might be. But perhaps as a clue. Would you take and the point? Would you? Yes. It may, if he were to examine the economic performance of Northern Ireland he might find that, surprisingly, it is the service sector yeah. which has increased seven times more than the manufacturing sector, and, of course, the service sector is not covered by the protocol at all. Yeah. Well, manufacturing also seems to be doing quite well, as, a, as I recall, and perhaps having a, a foot in both markets and the, easy access to, or the easier access to both, in contrast to counterparts on the other side of the North Channel, might also be a, a reason for that. But a survey by the, the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce shows that 70 per cent of businesses now believe that that unique trading position with preferential access to both EU and UK mar single markets presents opportunities for Northern Ireland. The businesses reporting a significant problem has dropped from 15 per cent to 8 per cent. Now, while I would not seek to diminish in any way the problems that that 8 per cent feel, it is perhaps an indication that uh, many of the problems, at least initially, were because of the short lead-in time that was given and the lack of preparation and clarity ahead of the big changes which came in January 2021. So, To come back to my fundamental point on this, we need a protocol. The nature of Brexit means there needs to be a protocol. It doesn't need to be exactly the same as this version. But what we absolutely don't need in the middle of a cost of living crisis is the prospect of increased trade friction through needless conflict and a developing trade war with our largest overseas mar and closest market. And that, Madam Deputy Speaker, is what I very much fear this legislation, if enacted and utilised, would do. So, I believe that the way forward is through negotiations. Now, I, like, like the man asked to give directions, I would not be starting from this point for a variety of reasons that I need not detain the House on. But we need negotiations which are based on trust, which are based in good faith, which are based on cooperation. And I think we stand a much, the UK Government would stand a much, much better chance of success if it were driven by this instead of this piece of legislative brinkmanship. And also, if it were to pursue measures for once which were motivated by a genuine desire to deliver the best possible outcomes out of this mess for all peoples in these islands, rather than simply pandering to the agendas of those and the, the tiny subset of the population that might have an influence over who the next leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party might happen to be. A party, Madam Deputy Speaker, which uh, no longer seems to be very, very certain what it's here to conserve or to unify. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the opportunity to speak in the debate on this bill. Although I have to say to the lone minister sitting on the front bench that I do not welcome this bill. 
I fully understand and indeed share the Government's desire to uphold the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. I understand and share the desire to keep the Union of the United Kingdom. I recognise the frustration and difficulty when the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive are not in place and operating. And I also share the Government's desire to get that Assembly and Executive back operating for the good of the people of Northern Ireland. But I do not believe that this Bill is the way to achieve those aims. It is my, in thinking about this Bill, I actually started off by asking myself three questions. First of all, do I consider this to be legal under international law? Second, will it achieve its aims? And third, does it at least maintain the standing of the United Kingdom in the eyes of the world? And my answer to all three of those questions is no. And that is even before we look at the extraordinarily sweeping powers that this bill would give to ministers. Now, the government's claim of legality, as we have heard, is based on the doctrine of necessity in international law. The government, as the Foreign Secretary said, has indeed published a legal position. And that describes this term necessity in the following way. The term necessity is used in international law to lawfully justify situations where the only way a state can safeguard an essential interest is the non-performance of another international obligation, the action taken may not seriously impair the essential interests of the other state and cannot be claimed where excluded by the relevant obligation, or where the state invoking it has contributed to the situation of necessity. So let's examine this. First of all, it is claimed that it is the only way if the necessity argument is to hold, this must be the only way to achieve the government's desires. Yet the government's legal position paper itself accepts there are other ways. For example, it says the government's preference remains a negotiated outcome, which indeed was reiterated by the Foreign Secretary in her opening speech in this debate. It also acknowledges that there's another potential way to deal with this issue in the existence of Article 16. So the government's preferred option is negotiation, and then there's a second option, which is Article 16. Now, Article 16 is referred to in the legal position paper, but when I read it, I thought it was referred to in a way which seemed to uh, try to say that the existence of Article 16 somehow justifies the introduction of this bill. Article 16 does not justify this bill. The very existence of Article 16 negates the legal justification for this bill. Yeah, yeah. So let's also examine some of the other arguments for invoking the necessity defence. That defence cannot be claimed where the state invoking it has contributed to the situation of necessity. And again, in their legal position paper, the government sets out its argument that the peril that has emerged was not inherent in the protocol's provisions. I have to say to the Minister that I find that a most extraordinary statement. Yes. The peril is a direct result of the border down the Irish Sea, which was an integral and inherent part of the protocol which the Government signed in the withdrawal agreement. Yes. Now, it is possible, of course, that the Government might say, oh, well, we knew about that, but we didn't think the DUP would react in the way that they have. Well, I say to the Minister, they should have listened to the DUP in the many debates that went on the withdrawal agreement because they made their position on the protocol very clear at that point and it was not positive. So, finally, necessity suggests urgency. Imminent peril is the, uh, other phrase, the phrase that is used. There is nothing urgent about this bill. It has not been introduced as emergency legislation. It is likely to take not weeks but months to get through Parliament. And as the former Treasury solicitor, Sir Jonathan Jones, said in the House magazine, if the UK really did face imminent peril, you might think the government would need to deal with it more quickly than that. <laughs> so my answer to all those, the question of whether this is legal under international law, is for all the above reasons, no, it is not. So question two, will it achieve its aims? Now, I'm assuming that the aims are either to encourage the DUP into the Northern Ireland executive, or it's a negotiating tool to bring the EU back round the table. On the first of these, so far I have seen no absolute commitment from the DUP that the executive will be up and running as a result of this bill. There were rumours at one stage that at second reading that might happen. Well, as far as I can see, it has not uh, happened. Uh, I have to say 
to uh, the Minister that if my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, wants to have a discussion with me about negotiations with other parties in this House on various matters, I'm very happy to do so. But if the bill is a negotiating tool, will it actually bring the EU back round the table? Well, so far we've seen no sign of that. And can I just say that actually my experience was that the EU looked very clearly, carefully at the political situation in any country. As I discovered after I had faced a no-confidence vote, despite having won that no-confidence vote, they then start to ask themselves, well, is it really worth negotiating with these people in government? Because will they actually be there in any period of time, regardless, regardless of the justification or not for them taking that view? But also, actually, I suspect they are saying to themselves, why should they negotiate in detail with a government that shows itself willing to sign an agreement, claim it as a victory, and then try to tear part of it up in less than three years' time. So my answer to the second question as to whether this will, bill will achieve its aims is that no, it will not. My final question is about the UK standing in the world. The UK standing in the world, our ability to convene and encourage others in the defence of our shared values, depends on the respect others have for us as a country a country that keeps its word and displays those shared values in its actions. As a patriot, I would not want to do anything that would diminish this country in the eyes of the world. I have to say to the government, this bill is not, in my view, legal in international law. It will not achieve its aims, and it will diminish the standing of the United Kingdom in the eyes of the world, and I cannot support it. Uh, I'm very grateful to the um, backbench uh, speakers so far who have um, been very considerate of others in the length of their speeches, but I will, after the next speaker, um, have to introduce an eight-minute time limit in order to be able to give everybody equal access. Sir so Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak at second reading of this very important bill. <laughs> And at the outset, I think it would be important to make the point to all right honourable and honourable members that this is not simply another Brexit-related bill, nor indeed is it a technical bill to remedy problems that have arisen since January 2021, albeit that it will have that effect. Fundamentally, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill seeks to finally and fundamentally reset and restore Northern Ireland's relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom. Given the devastating impact of the protocol on the economic, constitutional, social and political life of Northern Ireland over the last 18 months. Many in this House will remember our opposition to the protocol and it is an honour to follow uh, the former Prime Minister and she quite rightly flagged up our opposition from the outset to this protocol. And it gives me no pleasure to say uh, that we warned that it would be bad for Northern Ireland, and it would not uh, work. And that assessment has been more than borne out in reality. The Northern Ireland institutions were restored in January 2020, and the former Secretary of State is in his place. And he was very much involved in uh, bringing about the New Decade, New Approach Agreement. But at the heart of that agreement was a clear commitment by the UK Government to protect Northern Ireland's place within the UK internal market and that it would be respected. And on that basis, my party re-entered power sharing and we kept our side of the bargain. And we were patient and we waited and we waited for the government to take the action to protect our place in the internal market. And the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland did uh, refer to measures that were introduced in the Internal Markets Bill that would at least have partly uh, uh, dealt with this problem alongside other measures that were proposed in the Finance Bill. But those measures were not brought forward. And still we waited. Uh, and 
back last July when I became leader of my party, I warned then that if the government failed to honour its commitment in new decade, new approach, then we would have a real difficulty because the consensus that is essential uh, to ensure that power sharing is maintained in Northern Ireland is being undermined. I will give way to the chairman of the select committee. Or to the um, right honourable gentleman, He's, he hasn't said anything which, uh, up to now which is in any way factually challengeable. But could I ask him, on the presumption that the bill this evening secures its second reading and begins its parliamentary progress, in the interest of serving those people in Northern Ireland who look to the executive and to Stormont to meet their daily daily needs, will he instruct his party colleagues, who are MLAs, to return to the executive, get it back up and running? discharge their democratic duty and serve all the communities of Northern Ireland? I thank the Honourable Member and I am going to come to that point in my question, but I would simply uh, respond to him by saying if I were to do that, would the Honourable Member then support the bill? Uh, And I heard nothing in his his speech uh, and his contribution to the House that suggested he would. Um, Back uh, last July, I made it clear Uh, that the Irish Sea border is not just a threat to the economic integrity of the United Kingdom, but it is also a threat to the living standards of the people of Northern Ireland. And so it has been proven, because uh, the impact of the additional costs in bringing goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland is contributing towards the cost of living situation in Northern Ireland. It is driving up the cost of food in our supermarkets, it's driving up the cost of manufacturing, and it's making it difficult for businesses to operate effectively. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Further to that point, it seems to me that the people of Northern Ireland aren't sometimes able to get the goods from the United Kingdom because manufacturers here aren't sending them to Northern Ireland because of the additional burden of trying to get them there. Well, the the Honourable Member is absolutely right about that, and many of my constituents and those of my right honourable and honourable friends have experienced that, both as consumers and as businesses. This is not just about businesses. It's about every citizen of Northern Ireland. And it is, Madam Deputy Speaker, also about the democratic deficit that that my members, who are elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, and who are ministers in that Assembly and Executive, are expected to preside over the imposition of regulations uh, over which they have no say, no democratic input into how those regulations are put in place, and they regulate how we trade with the rest of our own country. How can anyone in this House defend a situation where part of this United Kingdom is treated in a way where its elected representatives have no say in many of the laws that regulate our trade with the rest of the United Kingdom? That is simply unacceptable, and that is part of the problem here. Given way, and I, I agree with him, and I've said that in this place many times about aspects of the joint committee. But this bill that he is agreeing to today, uh, similarly, gives absolutely no power to anybody in Northern Ireland, himself, his parties, or anybody else. It gives all the power to the Secretary of State. So, on that basis, how can he support that? Well, uh, I would say to the Honourable Lady that this bill, if enacted, uh, will restore confidence in Northern Ireland, will restore the consensus that is essential to operate power sharing, and therefore it will give back to the elected representatives in Northern Ireland the power to take the decisions uh, that they have not been able to take. And I also have to say to this House, it's a bit rich sometimes when I hear honourable uh, members arguing uh, for devolution and for the restoration of power, when this House on a number of occasions recently has overridden devolution, overridden the Northern Ireland Assembly and enacted powers which were contrary to the desires of the elected representatives in Northern Ireland. Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe this bill is essential to the restoration of political stability in Northern Ireland. It will provide a framework for the free movement of goods within the UK internal market, in line with the Government's commitment in New Decade, New Approach. Um, The bill gives reasonable protection to the EU single market. It does not impact on the EU and the integrity of the EU single market. It protects the integrity of, our market, of their market. But what it also does, Madam Deputy Speaker, is protect the integrity of the United Kingdom's internal market. And I see no reason why this House should not uh, bring forward measures to do so, when it is clear and evident that the protocol has disrupted the integrity of the UK internal market. I'm very grateful. Um, 
and I know that the Right Honourable Gentleman gives a lot of thought to these issues and doesn't arrive at opinions lightly. He's arguing that uh, the bill, as it stands at the moment, will give Northern Ireland the things it wants. I think that's basically the, um, the, the main point of his argument. What if he's wrong? What will happen then? Well, I would say to the Honourable Member, I, I'm not suggesting the bill is perfect. Um, it is rare that legislation that passes this House uh, is, is perfect in every sense and does not subsequently require amendment. The benefit of this bill is that it empowers ministers to make change where change is necessary to ensure the proper functioning of the UK internal market. And I think that is an entirely valid thing for this Parliament and Government to do. Um, but furthermore, as a unionist, I make no apology for saying to this House that the bill will restore Northern Ireland's place within the union. And that is important to me. Some right honourable and honourable members have referred to the rule of law, and yet the High Court and the Court of Appeal in Belfast have stated very clearly that the protocol subjugates Article 6 of the Act of Union. The Act of Union is an international agreement. The Act of Union is the very fundamental building block of the Union. And Article 6 of the Acts of Union states very clearly that I, as a Northern Ireland citizen, as a member of this United Kingdom, have the right to trade freely within my own country, that there should be no barriers to trade between the constituent parts of the United Kingdom. And yet what the Protocol has done in, in uh, putting in place the Irish Sea border is it has uh, broken Article 6. It has made me a second-class citizen in my own country because I do not have the right to trade freely with the rest of the United Kingdom. And I am simply asking for my rights as a British citizen. Well, the Honourable Member of the Chair of the Select Committee shakes his head, but I have to say to him, if he found his constituents in a position where they were not able to trade freely with the rest of their own country, I think he might be as annoyed as I am about that situation, and he might actually have something to say about it. I thank the right honourable gentleman for giving way. One of the obviously he's putting forward a very excellent case and, and, and how to do away with the Northern Ireland Protocol through this legislation. Does he also agree that within the European Court of Justice uh, that, that that removes the direct jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union back to here, and it should be the people of this House, the people of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, who make them decisions and not Europe? Here, here. Well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe in fairness, and I believe that when there is a dispute at an international level, it should not be left to the court of one side to be the arbiter in that situation, and that needs to be rectified. And in respect of uh, uh, the implications of this bill, Madam Deputy Speaker, let me make it clear that, in my view, in our view, the bill provi will provide for the restoration of the equilibrium that is essential in Northern Ireland, the cross-community consensus that it is at the heart of the Belfast Agreement and that it is absolutely necessary to ensure the proper functioning of uh, the political institutions. And it is evident in the elections in, uh, in May, just last month, not a single Unionist member elected to the Assembly supports the Northern Ireland Protocol. Yeah. Therefore, there is not a cross-community consensus in favour of this protocol. Now, this, head, this House can bury its head in the sand. It can pretend uh, that there is not an instant solution to this problem, or it can say, well, look, let's just wait for the EU uh, to uh, finally agree to change its negotiating mandate. But what about in Northern Ireland in the meantime? I want to see those political institutions restored, but I'm not able to do it if my ministers are required to impose a protocol that harms Northern Ireland. I'm not prepared, my party is not prepared yeah, to engage yeah. in an act of yeah, self-harm yeah, yeah, yeah. to this part, Northern Ireland's part yeah. uh, of the United Kingdom. We're simply not prepared to do that. And therefore, is it the will of this House? that it wishes to see Northern Ireland languishing without uh, p political institutions able to operate because there is no cross-community consensus, while we argue the rights and wrongs and the legalities of this situation. I do not have, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, that, that uh, 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 situation. I do not have, uh, for my people, um, a situation where we can talk all night and debate about um, uh, this bill uh, and its legality in international law, I happen to believe there is a necessity, and the necessity is peace and stability in Northern Ireland. And this House is charged, this Government is charged 
with responsibility of ensuring peace and stability in Northern Ireland. Therefore, there is a necessity. And I do not see, and I have not heard from anyone else in this House opposing the bill, what their solution is. Beyond, let's have more negotiations with an EU that refuses to change its negotiating mandate, that will not change the text of the protocol. And I have to say uh, to right honourable and honourable members, that refusal to change the text of the protocol simply means that we won't get a solution that will achieve the cross-community consensus required in Northern Ireland. And I believe the bill offers a solution. Does the right honourable, does the right honourable gentleman accept, as he said earlier, that there is a serious democratic deficit which exists at the moment in the making of laws which are made by European institutions in the Council of Ministers by majority vote, behind closed doors, where none of his voters have an opportunity to intervene whatsoever and at the same time in a manner which is completely inconsistent with proper democratic procedures. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that absolutely right in reply to the Honourable Member for North Dorset? Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Stonen for the excellent work that he has been doing uh, in helping uh, to bring about uh, the progress that we're making towards the restoration of the political institutions in Northern Ireland. As I come to a conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, let me say this. Much of what will happen in the, happen in the coming period in Northern Ireland will be shaped by the attitudes and decisions in this House. If this bill convincingly passes all of its common stages in its current form, and if the government continues to develop the regulations required to bring to an end the harmful implementation of the protocol, then that would, of course, give substantially greater confidence that new arrangements are on the way, which in turn would provide a basis to take further steps to see the return of our local institutions. And therefore, I would appeal to members of this House who genuinely want to see the institutions restored up and running in Northern Ireland again to prioritise the interests of Northern Ireland over any narrower ideological reservations that may, they may have about this bill. I urge them to recognise the vitality of this bill, now progressing rapidly through its legislative stages in the Commons before the summer recess and ensuring that not only does this bill receive substantial support in this House, but it is not subject to either wrecking amendments or indeed other amendments that would dilute the framework and impact of the bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, much harm has been inflicted on the Belfast uh, Agreement and its successor agreements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time is now short to ensure that we arrest this situation, and the only way to do that finally and fully is to deal with the protocol and to see Northern Ireland once again focus on moving forward together. We want to see the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive restored, and that can be achieved where there is a sustainable basis for doing so. We will continue to be condition and not calendar-led as we look forward to this bill now making rapid progress. I commend this bill, and we will be supporting it in the interests of Northern Ireland and the integrity of the entire United Kingdom. Ian Smith. This speaker, it's a pleasure to speak after my right hon. friend for Lagan Valley. Um, and there are powerful and legitimate arguments being made regarding the legal basis of this bill, and I'm sympathetic to them. Whatever the motivations and goal of this bill, and whatever the reasons we're at this point, it's important to uh, look at what is practical uh, and most likely to succeed regarding the NI protocol and what will ensure we show to the people of Northern Ireland uh, that we're handling this issue with balance and an even hand. There are real and significant issues that we've just heard with the protocol, customs checks, east-west and regulatory challenges to name but two. Whilst I don't accept that the protocol is a constitutional threat to the UK, it is clear that there are many complex challenges created by it. In acknowledging these issues, however, there is a significant support for the Northern Ireland Protocol. Business organisations across Northern Ireland have been engaging in good faith with government for over two years, looking at a myriad of ways to improve the deal. Their view is that the need for stability and balance can only be achieved through a negotiated settlement and that they want to preserve the opportunities of the protocol. 
They also want to protect the strong position of the Northern Ireland economy, which has now been shown in multiple reports to be performing amongst the best in the country. There are major concerns that the advantages as well as the disadvantages of the protocol could be lost with this bill, that the Henry VIII clauses are there to remove almost all of the protocol, should ministers want to. A majority of MLAs also articulated this view in a recent letter to the Government. They accepted that changes do need to be made, but they are clear that they want a negotiated approach. Voters across Northern Ireland, many of who support the need for change also, additionally want a negotiated solution. 74% of voters support a UK-EU negotiated solution. Madam Deputy, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I fear that this bill is a kind of displacement activity from the core task of doing whatever we can to negotiate a better protocol deal for Northern Ireland. I also fear that it risks creating an impression to unionism that a black and white solution is available when the reality is once this bill has been dragged through the Lords and courts and EU responses and reprisals, compromise will ultimately be needed. Our sole focus should be on how we shift the EU into a negotiation to get the changes needed for Northern Ireland and for my right honourable friend's party. We risk toxifying further the discussions we are having with the EU and Member States and we risk prolonging instability for Northern Ireland business, not to mention putting the whole of the UK at risk of trade and tariff reprisals. We also risk further entrenching the view of many middle ground voters in Northern Ireland that the desire to finish Brexit by removing the protocol is against their best interests. This issue of winning hearts and minds is important to bear in mind as we seek to persuade and cajole, cajole people to stick with the Union. We should be looking at how we persuade the EU to make the changes needed by unionism. We should be looking at how we encourage the Northern Ireland parties to work together on joint priorities and the EU on understanding that it is in their interest to provide much greater political focus on this issue. What else can we do in other parts of the UK-EU relationship to encourage the bloc to shift? Our challenge is to push the EU to move beyond the flexibilities they are proposing and to change the text but we also need to be re realistic about how changes will be made. It will be more suspensions, more grace periods, turning the eye, compromises seem more likely than wholesale rewriting. Northern Ireland is very used to these types of deals, shades of grey rather than black and white. And we know that patient, quiet work can deliver. We have already seen this happen on medicines. The EU have now changed the protocol and the Government have secured uninterrupted, uninterrupted surprise to Northern Ireland. Not only that, NI's crucial pharma sector has access to both markets. There is no reason that the medicines deal cannot be replicated across agri-food and customs if the political will is there on both sides. But to do this, we need the highest level focus, leader to leader a political negotiation focused on Northern Ireland, challenging the approach the EU took over the May years. The announcement yesterday on more joint working with France in other areas could lead to a space to push forward for the changes needed on Northern Ireland yeah, yeah. with a crucial member state. But it is worth bearing in mind that in the readout of the Macron-Johnson call, the Northern Ireland protocol was not raised yesterday. It wasn't raised. We also need to work out how to encourage Dublin. We need their help to get the EU to shift. Ireland should have done more to help when we needed an exit mechanism on the backstop. But we now need to get Dublin and also the parties in Northern Ireland to focus on a, re a resolution. We need a new, intensive UK, Northern Ireland, Irish and EU process. That is how we will get the East-West checks resolved, uh, so there is no border down the Irish Sea. That is how we will fudge issues on regulation. That is even how we might get and fix legal oversight. But we need a sustainable solution. The task in Northern Ireland is, as ever, to secure a broad consensus. And that means that government, as well as addressing the concerns of unionism, also has to reflect on the concerns of all communities and the growing centre ground. 
A new intensive Northern Ireland focused negotiation process is the only way to ensure that this fragile but high performing part of our country is handled with the utmost care, balance and respect. Order. Just to remind everybody that if you weren't in at the very beginning, uh, and you know who you are, and even more importantly, I know who you are, um, do not stand because you will not get in. Um, and secondly, everybody participating, uh, please do come for the wind-ups. Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, this bill is proof, if ever it were needed, that Brexit is not done. Uh, it was always going to be difficult to reconcile leaving the EU with the challenge of uh, an open border, and so it's proved. And let's be absolutely frank from the start. Our relationship with the European Union is now in a very, very bad place. Now, perhaps that has something to do with the right honourable member for Uxbridge and South Ryslip, because before he became Prime Minister, he promised he would never, ever, ever put a border in the Irish Sea. When he became Prime Minister, he promptly did that. He described the protocol when he negotiated as uh, in perfect conformity with the Good Friday Agreement. He then said there will be no checks on goods going from GB to Northern Ireland. Now, this was not true, and it's probably one of many reasons why so many people uh, don't trust the Prime Minister, including many EU leaders. Now, what can we conclude from that process? Um, despite the fact that the um, the impact assessment made it very clear that there would be checks, what would happen. The government either didn't fully understand the protocol they had negotiated, or they thought it wouldn't be a problem, or they missold it, or they always intended to resile from it later on. And whatever the explanation is, it doesn't reflect terribly well on ministers. But having made that point, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are where we are, and we have a problem. And the problem is that the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Executive are not functioning, and all of us should be worried about that. And I should have said at the beginning, it was a great pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Gentleman, because I think he spoke extremely wisely. Now, as the um, member for Maidenhead, Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, pointed out, I suppose, in the government's eyes, the test of the bill is, will it work? to bring the institutions back up and running them. None of us knows for sure the answer to that, but in the meantime, the Foreign Secretary is taking a very big gamble, and in the process, in my view, she is trashing Britain's international reputation as a country that can be trusted to keep its word. Now, I don't propose to dwell at all, really, on the detail of the bill. Others have done that very effectively, uh, but it's just not the way to solve uh, the problem, and I oppose it because it will lead to a prolonged standoff with the European Union, it will prolong the problems that the right honourable gentleman uh, who speaks for the DUP has just uh, referred to, it will worsen relations, and if everything goes horribly wrong, it could end up in a trade war with the European Union at a very difficult time for us economically, and when we have a real war on our hands between Russia and Ukraine. So we have to find another way of resolving this, and that does require the UK and the EU to sit down and negotiate. And I've heard all the arguments from both sides. It's the other lot who are not doing the talking, and we're willing, and so on and so forth. And they can carry on blaming each other till the cows uh, come home. But as long as they do that, they will be failing to fulfil both sides their political responsibility to find a political solution to what is a political problem. And at the heart of this is how do you protect the integrity of the single market while not interfering unreasonably with goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. And that's why the protocol refers to goods at risk. This is the key phrase we have to bear in mind. I think there's some pretty easy places uh, to start. And if you do take supermarket deliveries travelling from Cairn to Larn to shops that are only in Northern Ireland, what exactly is the risk of those goods undermining the integrity of the single market? And as far as I can see, there is none. Therefore, why should they require an export health certificate? In the 18 months that the grace periods have been extended, can anyone point to a single example of the integrity of the single market having been undermined? Because I am not aware of one. 
I genuinely cannot fathom why the EU is so insistent on requiring a customs code to be provided <coughs> uh, by supermarkets and others, because what are they going to do with the statistics? Are they actually going to publish stats on the movement of baked beans and baby food uh, between GB and Northern Ireland? And we were aware of the other problems, sea potatoes, or organic products, uh, divergence on certain I ingredients. Now, in making that point, I'm, I'm not going to, because I, I do want to keep to time. Um, of course there are products where it can reasonably be argued there is a potential risk. I wish we'd spend the time talking about those products, one by one, because if there's a good case, I'm sure that the government will respond. And while the EU says it's offered to reduce paperwork, the thing to remember is it's a reduction compared to the full application of the rules. It is an increase compared to what is currently the case because of the extension of the grace periods. And that's why I've said to the EU and all those I've spoken to, the EU needs to move to make this negotiation work. Um, and surely we can reach some agreement on SPS uh, checks on the basis that Almost all the food produced in Britain is produced to exactly the same standards that it was while we were members of the European Union. So, in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I find this very frustrating because you hear Simon Coveney on the radio when it's put to him the idea of a green lane. He said, well, we propose something very similar. Well, why can't the two parties get on with the negotiation to make this happen? I mean, heaven forbid... If you can negotiate the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, this astonishing achievement, and it's the phrase of, of my good friend, the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, who said earlier today, if you can do that, is the government really incapable, with the EU, of negotiating for a prawn sandwich to cross the Irish Sea without a lot of accompanying paperwork? This cannot be beyond the wit and ability of politicians. So, in my view, Mr Speaker, this is a bill born of desperation rather than principle. It's a bill trying to solve a problem that is entirely of the government's own making. It's a bill that does Britain's international standing no good whatsoever. And it's a bill that will make the negotiation that is the only way this is going to be solved in the end harder rather than easier, because there are so many more pressing things for us to be talking to the EU, our biggest, nearest and most important trading partners still about, not least, the war in Ukraine, not least uh, climate change. And the current crisis uh, in the government, in respect of Northern Ireland, arises from a practical problem and it requires a practical solution. We need those old virtues of patient diplomacy and negotiation, which takes as its starting points the purpose of the rules, the purpose of the rules to protect the integrity of the single market, rather than the rules themselves. And frankly, it's now time for the government, together with the EU, to get back round the table and sort this out. Yeah. 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 And Duncan Smith. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, the Speaker for calling me so early. Can I just start by saying to the Right Honourable Gentleman, I agree with all this stuff about the trade issues. These have been on the table for ages. And I will just give one small point uh, about, I think, during the breakdown in my previous run of friends' negotiations when she was Prime Minister, I happened to take a delegation, including Lord Trimble, to see the then Chief Negotiator. And actually I put to him the very fact that the whole issue around trade across the border was easily settled, as long as we were able to trust each other on things like uh, phytosanitary foods and veterinary checks, which they do with <coughs> New Zealand. He completely agreed, and he said it would be at all possible, but then, then it came to another agreement and we plunged ever since. It is wholly feasible, not to have these ludicrous checks and not to have these ludicrous requirements for the customs codes to be banged across to the EU or for the Court of Justice to have to sit ruling over what was going on in Northern Ireland because it would have been agreed then and a thing called mutual enforcement where both sides take complete responsibility for the enforcement of transgressions in the other one's area when it comes from Northern Ireland and that would have solved that problem straight. Here's the problem. The EU has point-blank refused to negotiate that. Now, here's the point about this, the, the, the protocol. I'm not for saying the protocol should go completely. I'm actually saying it should be changed. That's the whole point. Article, when I looked at it and read it before uh, we originally voted on it, I read uh, very clearly what its main purpose was. Article 1, paragraph 1 and 3 make it very clear 
that the primacy in all of this is the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Upholding that is critical. Of course it's critical. I served in Northern Ireland. I never want anybody that I know to go back to a thing like that again. I lost people in Northern Ireland. It is part of me as much as it is for those who live in Northern Ireland. So we don't want to go back there. And the Good Friday Agreement, therefore, must be prime. And it's, by the way, an international agreement. So here we have a problem. We're talking about breaking international agreements, but we have a clash between international agreements as to which one is prime. And Article 1, Paragraph 1, Paragraph 3 makes it very clear that the Good Friday maintenance of that balance in the Good yep. Friday Belfast Agreement is prime. So if that is the case, I don't believe, I'm not a lawyer, I accept that, badge of pride for me, I have to tell you, uh, but uh, I say, my right honourable friend, I'm sure there are others who would argue differently, yeah, but yeah. I say, yeah, I yeah. say yeah. quite, uh, yeah, I, of course, yeah. of course no. I, I always hear him argue and I love it. Uh, I must just say to him, uh, absolutely agreement, which is why I do not, and I think I've read the text of this, I don't think and believe this legitimately would break uh, international law. And there's a good reason. If the Good Friday uh, Belfast Agreement is so prime in the protocol, it was agreed from the word go that what affects that badly will actually make this thing fall. Uh, then in the rest of the protocol, it's very important because the protocol was not seen, Mr Deputy Speaker, as permanent. It never was. First of all, it was negotiated under Article 50, which meant that it cannot be permanent of its own right. One second. And the second thing is, inside the protocol, Article 13.8 makes it very clear that it can all be changed in whole or in part. So what's the problem? It's not working. Change it. And it could have been changed ages ago. In fact, I did originally, back last year, ask for Article 16 to be triggered simply so we could start that process in it immediately. So the point I want to make here is that the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is critical. Uh, and so it was about self, uh, safeguarding that first, and then there was no hard border, EU single market, and the UK's territorial integrity. Well, the last one, the EU's territorial integrity, has clearly been badly damaged in this, and we cannot have that reign any much further. It's quite clear that the, in Northern Ireland is a, a, a an important part of the United Kingdom and therefore must be treated as an important part of the United Kingdom as much as my constituency is, yeah, so should their yeah, constituents yeah, yeah, yeah. be as well. Yeah, right. So this is critical and actually even in the protocol it specifies that that is one of the priorities and so here we go again. Why would the EU not change the mandate? They set a narrow mandate which said they would only deal with issues yeah. Uh, that affected the running of the protocol, they did not allow their negotiator to have a mandate that would take and change, 13.8, in whole or in part, the protocol. Mm -hmm. So we are here today with this because we are only going to be able to force this to happen through this legislation. For those who say negotiate, 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 negotiation is not an end in itself. It's got a purpose which is at some point you have to leave the room because it no longer works and until the other side makes a change you can't simply go back. And I think this is the real problem that we face. The only time the EU will sit up and look at this is when they realise that the British government is determined to make this change come hell or high water. If the EU won't agree to the necessity for this, uh, then uh, we will have to make it. And it is reluctantly done by the government, I believe, reluctantly done. Uh, and I've, I've listened carefully to what my right honourable and learned friend, the ex-Justice Secretary, has said about uh, the efficacy of this in international law, and I know he will speak shortly and we'll want to hear what he has to say. But I have to say, quite simply, that the most important thing here is that uh, the EU, and including Ireland, I might say, wakes up to what the challenge of this really is. This process of the border was weaponized during the course of the negotiations, wrongly and, and, and I think damagingly. And the re reason why we ended up getting locked down in these original negotiations and ending in this position is because it was seen as a stick to beat the dog. The dog was Brexit Britain and they were going to use it no matter what to make sure that it couldn't be clean. Well, it's time to recognize that has to stop. And so I support this bill tonight not on technicalities, but on the reality that it has turned out... Well, I will give way to him, yes. I'm quite surprised to see the Honourable Gentleman uh, wanting to interfere further in Brexit, because is he not the Honourable Gentleman 
I told this House that this matter was debated and thrashed to death in October 2019. If there was anything else that needed debate about it, he'd love to know what it was. Well, when was the epiphany? <laughs> God, that's why. <laughs> I, don't know if he, I, don't, I don't know if he did. I read the protocol. In it is clear that the protocol, if it does not work, will be changed in whole or in part. He should have read it. He would have understood why. You can't change it. That was the point. You can change it. That was the whole point about the protocol. So the protocol itself was always clear. It had the seeds of its own major change in it. I make no resolution on this. I absolutely was right to do so, and I would repeat that again. So whether or not he wants to hear what I have to say is another matter altogether. No, he's already intervened. He had his moment in the sun, and he lost it, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> so uh, the reality here is, I have to say to, the right on, the, uh, to my honourable and right honourable friends, we are here because of the necessity of the way that the EU has behaved, and I have to say the Irish Government. There have been some good people. The President of the Irish Taoiseach, I think, has been much more reasonable about this, but the Irish Foreign Secretary has celebrated quite recently the diversion of trade that was taking yep. place, which contravenes Article 16 and makes it very clear that it had to be changed. Again, I read the treaty, which I don't think he did. So the point really is that I would say to my honourable and right honourable friends, we are here because we have to be here. I do not believe it breaks international law. It's a clash of international treaties. The most important international treaty is the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The maintenance of that is critical. I want to see the DUP back in power sharing. I hope, as I understood uh, my, the right honourable gentleman say, that he would head in that direction and go back into power sharing once this is through. The Commons, I will hold him to that, I hope. Uh, and I want to say to my honourable friends, let's get this done as quickly as possible because only then will the EU realise that we mean business. Here, here. Claire Hanna. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, this, these have been a frustrating and damaging few years for Northern Ireland, and this bill uh, adds to us. It's been bad for, for the economy, for businesses who need stability and not brinkmanship, and it's been bad for relationships in each of the agreement's three strands within Northern Ireland, North and South of Ireland, and between East and West. And more than that, this bill is being seen as part of the government's departure from the values of the Good Friday Agreement, from compromise, <coughs> from partnership and from the rule of law. It's recycling the same distortions and half-truths that the people of Northern Ireland have been listening to uh, for the last six or seven years of the Brexit debate. And there is still a failure to reconcile the, dilemma, the dilemmas that Brexit forces, the choices that the UK government have made with the reality of our geography. And there have been some truly mind-bending arguments put forth to justify this bill, that this bill is about consent and consensus, when in fact the majority of people in Northern Ireland have not consented to Brexit in any form, and while a majority of voters and MLAs reject this bill in the strongest possible terms, that it's about uh, protecting the Good Friday Agreement, while uh, the government across are in the middle of body slamming a cornerstone of that uh, Good Friday Agreement, and by people who we all saw scuttling away from castle buildings when the Good Friday Agreement was being forged, and people we all saw screaming in the windows in the first few years while we tried to implement that agreement. We've heard tonight uh, that it's about rights. Well, the women of Northern Ireland and the LGBT community of Northern Ireland and the minority ethnic community of Northern Ireland would like a word if it's truly about rights. We've heard uh, that it's about the alleged damage to our economy when every credible business organisation in Northern Ireland is calling for the retention of the protocol, when business after business is lauding the potential of dual market access, when Northern Ireland is the only region outside uh, of London in the UK that is managing to achieve uh, post-pandemic GDP growth. We're told that it's about uh, a democratic deficit, and that's protested <coughs> by removing the entirety of government from the people uh, of Northern Ireland, and that's going to be solved by handing over uh, Henry VIII's powers um, that will allow uh, the government to, uh, to, to, to ride roughshod over everybody uh, in Northern Ireland. I'm old enough to remember when Brexit was supposed to be uh, about parliamentary sovereignty. We've been uh, promised that and promised uh, sunlit uplands, but with the distortions people in Northern Ireland have experienced, we are getting uh, uh, gaslit uplands in Northern Ireland. There has been a cynical campaign for years uh, to distort the causes and effects of the protocol. I can understand entirely the hurt and the frustration of many ordinary uh, unionists. They have been catastrophically misrepresented 
uh, by the DUP in uh, particular, uh, no. and by the PM who insisted so there that there SLP. would be no... Yeah, you see, you said all the words for three yeah. years, yeah. four years, five years here, and we ended up with the protocol. Yes. Yes. Some of us are here it. to you try and address the mess you that it. was created. You lost a third of your seat. Yeah. When you voted down you every possible uh, option that could have prevent, prevented the sea border, but, but unionism and others are wrong Ryan's to think skiing. that the solution is breaking international law and walking away from partnership and compromise. And I hope also that they will understand, and I mean this in the best possible way, many of us, hundreds of thousands of us in Northern Ireland who don't identify as unionists, constitutionally compromise every single day. We live in a reality where the governance lines don't directly uh, match up with our identity. And we do it because it suits the majority of people. And we do it because Northern Ireland isn't a place where hard, sharp lines of sovereignty uh, work. It isn't a place where the winner can take all. It is a place where we survive in, uh, as the member said, um, the shades of grey of, of governance. And I, I'm glad that some of the uh, very plausible solutions, like SPS arrangements and veterinary deals, um, are, are being mentioned. Protected, because for some please, reason, guys. they have disappeared off the agenda. We're told, you know, I would do anything for Northern Ireland, but I won't do that. I won't do that simple uh, negotiated solution uh, that could remove 70 and 80 uh, percent of. Uh, the checks. There's no doubt uh, that the protocol can be smoothed and the operation can be improved. Everybody says that. Nobody, as I've said before in Northern Ireland, loves the protocol, but we know that the better options uh, were voted down. But like everything that's worth doing in Northern Ireland, that will be achieved through partnership, uh, through compromises, and not through unmeetable red lines uh, that would remove the people of Northern Ireland from the single market, which was something um, that has no support. But instead of doing the hard work, and levelling with the people of Northern Ireland. This government, to whom the DUP have shackled themselves, are choosing uh, to distort and deflect. Up. They're oh, using this stab in the back narrative that this is all the fault of Remainers, of the EU, the uh, of the Irish, uh, of, of those who aren't patriots. But we know it's about them. And the member uh, previously uh, mentioned Eamon de Valera, and it reminded me of a quote that has echoed down through Anglo-Irish relationships from the last decade. Lord Edward Carson said oh, in the yeah. other place, who had been the leader of unionism as he reflected uh, in disillusionment at the shambles that had been left by the party opposite in the island of Ireland. He said, what a fool I was. I was only a puppet and so was Ulster and so was Ireland in the political game that was to get the Conservative Party into power. Well, the only difference between then and now and this miserable and deceitful bill is that it is about maintaining the Conservative Party in power. It is about propping up a failing and a discredited Prime Minister. It is perhaps uh, about the Foreign Secretary currying favour uh, with the malevolence of the ERG and about once again pulling the wool over unionism's eyes. Well, Mr Speaker, I suspect we can't uh, stop this bill as people will tro- uh, troop through and support it, but members and honourable members should understand that people uh, on the island of Ireland and further afield are observing this process. They are watching to see what this government is doing and they are having to work through the implications of dealing with a government who are in a very bad place morally and who are in contravention of the culture of lawfulness that many of us have worked very, very hard to cultivate uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and their, their approaches are fundamentally altering dynamics and relationships between these islands. And I don't believe, having spent the last six years of my life having this same uh, argument, I don't believe the party opposite have it in them to put the people and the businesses and the economy uh, of people of Northern Ireland first. But I would implore uh, some of my colleagues on these bin- benches to please unshackle yourselves, work with us, work with your neighbours and your colleagues and your friends to arrive at the solutions, the negotiated solutions that we all know are possible. We have solved bigger problems than these uh, before. They are available. End this toxic debate. That's what the people of Northern Ireland want. They don't want to have to hear this day after day on the radio. They want dual market access. They want our economy to prosper, and that's entirely achievable with goodwill. Order. In order to try and get everybody in um, as much as possible as we can, uh, the time limit is being reduced forthwith to six minutes. Uh, David Jones. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, The the status of Northern Ireland uh, within the United Kingdom uh, derives initially from the Act of Union of 1800, uh, which uh, provides in Article 6 6, that in matters of trade and treaties with foreign powers, the subjects of Ireland shall have the same privileges as British subjects. 
Now, the 1800 Act uh, was augmented, as we know, by the Belfast Good Friday Agreement of 1998, which declares that it would be wrong to make any change in the status of Northern Ireland, save with the consent of a majority of its people. Now, the Belfast Agreement, as honourable members have indicated today, is fundamental to the maintenance of peace uh, in Northern Ireland. It operates to preserve the constitutional status of Northern Ireland, and the crucial importance of the agreement is in fact acknowledged in the Northern Ireland Protocol itself, uh, which provides that the protocol is without prejudice to the provisions of the 1998 agreement in respect of the constitutional status of Northern Ireland and the principle of consent. The essential point, therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that the protocol, which is part of an international treaty, explicitly acknowledges the primacy of the Belfast Agreement, which is another international treaty. That agreement, however, has been undermined by the protocol. It's absolutely clear that the arrangements set up by the protocol are having a detrimental impact on life in Northern Ireland and on the privileges of its people. There are, as we've heard, burdensome checks on goods passing from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. They have, in fact, created a border in the Irish Sea between constituent parts of the United Kingdom, uh, which cannot be acceptable. And as we heard from the Right Honourable Member for Lagan Valley, people in Northern Ireland are finding it difficult to secure many goods that they have traditionally been able to purchase, and there has been a diversion of trade away from mainland Great Britain and towards the European Union. And the disruption, of course, as we've heard, has impacted on the democratic institutions of Northern Ireland. The Assembly has not been reconstituted since the elections earlier this year, and the executive may remain suspended. This is a worrying and a potentially dangerous state of affairs, especially, of course, given, given the sensitive political history of Northern Ireland. Now, both the United Kingdom and the European... Yes, I'll give one. Just given his concern for the Assembly in Northern Ireland, democracy in Northern Ireland, does he think the protocol should be something that would be decided by that very Assembly in Northern Ireland? Well, they will, in course, uh, of course, in due course, have the right to, to decide that, but that will, of course, be four years after the passage, uh, after passage of time. But the, uh, the UK and the EU both recognise uh, the practical problems of the protocol and its impact on Northern Ireland and both recognise that they should, if possible, be resolved by negotiation. In fact, honourable members around the House have repeated that today. Everybody would like it to be, be resolved by negotiation. Uh, but for that to happen, it would be necessary for the EU to change the negotiating mandate that is given to Vice President Shevchevich. And that, of course, it refuses to do. As we've heard, from the Secretary of State, there have been extensive negotiations over 18 months, and those negotiations have been fruitless. The Government, therefore, has a clear duty to take action to restore the privileges of the people of Northern Ireland to a position of equality with that of the rest of the UK, and similarly to respect the primacy of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. The action that is taken is to introduce this bill. Uh, which does not, uh, as has been suggested, tear up the protocol. On the contrary, uh, it respects and protects both the integrity of the EU single market and the openness of its land border, both of which are quite rightly matters uh, in respect of which the EU and the Irish Republic are concerned. There will still be checks on goods arriving in Northern Ireland but destined, destined for the European Union through a, lead, a red lane arrangement and the bill explicitly protects the EU single market against uh, the movement across the Irish land border of goods on which the correct EU tariffs have not been paid or which do not comply with EU regulatory standards. It also provides explicitly that no land border infrastructure or checks or controls on the borders may be created. This, in every respect, satisfies the concerns of the European Union. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And the bill also complies with the United Kingdom's obligations under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. It preserves the status of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom by restoring the equality of the privileges of its people to those enjoyed by the people of the rest of the United Kingdom. So this bill 
is wholly necessary, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Without it, the peace process established by the Belfast Agreement will be dangerously compromised. It's a crucial but proportionate bill, and it deserves the support of this House. Thank you very much. Sir Tony Lloyd. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think anybody in this House who takes legislation seriously ought to start from the presumption that operating tactically is a dangerous process. It is short-sighted and short-term. But this, in the context of North Ireland, is not simply foolish. It is very, very dangerous. We, we know that the forces that have been unleashed in Northern Ireland in recent times by the rhetoric, uh, an election in Northern Ireland itself uh, only a matter of weeks ago, um, the, the rhetoric over the weeks and months from the UK government of heightened tensions in that context. And this is dangerous, and this House should take that on board. And I don't want to be alarmist about this, because, um, in fact, what we've got to move towards is, is something where we take a much more serious, much more rational view. You know, the Honourable right hon. Member for Chingford and a number of others made the point about Article 13.8 of the Protocol. And they're right to say that there is scope for amendment under yeah. that, uh, that article. However, that is by negotiation and by agreement. It's got to be done on the basis that we get back to the negotiating table. Now, we know if we put um, a shotgun to, to the heads of any of the parties in this situation, um, we're simply going to get a negative response. That applies, I've got to say, to the DUP. It applies to, to other, other parts of, of the community in Northern Ireland. We've got to take people with us. But frankly, it also applies to the bilateral relationship between uh, the United Kingdom and the European Union. If we're not involved in serious negotiation, trying to look for common sense solutions, we will fail the people of Northern Ireland. But there is a bigger risk uh, within this, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And the bigger risk is this, is that the situation can be traumatic for, the, for people across um, the, the Northern Ireland. If we enter into a really serious breakdown of relationships with the European Union, things will be dramatically worse for the people of Northern Ireland, and they will be worse for my constituents, they will be worse for the constituents of every member of this House. So we do now need rational politics. Now, my honourable friend uh, for, for Leeds uh, Central uh, uh, made some very sensible points. For, it's long been the case, and it's been obvious from the very beginning, that um, that once we'd begun to move towards Brexit, the situation uh, that, that guaranteed the respect for the Good Friday Agreement could only be done in, in, in one way. It couldn't be done by having a hard border across the island of Ireland. It, it shouldn't be done by having a hard border down the, the, the Irish Sea. It has to be done by some form of negotiated solution that respects um, the, the fact that with, with two potentially different systems, uh, those potentially different systems have to be uh, brought as close together as, as possible. Now, um, a sanitary fight or a sanitary agreement is so obvious, so very obvious, because we start from the same premise. There's no member of the governing party, no member of the opposition who are arguing we should deteriorate our, our SPS conditions in, uh, for, in Great Britain. Therefore, a negotiated SPS agreement, as was achieved not simply with New Zealand but also with Switzerland, two different models, um, but a uniquely UK-EU model would be perfectly practical. Let's move on that. Let's look at the practical details. Let's, let's look hard at those practical details, because take this away from the heavy rhetoric. See these as being practical problems that can be solved by goodwill, and we can move the situation on. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I also have got to say, though, that there, there have been some very powerful voices, I've got to say, on, on the government benches about the legality of this bill. And that should worry honourable members um, ac across this chamber. It's not good enough to compare the Good Friday Agreement as, and the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the protocol as if somehow one has to go and the other not. We've got to maintain international law under all circumstances. We've got to do it because when I stand up and say to people in other countries we have uh, an expectation of those very high standards, I'm right to be able to say, because my country also respects those very high standards, that 
actually is true patriotism. Real patriotism um, comes from those measures there, um, not simply the, the jingoistic uh, flag waving. So let's say that this really does matter, that we are a law-abiding country, because if we're not a law-abiding country, quite frankly, we let ourselves down, we let the world down. Now, that's a really serious issue we have, we have to confront here tonight. And I would appeal to uh, right on, right on, right on members opposite to take this very, very seriously. I would appeal to my friends in the DUP on the same basis, because it will affect the way that all of us, people in Northern Ireland, people in the rest of Great Britain, are viewed if we get this wrong. So there's some really difficult issues here. These can be solved, but they will not be solved, Mr Deputy Speaker, by this bill. Not even by amending this bill. Uh, what we need to do is get back to that negotiating table, get back with a sense of dealing with practical issues. That is a way forward. It's the sensible way forward. Sir Robert Buckland. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have uh, diligently sat throughout this entire debate, and I have to say that I think this House is soberly and carefully examining an issue that isn't just uh, an issue of Brexit. It isn't just an issue of our relationship with the EU. It goes to the heart of the exceptional nature of Northern Ireland and its position within our great United Kingdom. It's exceptional. That was the arrangement that was reached a century ago, whether we like it or not. Uh, and it is the consequences of that exceptional position that Northern Ireland is in that has made this particular issue so vexed and so complicated. Um, having been in government when the final withdrawal agreement was negotiated, I think we all remember, I certainly remember with great uh, clarity, the need in my mind for there to be an agreement with the EU for us to be able to chart a way forward, not just with, in terms of our withdrawal and the uh, period of grace that we had for the, the year after our withdrawal, but our subsequent agreement, the trade agreement, which for me is of paramount importance. And therefore it is uh, with very careful uh, and measured thought that I come to this debate, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I do not want to see as a, an unalloyed pro-European. I still believe in the importance of Britain's role with our friends in Europe and the importance of the maintenance of strong bilateral arrangements that we should do anything uh, hastily that could jeopardise that uh, important continuing relationship, which is why the words of my right honourable friend, who was then Secretary of State, for Northern Ireland, who worked diligently to bring back that executive with, with great success. His words about the need for uh, Franco-British bilateral discussions to proceed at pace, I think, are words that we should heed very strongly, because in my considered view, that is going to be the way that we unlock the sort of negotiation that everybody in this chamber wants to see. And they're right to talk about the need for negotiation, but this is the reality. There is no negotiation. We can't even call it a negotiation because uh, Mara Sefcovic, working as he does for the Commission, needs political direction from the EU and from its member states, most notably France, in order to be able to even call the discussions that he is having with the United Kingdom a negotiation. That's the reality. Uh, and masterly inactivity, although it is sometimes absolutely the right way for nation states to proceed, I'm afraid is not an option for us here. Because masterly inactivity is something that a nation should pursue when it has a position of an advantage. And I'm afraid we don't. Because our essential interests are, I'm afraid, uh, in, uh, in, under threat. Uh, and we've identified our essential interests here as the maintenance of stable social and political conditions in Northern Ireland, the protection of the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and the effective functioning of the unique constitutional structures created under it, and the preservation and fostering of social econo and economic ties between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. And here's the point, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the short time that I have. A lot has been said about necessity as if it uh, requires imminent peril, the sort of immediate threat that faces us just outside that door now. Now, nobody's saying that, but necessity in this context doesn't require that degree of imminence. What it requires is a degree of real uh, threat and, and the growing evidence of a real threat to those essential interests. And I would argue 
that there is that growing evidence. Clearly north-south it, it is a matter that is uh, entirely unaffected. The uh, respect that we're showing for the uh, single market is clear. But there is a growing problem when it comes to east-west. And, and the honourable member for right honourable member for Leeds Central put it very well when he talked about the prawn sang sandwich argument. And I have to say that at a time when there seems to be violent agreement between all the parties of Northern Ireland, indeed all of us in this chamber, that full uh, implementation of the protocol is not what we want to see. Nobody wants that. What on earth are we all arguing about? And I'll give way to my right on my friend. Very greatly right on a learned friend uh, who speaks very wisely as ever uh, on these topics uh, for, for letting me intervene. He refers to the uh, doctrine of necessity uh, and uh, the, the test that must be met. Uh, he would agree, I think, that uh, whether it be imminent or not, or, or, or emerging, there has to be evidence that the high threshold is met. Would he not think that, in common with the approach adopted in the UK Internal Markets Bill, if there is evidence so pressing as to justify a departure from an international agreement with the risks that involved, that should be brought back to this House for the House then to decide in a vote, as was suggested in the Internal Markets Bill, then upon the evidence available to it, a parliamentary lock upon the use of that important uh, step. Well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend. I think he makes a powerful case. His am amendment to that bill carried uh, in this House in 2020, and I thought it was a very sensible mechanism to allow this House of Commons to have its final say with regard to the implementation of these measures based upon clear evidence. And my point, uh, simply, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that this is not a matter of law. It's not a question of legality or not. I think there's a respectable argument that can be deployed by the British Government to assert necessity. This is not the law. This is about the evidence that the Government will need to marshal when it comes to demonstrating that point. Now, the Government's responsibility is to be a good steward of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And I'm absolutely clear, and I, I'm afraid I can't give way any further, that it is paramount that Article 1 of the Protocol, which says that it is, its provisions are without prejudice to the Good Friday Agreement, means that the Good Friday Agreement definitely, in my view, as a matter of law, takes precedence. And therefore, any government that fails to act, that sits idly by and ignores the concerns of honourable members opposite, indeed wider community, the wider interests of our kingdom, is failing in its duty. But I say this to, my, to the right honourable gentleman, leader of the DUP and his party, that I've listened very carefully to what he said this afternoon, and I would like further clarity as to whether when his reference to passage of this bill, he means the clearance of this bill through this House, as opposed to the final clearance of the bill in the other place before it returns for final consideration. I'll give way to you. Well, I, I thank the uh, Right Honourable Member for giving way. Uh, I was very clear in what I said. I want to see progress made in the passage of this bill through the House of Commons. Uh, and I want to see uh, steps taken that uh, give us the certainty that we're going to see this legislation moving forward and that pa Parliament will enact it. In those circumstances, we will respond positively. Well, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman. I know he speaks with conviction and passion about these issues. And I, as a friend of the Union, as a unionist to my bones, I say to him and his party, it is time to act. It is time for us to come together if we are going to restore stability, that the mainstream opinion of people in Northern Ireland, for whom politics is not their everyday preoccupation, is crying out for. And what he and his party and I must agree upon is that the United Kingdom must be that source of stability, because if we fail to be that source of stability, then people cannot be blamed if they vote with their feet or vote in another way, God forbid. And that's why I'm taking part of this debate today, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I, as a unionist, feel a responsibility in the stewardship for the United Kingdom that I love. I think Northern Ireland is as British as Wales, where I come from, and as Swindon, where I represent, and it is in the interest of all Conservatives to remember that however difficult tactically uh, this issue might be, however uh, inopportune the moment might be for us to have to make hard and fast decisions, I have judged the position to be uh, of such importance that inaction is not an option for us. 
And that is why that tonight I urge my colleagues to vote for this bill in the hope and expectation that we see real progress and the stability that the people of Northern Ireland and the people of Britain want and deserve. Dr Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. This bill unilaterally sets aside significant sections of the Northern Ireland Protocol, an international agreement, as we've heard, for which the Prime Minister was quite happy to take credit when he claimed he would get Brexit done in the 2019 election campaign. The Foreign Secretary said the bill is needed to protect the Good Friday Agreement, but dismantling the protocol against the will of the majority of people in Northern Ireland also risks undermining that agreement. She said the protocol needs cross-community consent. Indeed it does. But does she have consent from both communities for this bill? I doubt it. Scant consideration was given to the province by Brexiteers before the referendum, nor thereafter to the fact that, like Scotland, Northern Ireland, the majority, voted to remain in the EU. And it is, of course, the UK's exit from the EU rather than the protocol which created the difficult situation for Northern Ireland. This was recognised by the then First Minister, Arlene Foster, when she demanded a special trading arrangement for Northern Ireland shortly after the referendum, a request for special treatment now repudiated by herself and her party. As my colleague, the Member for Gordon, has already highlighted, there were only three choices. A border on the island of Ireland, close alignment between UK and EU standards to reduce checks, including a veterinary agreement, or checks carried out at Northern Ireland ports. The return of border infrastructure in Ireland was seen as an unacceptable threat to peace, but it was the Prime Minister's choice of a hard Brexit with (coughs) maximal divergence from the EU, which inevitably left checks on the Irish sea crossings as the only remaining option. The issues posed by an Irish sea border were clearly highlighted in the government's own impact assessment, which undermines the claim of sudden necessity and means the Prime Minister's claim in December 2019 that there would be no question of there being checks on goods going NI to GB or GB to NI was disingenuous, to say the least. Mm -hmm. The UK government states there is no need for checks as current UK regulations are close to those of the EU. Indeed, they are, but they are proposing a bonfire of EU regulations and already negotiating trade deals which would allow lowered standard foods and goods to be imported into the UK. The Prime Minister cites economic failure and the outcome of the recent elections as justification for tearing up the agreement, despite a clear majority of Assembly members supporting the protocol in principle and recent economic data showing Northern Ireland outperforming Great Britain. (coughs) Business surveys by the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce show that two-thirds of local businesses have now adapted to the protocol and 70% claim that they see advantages in their dual position, something the rest of us in the UK have lost. I will. (coughs) The Honourable Lady is quite right to say that there is an advantage to business and to the economy of Northern Ireland. And interestingly, last week, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland couldn't tell me that they'd done any economic analysis whatsoever. But when we think of the, the, the Minister for Brexit advantages, who said that uh, if they were to have the, introduce a border for imports in the United Kingdom, it would be an act of self-harm. If that happens, or if that were to happen, it would, be, it would make it even more obvious that the Northern Ireland Protocol was an economic advantage to Northern Ireland, as they wouldn't be doubly hampered, first by this and then by the second completion of Brexit borders. I I thank my honourable friend for his intervention. I mean, it's still the case that there's no question there are issues, particularly with the implementation of the protocol. 29% of businesses are still experiencing some difficulties, although those facing serious problems have dropped from 15% to 8% since last year. This improvement over time suggests that some of last year's problems could have been avoided if businesses hadn't only been given a matter of weeks to get ready for last January. But supply chains from GB producers and manufacturers would certainly benefit from technical improvements, particularly to reduce the burden on goods that are purely for sale in Northern Ireland. I think all of us can recognise that. 
But while the EU proposed mitigations last October, including an express lane for exactly these kind of goods, the UK Government hasn't engaged in any discussion since February. So talking about 18 months of solid negotiation is nonsense. Mm -hmm. And despite the remaining challenges, Northern Ireland business leaders are clear. They seek improvements, but they do not want the protocol removed. The loss of trust in this UK Government to honour their commitments is already holding back participation in Horizon Europe, to the detriment of research teams across the UK, especially in Scotland, where they had disproportionate success rate in landing EU funding. Right. Yeah. Disapplying almost half the protocol yeah. undermines a key part of the withdrawal agreement and runs the risk, as others have said, of provoking a trade war with the EU, Correct. further exacerbating the cost of living crisis. Correct. The EU would then be likely to place tariffs on UK exports, and as Scotland produces the UK's leading food and drink exports in whisky and salmon, Scottish businesses would face the brunt of such retaliatory action. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is vital the UK and EU get back round the table with all the stakeholders from Northern Ireland to discuss practical improvements to implementation of the protocol, reducing the friction and intrusion to a minimum while keeping the economic benefits for the province. Solutions can only be achieved with willingness, trust and goodwill, but sadly these are now in very short supply and unlikely to be improved by the Prime Minister's plan to wreck an international agreement he signed less than three years ago. Yeah, yeah. Sir William Cash. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, um, this bill stands behind the Union and the Union itself is dependent upon the sovereignty of the United Kingdom Parliament. These are fundamental constitutional issues upon which, upon which this Bill rightly insists. The European Union has been intransigent about this protocol. This undermines the Good Friday Agreement. Furthermore, their intransigence is motivated by considerations which are completely contrary to our right as a third country and they refuse to change their mandate. They have no right to insist that in relation to a third country such as the United Kingdom that they should exercise jur European jurisdiction through the European Court over Northern Ireland now that we have left the European Union. The European Union would no more allow any part of the national territory of any one of its member states to be governed by other countries who are not members of the European Union, then, for example, the United States itself would allow Texas to be partially governed by Mexico or for Canada to exercise legislative control over parts of the United States. It is simply inconceivable. Turning to the question of our parliamentary sovereignty, Section 38 of the Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020, and in particular Section 38.2b, which expressly provides for that we can override direct effect and direct applicability, notwithstanding European law in relation to Northern Ireland, enables us to take the necessary constitutional steps to dispose of parts of the protocol in our national interest, and in doing so enables us to save the Good Friday Agreement. <coughs> in respect of the democratic deficit, on which I had an exchange with the leader of the DUP, which the European Scrutiny Committee referred to in its report in March, we revealed that the European legislation in respect of Northern Ireland, since we left the European Union, has now turning into a motorway. This bill will enable us to prevent this happening in the interests of the people of Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom as a whole. One example of EU law that is on its way to being imposed on Northern Ireland came to my European Scrutiny Committee only last week. There is a whole stack of these which are now piling up. This is only one of a continuous stream of regulations and is known as the Construction Products Regulation. This will become the law of Northern Ireland. It consists of 120 pages with seven annexes. This has to stop. 
and so does the peril of the democratic deficit that goes with it. It must be borne in mind that, at least that, this that such legislation, and there are at least 40 of them in the pipeline, is made by majority vote of all the 27 countries in the European Union, made in the Council of Ministers of the EU, is made behind closed doors and without even a transcript. This is how the United Kingdom was subjugated by the EU since 1972. As to international law, there are numerous precedents, precedents where our preeminent judges, such as Lord Denning and, Denning and Lord Diplock, have been completely clear that international treaties are subject to parliamentary supremacy and similar principles were enunciated by the judges in the recent unanimous decision in the case of Miller. The principles that underlies this bill are sovereignty, our national interest, and the need to protect Northern Ireland as part of the Union, not only, and not only that, but also, in particular, the Good Friday Agreement. That is why this bill is so necessary. We have been prepared to negotiate over the past two years and more, but our attempts have been rebutted by intransigence and by the refusal by the EU to renegotiate their mandate. We had to draw the line. Ultimately, this has become a matter of necessity, consistent with international law itself. And indeed, Mr. De Rolera himself in 1937 repudiated the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921 in fundamental respects when setting up the Constitution of the Republic in their own national interest. We want good working relations with the Republic and the European Union, but not at their price. It is well reported that one of the key EU negotiators indicated at the outset of the negotiations on these matters that the price of Brexit would be Northern Ireland. Mr De Deputy Speaker, this will not be the case and this bill will ensure it doesn't happen. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the member for Stone because he brings to mind the importance of the warning that George Orwell gave us not to confuse nationalism with patriotism, which I think in this debate is something we all need to depend on. Indeed, George Orwell said, one prod to the nerve of nationalism and the intellectual decencies can vanish. The past can be altered and the plainest of facts can be denied. So let me in my time try to do justice to what Orwell warned us about. This is a situation that has been caused by Brexit, because it was Brexit that led us to need to negotiate the Northern Ireland Protocol. If we don't acknowledge that, we can't start dealing with the problems that we have created ourselves. And I say ourselves because this government knew in advance the problems that were going to arise in the situation. When the Prime Minister stood on the 19th of October 29 and told us that this deal would heal the country, he wasn't being truthful about the consequences that they themselves predicted. And the question before us now is, will this legislation make finding a solution to these problems easier, or indeed will it inflame further an already delicate and difficult situation? We know that the government needs the bogeyman of Europe to distract people in this country from its domestic woes, but the people of Northern Ireland deserve better from all of us. Because if this government really was doing its job, it would centre the people of Northern Ireland in this conversation. It would start with bringing more of the Northern Irish communities into this conversation and into the negotiation, and then go to the European Union with what they are saying. But that's not what we're seeing at this point in time. Here are five examples from this legislation alone of how this government is not being intellectually decent. It cannot tell us why this legislation is a necessity, why it needs this power rather than the powers that has already been given in Article 16 of the Protocol to act to safeguard the UK. Surely it's because that is about remedying a situation. This bill will drive a coach and horses through the proposals that we have. It could also start with Article 16 rather than making us drag out this proposal through Parliament and the many months before we would get the remedies that it's talking about if it really cared about the people of Northern Ireland. If this bill is a necessity, why is it giving ministers huge, great, big, sweeping powers that will change the rules on state aid and will allow the UK courts not to send questions about the interpretation of the protocol to the European Court of Justice? 
The EU has never refused the UK permission to bring in a measure under the Articles 10 State 8 rules, and yet somehow this Government thinks that is what it needs to do for the people of Northern Ireland. It also will bring in sweeping powers to ministers that will allow them to do things in terms of the EU protocol without any consultation with the people of Northern Ireland, without any agreement with this House at all. Why then does this Government say it needs the powers under Clause 19 to implement a new power of protocol without bothering to go through parliamentary process? After all, we went through the withdrawal agreement in a few weeks. We went through the trade and cooperation agreement in a day. What is it about scrutiny in this place this Government is frightened of? Why does it have to bring a sledgehammer to crack a nut to give these ministers these wide powers? As the Treasury Solicitor himself said, Clause 18 is the do-whatever-you-like power what it calls a Charles I power. And if ministers can do that in Northern Ireland, what will they do to the rest of the UK? Everybody in this House must recognise this Bill's implications go further than Northern Ireland. When we trash our reputation on international agreements, we trash our opportunities of making the trade deals that our constituents will depend on. We risk the spectre of a trade war when this country is already dealing with the consequences of the increase in the cost of living directly caused by Brexit, the direct impact this is having on food prices in our country, let alone the message that we send to President Putin when we try to stand up to him in one place but in another, say that international rules of law don't matter. The people of Northern Ireland are being let down by this legislation. The people in every constituency in this country are being let down by this legislation. The failure to find a solution that puts the people of Northern Ireland front and centre at negotiating a solution for their future lets down everybody in this chamber. We can and we should do better. Everybody in this House knows that. But will we have the bravery of listening to George Orwell, standing up to those scoundrels who quote patriotism when they mean nationalism, and finally put doing the right thing first? I fear not in this place, but I have hopes for the other place. What I certainly know is that many of us will not stop standing with the people of Northern Ireland, with the people in our communities who will be affected by this legislation and by the implications. And we will stop laughing at the British public when they're frightened about what this place is doing and start asking what we can do to make things better. Naming those problems is a stirp place. When you've got people who are addicted to power, addicted to using Europe as a bogeyman rather than solving those problems, it's beholden on all of us to say enough is enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sir Roger Gale. Yeah, yeah. Sir Deputy Speaker, while I understand the reason for his absence, I rather wish that it was the Prime Minister and not the Foreign Secretary that had introduced this bill tonight. Because when he took office, the Prime Minister told us that he had an oven, oven ready deal. Um, and he also said, I believe I'm right in saying, over my dead body, will there be a border down the Irish Sea? The withdrawal agreement and the protocol were freely entered into. The Prime Minister and David, now Lord Frost, brought that document back in triumph and campaigned upon it in the 2019 election campaign. It subsequently went through this House with a large majority. I know that only too well, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I was sitting in the chair that you're sitting in now when I announced the result of that vote. But they were warned that this deal was flawed. My right honourable friend, the member for Lagan Valley and others, pointed out before it went through this House what was wrong with it indicated the dangers of the border down the Irish Sea and they were not heeded and that is why we're here tonight. This bill does breach the Vienna Convention on Legal Treaties. My right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, spelt it out very clearly indeed. There is no doctrine of necessity that applies in this case. Article, 9, Article 16 does exist as what, if I'm allowed to use the word, a backstop. And the case in law simply cannot stand up. That means that the bill that we are proposing to put through this House tonight 
will be a gross breach if it is enacted and implemented of international law. One well, gentleman for giving way, um, and he's absolutely right in what he's saying about about the, the the bill in front of us tonight. But also, the UK government will not be able to complain if the European Union choose to cherry pick and undo something unilaterally itself, because this is the precedent they're now setting. You can do what you want. I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman, but I think the rather more dangerous point uh, that has already been made tonight is the damage that this will do to our reputation for integrity and the position that we will find ourselves in when we criticise perhaps President Putin for breaking international law, which of course he does over and over again. I'm a I thank the Honourable Member for giving weight, but really, does he think that that is a, a fair comparison to make? Um, could I gently suggest to my young friend that if I hadn't thought it was a fair comparison, I wouldn't have made it? <laughs> <laughs> Mistake is not the prerogative of age. Um, I feel very strongly indeed that we are going down an extremely dangerous path. I believe passionately in the Belfast Agreement and the Good Friday Agreement, it's more colloquially known. We have to get this back on track, but we're not going to make Marcus Sefcovic's job any easier, I believe, by lumbering him with this piece of legislation. I hope and very much indeed, because I'm quite sure that this will ultimately go through this House, whether it goes through the other House is another matter. But I hope very much indeed that before this becomes <coughs> law, an agreement will be reached. The agreement has got to be reached by negotiation. That really is the only way forward. The proposals within some of the legislation, the, the red route, the green route, are sound and can be implemented. And there's every indication that the European Union is willing to accept not all, but at least part of those kinds of proposals. And I believe that that is the way forward. I don't believe that the bill is the way forward. And that is why, sadly, I shall not be supporting it tonight. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. First of all, can I welcome this bill? It's a bill which is long overdue, a bill which delivers on some of the promises which have been made to get the evolution restored in Northern Ireland. Um, and then uh, for the last 18 months, no action was taken on. And I think it is important that people understand that it is essential for the, the, the rest restoration of devolution in Northern Ireland that the protocol issue is dealt with. Because the very basis of devolution in the Belfast Agreement is destroyed by the protocol. The protocol requires that unionist parties which believe that the protocol is designed for the destruction of our place within the United Kingdom and is damaging our economy and is hurting individuals, that if the Assembly is up and running and the protocol is not dealt with, unionist participation in the Assembly would mean that they would have to facilitate they would have to facilitate the implementation of the agreement and they would have to acquiesce in other parties facilitating and implementing the uh, agreement with, or the protocol which we believe is designed for destruction. Now, no other party in this House would enter a coalition, because don't forget, it's a mandatory coalition. We have to be there. No other party in this House would enter a coalition arrangement where they were obliged to support and to facilitate and to undertake policies which they were totally opposed to. And that's why devolution will not be restored until the protocol issue is dealt with. And there, 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 much today has been said about flexibilities in the checks. We could have flexibilities in the checks. But it's not just flexibilities in checks on goods. The whole issue of the protocol is that it undermines democracy in Northern Ireland. It, it imposes foreign law in Northern Ireland. 
It enfor enforces foreign law on companies which don't even trade with the, the rest of the EU. So it's not necessary for them to comply with that law, yet the protocol requires them to do so. Member Gilway. Thank you, Member for giving way and in relation to the protocol, uh, it is worth noting that not one unionist party has uh, uh, approved what is going forward and we are united against it. Uh, but what it has created is a virtual economic united Ireland and EU have been, the EU have been uh, party to actually drive on that forward uh, with the Republic of Ireland uh, in the negotiations that they have been involved in, and that has created a major problem. There is not one constituency in this, uh, in this Parliament that is not affected by people who cannot are finding it difficult to supply goods to uh, businesses in Northern Ireland. And, uh, the member makes a very important point. Despite the, uh, the attempts by the SDLP, um, and I think only the SDLP actually tonight have suggested that there are no problems with the protocol. At least every other party is now accepting that, to one degree or another, there are problems caused by it. And, of course, that is one of the issues which we have faced in these negotiations. The Irish Government have patronisingly come to Northern Ireland in the form of the Foreign Minister and told us, you do not really know what you are talking about. There is not a problem. And, of course, that is fed through to the EU negotiators. And that's one of the reasons why it is important that we have this bill, because despite what has been said, and I've listened to the members of the Labour Party here tonight saying, what about Article 16? The first people to squeal if Article 16 had been invoked by the government would have been the Labour Party. And uh, as for the member for uh, Walthamstow talking about consult the people of Northern Ireland, she didn't consult too much or care too much about consultation when it came to abortion. Yeah, yeah. And of course now she is wanting to appeal to the toffs down the other end. A member of the Labour Party hoping that the toffs down in the other end of this building will uh, save this, uh, uh, will defeat this bill. Um, uh, you know, that, 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 no, I'll not, not give away in the matter. I'll not give away in the matter. The matter. I, I, think, I think the honourable member is talking about the members of the other place. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. <laughs> Are you giving way? Yeah, I'll give way. Stella Creasy. I thank the honourable member for giving way. We are trying to make progress in this place, so can he clarify, would he be opposed to bringing more representatives of the Northern Irish political parties into the direct joint working groups on this to solve this problem? Is he actually saying he does not want a voice in this, he just wants to shout? Well, I think that, uh, the, first of all, the people in Northern Ireland have spoken in an election recently, and the, the people who, uh, the, and, and uh, the, the, the unionist population have made it quite clear that they, they will not accept the, the, um, the, the uh, protocol. And when it comes to this argument, well, surely we can have negotiations. Surely we can have negotiations. Point of order. Can we stop the clock, please? Angus McNeil. I am grateful, honourable gentleman, for bringing in a parliamentary president. And are we now uh, allowed to refer to the House to unbiased the House of Toffs? I think it is I think it's, I think it's a rather good uh, suggestion. Well done. Barmer, Barmer. <laughs> we will find that that was corrected to uh, members of the other place, even noble members of the other place. Toffs, no. Sammy Wilson. I don't know if, no I don't know if Noble Toffs is acceptable. But, <laughs> 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 uh, but the, 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 the members have argued that surely we can do this by negotiation. Let's look at the record of this. First of all, the EU have said they will not negotiate the text of the, the, the protocol. They haven't said it once, they haven't said it twice, they've said it every time that they've visited Northern Ireland, every time they have met the representatives of the government. In fact, they've gone further. They're now taking us to court in order to impose more checks. And the result of removing the grace periods would be to increase the number of checks per week for goods coming into Northern Ireland from 6,000 to 25,000. So this is hardly flexibility on behalf of the, the EU, and indeed recently they have written to the government demanding not only checks on goods, but when people come on ferries or on aeroplanes from GB into Northern Ireland, that their own personal baggage is searched to make sure they're not bringing sandwiches or whatever else in. Indeed, I had constituents this week who have told me that at Kinryan such searches have already started. 
Um, now, so uh, we're not looking at flexibility here, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We're looking at a hardening of attitude by the EU. And therefore, whether you, you, you trigger Article 16 or whether you enter negotiations, I think we all know what the outcome is, is going to be. And that's why the government, I believe, has had to take this, um, th- this uh, unilateral action. But this is not the government abandoning its obligations. In fact, this is the government honouring its obligations in two ways. First of all, to the EU, insofar as the single market will be protected by the goods which go through the red lane, by the imposition of fines on firms which try to avoid them, and also by the requirement of firms in Northern Ireland that are going to want to trade with the EU to voluntarily comply with all EU regulations. That safeguards the EU market. So we're living up to our obligations to the European Union, and at the same time, they live up to their obligations to the people in Northern Ireland, because the green lane or the free lane or whatever they want to call it um, enables goods to come into Northern Ireland without any checks. It doesn't, it doesn't require the imposition of EU law on the 95% of firms in Northern Ireland that don't even trade with the Irish Republic. And of course, it ensures that when you're making judgments about whether the law has been broken, it's made by courts in the United Kingdom, albeit with reference to uh, the uh, decisions made in the European Court. So I think that this bill, if one looks at it objectively, rather than through the the eyes of people who long that we should have remained and want to still act almost as agents of the EU in this House, if you look through it objectively, this bill will help to restore devolution. It will ensure the integrity of the United Kingdom and it will also protect the European single market. Yeah. Craig McKinley. Uh, I think all in this House this evening should remember what this is all about. This is about protecting the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, I was just a mere lad, born in 1966, living through those times on this side of the pond. And to have peace on that island after so long was a prize worth having by all. And I, I, I do uh, I quote some of, uh, of what the Right Honourable Member for Lagan Valley said. And this is about the situation that Northern Ireland finds itself in, of having regulation without representation at all. Now, what we're forgetting is the... The Northern Ireland Protocol has many provisions within Article 1. I assume you have articles and provisions based on importance that they are. And Article 1 says most clearly that this protocol is without prejudice to the provisions of the 1998 Agreement in respect of the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. Further, then, in Article 13.8, it couldn't be more clear that any subsequent agreement between the Union, EU and the United Kingdom shall indicate the parts of this protocol which it supersedes. Article 16, the safeguarding clause. Let's not forget there's only been one party thus far who's actually reached for the Article 16 clause, and that was the European Union in response to try and stop us from having life-saving vaccines. That's who we're dealing with here. And then, of course, in the actual withdrawal agreement itself, in Article 164.5d, which says what the Joint Committee can and can't do, the Joint Committee can agree to change the text of the protocol to address deficiencies or to address situations unforeseen. There are those in this House who will say, oh, well, you signed it. It's international law. Well, that's fair enough. But... The draconian way in which the EU have interpreted their, their rights under this protocol is disproportionate. How can it be that across the border of GB to NI, which is a mere rounding error in the entirety of trade within the European Union, suffers a full 20% of checks? That cannot be proportionate or reasonable. But I tell you why that we're in this situation. It's because of animosity towards Brexit. This is about punishment because they can. 
And we got to this stage because of the legal straitjacket that this Parliament between 17 and 19 put us in, where members of this place did all that they could to make sure that the cards were stacked in the hands of the EU and against this place, and we had a very poor game to play. And don't forget, there were EU officials quoted as saying that Northern Ireland is the price to pay for Brexit. Where do we go from here? We've had 300 hours of negotiation uh, by Lord Frost and now uh, our own Foreign Secretary. And what does Maros Sefcovic just say? I have no mandate. Mm -hmm. Well, please, EU, give us somebody who has that mandate. Let's have that negotiation, because this cannot continue. We've heard much this afternoon about necessity, and I feel that the clause of necessity has most certainly been reached. We need to ask ourselves, we have a doctrine of legislation that usually says that subsequent legislation is more important or overwrites previous legislation. That's the usual doctrine of our constitution. But we need to ask ourselves something really uh, important here. What is the most important legislation? Is it that constitutional act of union of 1800? Is it the Good Friday Agreement, which has brought peace to the island of Ireland? That has been set aside. These things have been set aside, particularly the Act of Union, by appeal court in Belfast. Or is it more important to somehow save the dear European single market from the threat of an errant pork pie. That is what we're looking at. Now, the EU should take great comfort from our front bench. I've heard throughout from the Foreign Secretary and others that this legislation will protect the single market with powers to all those who uh, may seek to undermine it. We will be having full legal measures to stop those who want to break the rules. They should take every comfort that they need from that, because it's got nothing to do with upsetting the single market. I believe we've had a little bit of timidity in this bill. I would have preferred it to go further, because I, I see some difficulties with the red and green lanes, because if the EU don't trust us now, I find it hard to believe that they're going to trust us in the future. We need mutual enforcement, where we trust them and they trust us. That is what people do across borders. We are the Conservative and Unionist Party. I look across to my Unionist friends, and I am with you. I will fight for this union, and this bill will help. Leila Moran. To Deputy Speaker. I have to say there have been elements of this debate that feel a bit like a bad sequel. We thought that the Brexit debates were behind us, um, but instead what we're seeing is a government intent on reopening old wounds to save their own political skin, rather than looking forward at the issues that are facing the country now and solving them. Because people are in crisis here, now. The cost of living crisis is real. And what is the government's response, rather than spending time focused on that, is to renege on an international agreement that risks plunging us into a trade war with our biggest trading partner. As a result, the bill would only increase blocks and barriers on imports and exports, and that in turn will cause prices to rise even further. For farmers, for fishermen and for families up and down the country, that is the last thing that they want. And those businesses in Northern Ireland don't want it either. The UK Trade and Business Commission, of which I'm a member, has taken evidence from people and businesses in Northern Ireland for the last year. One leading service provider told us that unfettered access to both the UK and the EU single market has benefited the Northern Irish economy. Another witness told us that support for the protocol is growing in Northern Ireland precisely because it protects the Good Friday Agreement and brings economic opportunities. And it's for this reason that the majority of MLAs support the protocol. But that said, no one is suggesting that there aren't issues. We knew we would have to go into further negotiations. And what do you ask? Well, let's start with an SBS 
agreement. But doing that's going to be difficult. And how do you do that without basic trust between both sides? And I ask the minister, how does doing this, how does breaking international law increase trust between negotiating partners? It doesn't. And we knew this was going to happen because the Treasury highlighted that there was an impact in this impact assessment in 2019, what the protocol would do. It said it would be disruptive, particularly to Northern Ireland businesses. It's extraordinary that the government only now seems to care about cross-community consent because most people in Northern Ireland voted against Brexit and even more voted against this hard Brexit chosen by this government, and yet the government went ahead anyway. And to the DUP, to be fair, they voted against the withdrawal agreement. They were clear before the Prime Minister signed it that that protocol did not have cross-party consent. So what has actually materially changed since then? The Prime Minister's position. And so what does he do? He breaks the law again. Because, Mr. Speaker, this is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is an egregious breach of international law. Article 25 of the International Law Commission's text on internationally wrongful acts of state allow a breach of international obligations only when there is, this is the only way for a state to safeguard an essential interest against a grave and imminent peril. And others have already made speeches about why this is not the only way. Furthermore, it states that necessity may not be invoked when the state has contributed to the situation of necessity. Now, Mr. Speaker, how, Mr. Deputy Speaker, how can anyone claim that we didn't know? The government signed it. It was debated to death in this place all through the Brexit years. To suggest that this is new information is doublespeak. It's straight out of Orwell's 19. 84, and moreover, the despots across the world are going to be delighted. How on earth can we hold others to account when we are tying ourselves up in knots, trying to find loopholes to get out of the agreements that we sign? This is how banana republics act, not Great Britain. The world looks to us. Can they trust us, they ask, when they want to make trade agreements with us? And it is that trust that is being eroded today in this bill. But it's being noticed on the ground, and it would be remiss of me to not mention my honourable and gallant friend, the member for Tiverton and Honiton, joined our benches today. And I am sure, like many across this House, particularly on the other side, were there knocking on doors, and this came up. Trust in this government. Trust in this Prime Minister. This government breaking international law is par for the course. So this bill is disgraceful. Disgraceful is a course of action, and I and the Liberal Democrats will be voting against it, because we are a party of law and order. We believe in the international rules-based order. The government should withdraw this legislation, get on with tackling the cost of living emergency, and get on with safeguarding in the interests of the whole of our nation. Aaron Bell. Thank you, Mr. Deputy yeah, Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Could I begin with, just as the Foreign Secretary did, with the Good Friday Agreement? I think it's common cause across the House that that is the sacrosanct treaty that we really must uphold in this place. Uh, and obviously, where there are competing treaties, there have to be mechanisms to decide between them, as uh, colleagues on the benches opposite, the DUP benches opposite, <coughs> said earlier. And as the Foreign Secretary said in her piece in the Financial Times yesterday, the protocol was not set in stone forevermore on signing. It explicitly acknowledges the need for possible new arrangements in accordance with the Good Friday Agreement. And as she said, our first preference is to renegotiate the text with the EU. We've been working at that for a year and a half. We haven't been able to do that. The EU has not been engaging uh, as, as recently as this weekend, she said. And if I could quote another piece written by my colleague, uh, the Right Honourable Member for Bromley in Chislehurst. He said, a good deal of the blame lies with the needlessly rigid and inflexible approach adopted on the EU side. And I, I couldn't agree more. We really need to get negotiation going. And I will speak about negotiation for most of the rest of my speech. This is a second reading debate, Mr Deputy Speaker. Nobody is expecting this bill to be rammed through the Commons, let alone the Parliament, in any, uh, in any short order. And therefore, whilst I do understand the arguments that have been made across the House, including my many learned and uh, senior colleagues on my own benches, 
I will not stand here and undermine and circumscribe the government's negotiating position with the EU. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the right honourable member for North Dorset questioned whether the bill was a bargaining chip. Well, if we're going to have a negotiation, I'd rather have as many bargaining chips as possible. So uh, I tried to intervene on him. He wouldn't take my intervention during his speech. But that was the fatal mistake this Parliament, uh, or I should say the previous Parliament, made between 2017 and 2019. Too many members tried to circumscribe the government's negotiating position. Too many members tried to undermine our position. Too many members tried to take the side of the EU. Yeah. To pose as the leader of the opposition and the former leader of the opposition, the member for Islington North did, with the EU negotiating team, undermining what this government was trying to do. I will take his intervention. That's a question about members of this House. Does either believe in parliamentary sovereignty or not? Because if he does, then the members have every electoral right to do so. I completely agree with parliamentary sovereignty, and I also believe that no parliament can bind a successor. And I'm much, more, much pleased that we have a much more reasonable parliament on these matters from the results of the general election of 2019 than we had previously. And we also, I might add, have a much more reasonable speaker on these matters. The previous speaker completely undermined what the government was trying to do in that parliament. So negotiation is about achieving a win-win, but you don't do that by undermining your own position. And I agree with uh, my honourable friend from North, from North Thanet. I'm not going to take a job, Mr. 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 Gullis. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, no, I agree with my honourable friend from North Thanet first that the, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol was flawed, but it was because of the antics of the previous Parliament that it was flawed. It was the antics of that Parliament, as my friend from South Thanet said in his speech a few moments ago. That is what created the unsatisfactory need for the protocol in the first place. And in reality, we need to go right back to the start of the negotiations. And I have a huge amount of time for my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, the former yeah. Prime Minister. But the reality is that the sequencing, uh, the sequencing decision in that first summer of 2017 was where it all started going wrong. We should never have allowed the Northern Ireland to be split apart from the negotiation in the way we did. We should have found a way to leave, and we wouldn't have had the problems with the protocol that we now see. So that's, that's what led us to this position. I also believe the EU have been using these negotiations, or I should say the lack of them, in bad faith. They've been resisting cooperation with this government, even in areas where they, we ought to have simple mutual advantage. And I speak particularly of the Horizon Project, uh, the Horizon Programme, which we've considered at great length on the Science and Technology Committee. I'd like to see that reinstated. And it's a shame that the EU are using the Northern Ireland Protocol issues to resist that happening. So, uh, to, to conclude, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I believe this bill contains. Oh, you can have more. You can have more. This bill contains solutions to the four principal issues with the protocol: customs, regulation, tax and spend, and governance. But I actually fervently hope that this bill won't need to be passed in the end. I hope that this bill is what unlocks the negotiations with the EU that can lead to a mutually satisfactory result, both for the government both, and for the EU, but most importantly, the people of Northern Ireland, nationalists and unionists alike, I should say. It should be a device that, that brings people together and kick-starts negotiations. And I stand with the same position my right honourable friend for South Swindon said. Uh, he made exactly the same point in summing up. This bill is, is perhaps a negotiation device. It is also a backstop if those negotiations fail. I support it on both those bases, and I support the government tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stephen Farry. Madam <laughs> Deputy Speaker, this is an extremely bad bill. It's unwanted, unnecessary, and indeed it's dangerous. Uh, a number of members have referred to Orwellian doublespeak, but also we, we, we should add some, some Alice in Wonderland thinking uh, to what is actually happening here. And I think I have to say at the start as well, the approach that the Foreign Secretary took to opening this debate was, I think, was deplorable and was not taking the issues entirely seriously. And indeed, the process by which she's got to this point as well as being extremely disappointing. Her engagement in Northern Ireland has been incredibly selective, and she has chosen an echo chamber to reinforce her own uh, prejudicial views on the way forward, rather than engaging with the entire community in Northern Ireland. The bill is opposed by a majority of members of the Northern Ireland Assembly, and indeed voters in Northern Ireland. The business community is deeply concerned by many aspects of the bill, and the bill is not even effective in getting the DUP to recommit to an executive. Some members have been lauding the, the, the words coming from the leaders of the DEP today, but listening to it carefully and you read it in Hansard, it's full of if, ifs, buts and maybes. 
and it does not commit to returning to the executive any time in the near future, if you read those words very, very carefully. And I hear from the, from the back benches such a cynic, rather than actually any refute, uh, anyone trying to refute what I'm saying, which tells its own story itself. Now, the protocol is a consequence of this, of this government's decision in relation to Brexit, particularly the decision to go for a hard Brexit. It also reflects the fact that the, the DUP pursued Brexit without any real consideration for the impact upon Northern Ireland and the reality that any hard Brexit would require some form of special arrangements for our part of the world. A hard Brexit does pose some very particular challenges to the whole notion of a shared and interdependent Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is a diverse society and that has to be recognised. It is not a perfect solution by any means, but it does offer up Northern Ireland the opportunity of a soft landing given all the tensions posed by Brexit to it. It brings opportunities in terms of dual access to both the GB and uh, EU markets, but of course it also has its challenges. We must do all we can to maximise those opportunities, but also all we can to address the challenges themselves. Now, the bill is very far-reaching. Uh, it immediately disapplies some aspects of the protocol and gives ministers far-reaching uh, the ability to, to disapply others. It brings major consequences. It threatens Northern Ireland's access to the EU single market for goods. The dual regulatory system is seen by the business community as unworkable. Uh, hopefully, ministers have heard from the Dairy Council, the meat producers, the Northern Ireland Food and Drink Association and Manufacturing Northern Ireland, who have all expressed major concerns in, that, in this regard. Also, the loss of the, European, uh, the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice also brings its consequences. The protocol is not the same as a free trade agreement. It is a different type of beast. It is about us having access to the single market as a region. And indeed, this is not a neutral situation that we have to uh, almost tolerate. This actually is to North Ireland's benefit, because the, the most likely outcome is going to be a situation where other parts of the European Union don't treat Northern Ireland's goods as having that free access, and we may actually need the European Court to enforce that access for our businesses. So let's not throw it away without thinking through the consequences. And the bill also risks a trade war with the European Union. I don't want to see that happening, but that is, is a potential risk, and undermines relations with the United States of America. The rules-based international order is something of fundamental importance to the UK and the wider world, and again we mess with that with our peril. Now, the government has been disingenuous in a number of aspects around how they have sought to defend the bill. This is not about defending the Good Friday Agreement. Brexit was a threat to the Good Friday Agreement. The protocol is a response to protect that, that, that situation. There is not a choice between the protocol and the Good Friday Agreement. The two can be reconciled if people wish to do that. Indeed, one of the justifications is free. Let's just. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Member says that the protocol is designed to protect a Good Friday Agreement. The North South Institution has collapsed. The Assembly is not meeting. The Executive is not functioning adequately. In the words of the Irish Foreign Minister, East West relations are at their lowest ebb they have been for years. So how is the protocol doing in protecting the Good Friday Agreement? Well, I would, I would rather suggest actually that the, the, uh, the honourable member actually lies at the heart of all four of those outcomes that he's just listed. In the sense, the DP ministers pulled out of the North South, North South institutions, they pulled out of the, of the executive, they are not allowing the assembly to meet, and frankly, uh, North South East West relations have been poisoned both by the government and also by the comments from a number of unionist members in Northern Ireland in recent years. Now, in terms of the issue. Uh, Consensus. The other issues used uh, to justify this. The, the, one of the first things the government goes, goes to is we can't do this VAT reduction on renewables in Northern Ireland. This is an outrage. Well, I've actually looked into this. Now, the government's own figures suggest that the, the entire net value per annum to Northern Ireland of, of this measure is a sum total of £1 million per year. Also, the government has the option of going to the European Commission to ask for flexibility in this regard. Have they done that in the past three months since the Chancellor made the announcement? No, they haven't. So, so it's clear they prefer to have this as a manufactured grievance rather than actually trying to find a genuine solution. Also, the government are, are, are saying that no proper negotiations have happened over the past 12, 18 months. Why is that the case? The government has not approached this in good faith. So negotiations have stalled in that respect. And also, they are now saying that uh, th th there is a, 
they, ha they can't proceed unless the EU say they're up for renegotiation of the protocol. That actually denies that there's three different elements in, in, way in which things can be fixed, all consistent with the protocol as it currently stands. First of all, there are flexibilities inside the protocol, and we've seen progress already on the issue of medicines, which again, for their own reasons, the government refused to acknowledge the progress that has been made. I wonder why that is the case. Also, 13.8, and I agree with other members, 13.8 does exist to allow the protocol to be superseded in whole or in part. Is also there as part of the protocol. It was actually put in, I understand, at the request of the UK government, so that can, that can be used. But it has to be done by negotiation, by mutual agreement. And thirdly, we can do things in terms of supplemental agreements to the trade and cooperation agreements, such as a veterinary agreement. Again, those options have not been pursued. So there's plenty of, of options out there which the government can pursue entirely in keeping with the EU's current negotiating mandate. So people say there is no alternative uh, in terms of, uh, of to, to this bill. And let me be very clear, there is. It is to go back and negotiate in good faith, to build trust and partnership with the European Union. And let's just think for a second. Is this bill itself going to improve trust and partnership? Is it going to make those negotiations any easier? No, it's going to make it harder. Because every solution, every practical solution that I agree with depends upon EU and UK trusting each other. And that's not the case in terms of where the government sits tonight. Andrew Bowie. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I find myself in an unusual uh, position uh, in rising to speak uh, this evening, in that I find myself in disagreement with, uh, uh, very unusually with the right honourable member, the member from Maidenhead, and, uh, and in agreement, in part at least, uh, with the honourable member for Gordon. In, in, in part because he said in his uh, speech earlier on today that uh, we bandy around the phrase our precious union and phrases like the integrity of our union. Uh, quite a lot in this House, and it's uh, quite clear to me that not everybody understands exactly what they are talking about when they talk about the Union or uh, its integrity, and, and so much so, in fact, I, I worry that the meaning on the reports has indeed uh, been lost. But it does mean quite a lot to those of us that are in politics because we are fighting every day to maintain this Union, to retain, to retain our national identity and to retain the right, as we all in this country uh, have, to say that we are, we are British or we are of this United Kingdom, Scot Scottish, Northern Irish, Welsh and English, but also also British, and, and all else, and I mean all else, is secondary to that. And so I sympathise with those in Northern Ireland who were alarmed to hear the British government in court claim that the Northern Ireland Protocol temporarily suspended Article 6 of the Act of Union, Article 6 which created the internal market of the United Kingdom, designed to give Ireland and now Northern Ireland residents equal footing with regards to trade and guarantee equal footing in all future treaties with foreign powers. And to those of us that hold most dear the notion that all in these islands are equal and are all held uh, in parity of esteem, this article is fundamental to who we are as a people. And it is why it is not surprising that those who want to break this union, to remove that right, to take away our identity, to remove the right to call ourselves British from those of us that hold that right most dear, are against that move, move today. For the SNP uh, may couch their opposition to this bill in legalistic language, and they may claim, as they did, did in their amendment, which was not selected, they were against this bill because it was against international law. But the, well, yes, of course, because I've referenced the SNP. Oh, of course, I'm, I'm very grateful because if the honourable gentleman is protecting what he sees as he and I would both agree the Treaty of Union, why does it therefore extend the protocol, even reformed through the government, to Scotland, which voted like Northern Ireland to remain within the European Union? The, the reason that it's extended, it might have, might have passed the honourable member's attention that we actually had a referendum in Scotland in which the people of Scotland voted to remain in the United Kingdom. So the reason it was extended to Scotland is because Scotland voted to remain in the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom voted, uh, uh, voted as a whole to leave the European Union. He really must catch up. It was eight years ago that we had that argument, and we won. But the, S the, SNP, the SNP are against this bill because it says in the introduction that it provides that enactments including the Union with Ireland Act 1800 and the Act of Union Ireland 1800 are not to be affected by the provision of the Northern Ireland Protocol. In effect, they are against it because this bill affirms our Union and protects its integrity, and that is a very bad thing indeed for the separatists. 
We, myself included, did vote for this protocol. But as we have heard numerous times today, and I won't waste the House time by rehashing the examples we've already heard, it is not working. Rightly or wrongly, true to previous international obligations or not, whether you liked it or not, whether you would rather it were different, whether it brought upon ourselves or think it the fault of others, the protocol is not working. And almost everyone acknowledges that. The European Union, albeit tacitly, acknowledges that. It fails to meet its first objective, specified in paragraph 2 of Article 1 of the protocol itself that, and I quote, this protocol respects the essential state functions and the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom. And that is before we even look at whether it passes its own tests regarding trade. That, and I quote again, that nothing in this protocol prevents the United Kingdom from ensuring unfettered market access for goods moving from Northern Ireland to the rest of the United Kingdom's internal market. It is hugely frustrating, hugely frustrating, that the Commission refused to change the mandate of their representative in the talks, Maria Sefcovic. The government, we, I, everyone wants to see a negotiated solution to this. The European Union reopens agreements and negotiates changes with international partners all the time. It is almost certainly the world record holder in terms of reopening international agreements. I cannot, I simply cannot, and having been in Brussels recently, speaking to colleagues in the European Parliament about this, cannot understand the outright refusal to do so on this particular occasion, particularly when there is provision in the actual protocol to do just that. And I do wonder if all the strenuous efforts that we hear day to day by all the opposition parties in here demanding that we negotiate a solution, we, us, negotiate a solution, might be better directed at calling for the EU to come to the negotiating table with a mandate to do just that. We cannot negotiate when there is nothing to negotiate about. I am pleased the Government are bringing forward this Bill. We need to resolve the issues of East-West trade. For the people of Northern Ireland, we must see a return to devolved government instalment. We must restore the primacy of the Good Friday Agreement, and we must ensure that parity of esteem for all people on these islands is held dear. I would rather that we didn't have to introduce this Bill. But the refusal of the EU to come properly to the negotiating table is a huge frustration. And so acting as it is, is the Government's only option. And that is why I am proud to be supporting it this evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Blomfield. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. This bill says everything about the sorry state of this government. Now, it's not about solving the problems of the protocol, uh, it's, uh, which, of course, the government itself created. But like the Rwanda plan, the human rights proposals, the handling of the rail strike, it's another wedge issue. And as the Right Honourable Member for Hereford and South Herefordshire put it, instead of getting to grips with the problems it's facing, this government is, quote, simply seeking to campaign, to keep changing the subject, and to create political and cultural dividing lines. Dividing lines for its advantage and for those of the, that of the Prime Minister. And there's no dividing line they like better than Brexit. So here we are again, picking a fight with the EU. It's surely no coincidence that last week's by-elections were scheduled by the government on the anniversary of the referendum, and in the run-up, not only did we have the launch of this bill, but the increasingly ridiculous so-called Minister for Brexit Opportunities rolling out his equally pointless Brexit dashboard. But it didn't work. People want the government to stop banging on about Brexit and start coming up with real answers to the problems they face, and that applies to this too. Because this bill isn't about fixing the problems arising from the protocol, and there are problems, flaws that the Prime Minister negotiated, and he knew what he was doing. Our membership of the EU provided an ideal framework for the Good Friday Agreement through a shared market with common rules. Unpicking it was always going to be difficult because there were only three choices, land border, sea border, or some form of all UK alignment. The Prime Minister made his choice. He negotiated a sea border, he knew it involved checks, and then he lied to the unionist community about it. We argued that it would damage the union, but the Prime Minister went ahead and, having played his role in creating the problems, he is now exacerbating them. Ministers are choosing to bypass the existing mechanisms for resolution that they agreed to when signing up to the deal, to put political self-interest over the national interest. As they did with the Internal Market Bill's first iteration, the Government are willing to undermine the peace process in Northern Ireland, provoke a row with our closest allies and most important trading partners in Europe, and anger our friends in the United States. There are 
practical solutions to the problems with GBNI trade, and my right honourable friend, the member for Leeds Central, outlined them. But it seems as if this government doesn't really want a solution. In seeking, for example, to remove the role of the uh, European Court of Justice, it feels like a deliberate provocation from a government wanting a fight. Manufacturing Northern Ireland, representing a key section of business, said it's a Brexit purity issue. Their chief executive explained, quote, no one in business has raised the issue of ECJ oversight as a problem for them in my presence. It's purely a political and sovereignty issue and not a practical or business issue. So why are we back at provocation rather than negotiation? Because provocation is this government's approach. Lecturing the world on the rule of law, but reneging on international treaties and trashing our reputation on the world stage. When they took the internal market bill through the House, the government uh, learnt the hard way and they rode back uh, on the most egregious parts of the legislation. It's frankly, Madam Deputy Speaker, more than tiresome to be going round this loop again. It's deeply irresponsible. Now, there are proposals that form a basis for agreement with the EU. The UK Trade and Business Commission, which has been mentioned, of which I'm a member, along with representatives of every political party represented in this House, as well as a cross-section from business, have listened to the voices of business on the issue. The Chief Executive of the British Meat Processors Association told us that the, that the cost of exporting food has gone up considerably and described the rules the Prime Minister negotiated as a monster of a system, but which could be simplified through a veterinary agreement. The director of the Chartered Institute for Environmental Health in Northern Ireland said, quote, the government has repeatedly stated that it will not compromise, compromise on our food standards and health protection, but has singularly and spectacularly failed to legislate for that. He continued, quote, that goes back to the need for proper, robust veterinary agreements and standards that I would argue, let's aim for surpassing standards within the EU, let's have the best food and environmental standards in the world because that will ultimately add value to our food products. So those involved are clear. An agreement with the EU on veterinary standards and non-regression would allow us to reach the highest possible standards. It would reduce checks. It would reduce costs for business. And it would involve this fight. It could be done quickly, so much more quickly than the government's months of posturing that we look forward to with this bill. Last week's elections confirmed just how out of touch this government are with the public. And not just in Great Britain. In Northern Ireland, polling carried out last month showed that the cost of living, the health service, education, the economy and jobs are higher concerns to the people of Northern Ireland than the, uh, than the protocol. So ministers should focus on addressing those issues and should commit to sensible negotiations on the protocol which would drop this reckless approach. There have been many powerful and thoughtful speeches on the benches opposite this evening and I do hope that they will follow their words by joining us in the lobby tonight and putting an end to this nonsense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sir Robert Neil. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is a profoundly serious debate because it's a profoundly serious thing for any country to depart from its international obligations. It is not an impossible thing to do, but it's a profoundly serious one and it should only be done under such circumstances of the most exceptional nature and on the most profound and compelling evidence. That again is possible, but I think we need to test whether we, yet, we are that yet there. Now, against that background, can I start by saying that everybody accepts the importance of the Northern Ireland Protocol as an attempt to reconcile conflicts that were inevitable post-Brexit and the nature of Brexit that was uh, decided upon. Equally, we have to be honest and say, despite best endeavours, it has failed to reconcile uh, those problems. Therefore, it does need to change, and I accept that as much as anyone else. Uh, it needs to change, and it needs to change, I think, significantly. I recognise that there are economic dislocations, though not in all of the Northern Ireland economy, but enough for it to be a serious problem. And the non-function of the executive, certainly at the very least, gives rise to the risk of real societal uh, divisions uh, and tensions. Those are circumstances where it is envisaged that there might be changes. But then we have to think it is whether or not we are acting perhaps proportionately and wisely in what we do. Looking at the position, I think, legally, it's this. Logically, 
there is already a route set out in the protocol by which these matters can be addressed. If there is to be change, uh, there is provision, of course, in sections in Article 13.8 uh, and also uh, subsequent articles, I think it's 164 uh, of the uh, protocol, for there to be changes to deal with deficiencies or, or uh, in effect, uh, situations unforeseen. And you might very well argue that some of the way the protocol has been interpreted, largely I would accept because of the intransigent nature adopted frequently on the EU side and the unwillingness to ex extend Mr Sefcovic's mandate have contributed to that. That might make a case uh, for acting under those articles. And I also accept too that the uh, protocol was never accepted, intended to be permanent. It was always envisaged that it could be changed. Equally, all of that presupposed that it will be changed by negotiation rather than through unilateral action. And that's the difficulty that we have to face here. How do you reconcile the primacy of the Good Friday Agreement, which I accept, both politically and legally, and the need for adjustment with, with maintaining our reputation as a country which sticks by its word? Uh, factor sum savanda, uh, uh, as, as we all say. Now, how do we get round that? This bill, as currently drafted, I, I think does not achieve that. It could be were it to be amended, and that's why I do not take the view that we should exclude the idea of legislation to act in the way that is envisaged, but I do think it needs some serious thought, because at the moment, as I've suggested elsewhere, it raises as many questions as it answers, and we don't have those. Because if we are not to go down the route envisaged of renegotiated changes within the protocol, and there may be pressing reasons why that is uh, uh, not achievable in the time frame available, you then have the ability, uh, under Article 16, uh, to take emergency safeguarding measures. Those have not yet been used. I agree with my right hon. Friend, the member for Chief and Woodford Green, that actually that might be an appropriate route to use. It might not solve all the problems, but I would suggest too, for reasons I'll come to, that would legally put the UK in a better position were it seek to let's then seek to go further than that. Because to rely upon necessity, as the government does, which is a respectable and established concept in international law, I concede that, but one which it's well known must be used exceptionally and therefore rarely and with a high evidence threshold to be met, um, it will be, much, I think, much better to have exhausted all opportunities. Indeed, that is part of the doctrine. To evoke necessity, not only must there be a grave and imminent threat, and I agree with my right hon. Learned Friend, the Member of South Swindon, that it may need not be immediate, uh, but it has to be something more than uh, merely contingent or a possibility, uh, and it has to be evidenced. Uh, and it seems to me that what we do not yet have is the evidence before us. Yeah, yeah. So what I say is that before this Bill passes its stages in this House, the Government, which is working upon its evidence base, which says it will be able to draw together the facts which can be applied to the evidence to, to substantiate the grounds of necessity ought to come to the House with that evidence. Going forward, rather than having exceedingly wide Henry VIII powers, I would think it much preferable that we do as we did with the UK Internal Markets Bill and require the government to come when it wishes to disapply an element of the protocol to the House and seek its endorsement, having presented that evidence to it. Similarly, I don't see why the clauses uh, in uh, uh, Clause 18, which such wide powers to do anything virtually is acceptable, it should come back to the House, and why it is necessary in Clause 20 to seek the act to oust the jurisdiction of the European Court at this stage, because as yet the potential jurisdiction of the ECJ is at least contingent and, present, uh, and potential, and therefore not, I think, pressing and immediate in terms of the doctrine of necessity. So uh, I will not support the bill tonight. I will not vote against it. I am deliberately abstaining uh, tonight to see how the bill develops, because I think it could be amended into a workable form, but it comes with very many caveats and a lot of questions I think the ministers need to answer, and I hope they will seek to address those as we go forward. Bell Rabiru Ali. Thank you, Madam yeah, Deputy yeah. Speaker. This government is making a habit of breaking the law. Just last Friday, the Home Secretary was found to be in breach of the law, and not for the first time, in relation to the Equality Act and the mistreatment of refugees. 
Overnight, we learned that the Prime Minister intends to be in breach of WTO rules in order to slap tariffs on steel. And here we are today with the Foreign Secretary telling us earlier that this government will rip up the Northern Ireland Protocol that it negotiated and it voted for. This is clearly another breach of the law and a shameful hat trick from three of the foremost senior officers of government. The party opposite can keep trying to spin it however it likes, but the bottom line is the withdrawal treaty is an international treaty. The unilateral abrogation of a treaty or any part of it is a breach of international law. In addition to undermining any reputation for straight dealing this government may still have, it also tarnishes the reputation of this country. It drives a coach and horses through the entire agreement that we've made with the European Union and it undermines the Good Friday Agreement with all the potentially serious consequences that that entails. It insults our intelligence, Madam Deputy Speaker, when the Foreign Secretary claims that it, it is to protect the Good Friday Agreement. It does the very opposite and she knows it. The potential consequences from this leg legislation include, but are not limited to, the possibility of an all-out trade war with the EU, no trade deal with the United States, severe disruption to our trade at a time when the economy is already suffering from conservative economic mismanagement and instigating political turmoil once more on the streets of Northern Ireland. The claims that the economy in Northern Ireland is suffering as a result of the protocol are completely false. North-South trade in Ireland is actually booming. It's the economy here which is suffering because of Brexit. Ministers know full well that the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted against Brexit and by a much bigger margin than the Vote Leave campaign achieved. They continue to elect a large majority of MPs and MLAs who oppose Brexit and support the protocol. But then this government and its predecessors have never been overly concerned with democracy in Ireland. The reality is, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the claim on which the party opposite fought the election that they would get Brexit done was a great deception. Six years after the referendum vote, the party opposite has gone through three prime ministers and may soon be on its fourth, uh, but still has not got Brexit done. We wouldn't be here if they had. Now, the Foreign Secretary called herself a patriot and said her party was, was the party of the Union and firmly in be belief and support of the Union, but the party opposite can't actually be serious. A disastrous Brexit and now trying to fiddle with it, um, a shoddy government generally, shocking legislation, which is just making nationalist arguments for them, and, and, and you know, hostility to greater devolution um, right, right, and, and ignoring the views of people uh, right across the other nations of this, of this country. This government is not a defender of the Union. It's probably actually the biggest threat to the Union of the United Kingdom that there has been in, in, in these recent years. Madam Deputy Speaker, they are unwilling to face reality or to come clean with the people of this country. They are willing to risk peace in Ireland, further damage living standards right across the UK and break the law in order to cling to office. So to paraphrase one of their own, Winston Churchill, never in the field of international relations has so much been put at risk to the detriment of so many for the interests of so few. So if it wasn't abundantly clear, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm firmly against this ridiculous piece of legislation. Robin Miller. Madam Deputy Speaker. Before I start, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to comment on the quality of the debate that we've had. I've been really encouraged that all parts of the House have contributed. Uh, we've heard many different views. But this is a reflection, too, of the conversations I've had around this place over the last few weeks in the run-up to this debate. And, and I welcome that engagement across the House on all of these points, because at the heart of this, I do believe this is about the Union. It's a question of principle. The uh, Honourable Member for Central Leeds says, said that this was a bill born out of desperation, not principle. But I would argue exactly the opposite. This starts with principle. For me, this starts with the ruling of the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal that the Acts of Union were subjugated by the Northern Ireland Protocol. It is imperative then, um, as a point well made by the Right Honourable Member for, for Lagan Valley, it is imperative then that while we consider issues of trade, while we consider the peace agreements, we also consider the integrity of the Union. All of these are important and each must be addressed, must be addressed but all can be addressed only if the integrity of the Union underpins them. With regard to trade, this bill restores free movement of goods within the UK. 
However, it also respects the integrity of the EU single market through the introduction of green and red channels. I would suggest this meets the test set by the Honourable Member of Maidenhead for actually delivering the aims of the Bill. Secondly, with regard to governance and jurisdiction, um, the Honourable Member for Stone mentioned the democratic deficit. That, in just one moment, the Honourable Member for Stone uh, mentioned the democratic deficit that exists within Northern Ireland. And I would suggest that this Bill meets that requirement through rejecting the jurisdiction um, uh, of, of the uh, EU and the court, uh, European Court of Justice, because with, with, that, without, with that, residents of Northern Ireland have no control over the laws that are set and which must govern them. I'll give way to the Honourable Member. I thank the Honourable Member for his point, and if I may just return briefly to the point he made prior to that. At no stage has this Government, or my party, ever called for a hard border on the island of Ireland. That's why we support this solution. But is the Honourable Member aware that in threatening retaliation, the only people who are now talking about a hard border on the island of Ireland, because if there's a trade war, they will not leave the border unsupervised on the island of Ireland, and they've threatened to remove the right of Northern Ireland companies to trade across the border in those circumstances. That cannot be policed in any other way than on the border itself. So it's now the EU threatening a hard border on the island of Ireland through retaliation and, by extension, threatening the Good Friday Agreement. The Right Honourable Member makes a strong point. Uh, I will come on to address that in, in just a moment within my speech. But I would make the case that this meets perhaps the second test of the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, the one of reputation. Because what self-respecting nation allows itself to be split and to allow part of it to fall under the governance of another unaccountable power? That cannot be the reputation that this union wishes to pursue. Thirdly, the question of um, the integrity of the United Kingdom. Article 1C on the front of this bill says, the Act provides that enactment, including the Union with Ireland Act 1800 and the Act of Union Ireland 1800, are not to be affected by provision of the Northern Ireland Protocol. I say that again, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, not to be affected by the provision of the Northern Ireland Protocol. This, I would suggest, meets the test of legality, because while we might have discussions, as the Honourable Member for Bromley and Chislehurst, Honourable and Learned Member for Bromley and Chislehurst pointed out, there may be questions about necessity, but I would argue, and standing here, my reason for supporting this bill lies in the imperative of what the Court of Appeal said, that the Acts of Union have been subjugated. That is reason enough for me. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Member for Tottenham, when he was challenged, declined to answer if he would change the protocol, what changes he would make or how they could be delivered. He did, however, make a very good point when he said we must focus on what works. And that, I would suggest, Madam Deputy Speaker, is what this bill is trying to do. A bill that provides a solution, a bill that seeks to address the issues of trade, a bill that respects and seeks to restore cross-community consent, and most importantly, restores the integrity of the UK while at the same time protecting the integrity of the EU single market. This is not a perfect bill. I have concerns about the sweeping powers within it given to ministers, and I suspect, subject to further debate, and, and I hope uh, without delay to the rapid progress through this House, those might be um, considered. However, I will support this bill with enthusiasm because there is a legal basis for action. As I've said, the Court of Appeal has set that by indicating the Acts of Union have been subjugated, which means that, as the Right Honourable Member for South Swindon said, inaction is not an option. And I would finish then, Madam Deputy Speaker, with this question for Honourable and Right Honourable Members. If that is the case, if our Acts of Union have been subjugated, if, as the Right Honourable Member for Swindon South says, that inaction is not an option, then if not this bill, then what? And if not now, when to restore the integrity of our union? Thank you. Most unusually, uh, many people who 
Oh, the Honourable Lady's already spoken. She's forgotten. <laughs> it's all right. I, <laughs> that really confused me. I'm counting the people. <laughs> but I admire her enthusiasm. <laughs> um, most, un, most unusually, um, uh, some members who had indicated to Mr Deputy Speaker earlier that they wished to speak uh, are not in the chamber and appear not to wish to speak. So therefore, most unusually, I'm going to extend the time limit, uh, at least for a short while, to seven minutes. Karen Smith. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Madam yes, Deputy yes. Speaker. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see how we go. Um, exactly six years ago uh, today, following the Brexit referendum, we had a statement in this House uh, with the Prime Minister, then Prime Minister. Over two hours of questions took place, and I believe I was the only non-Northern Ireland Member of Parliament to raise the issue of the Northern Ireland border. Specifically, I reference my own family who live both sides of that border. My family are from Cavan, and my current family, part of them, live in Fermanagh. I spend a lot of time there crossing the border. It's always been personal to me. The removal of the physical infrastructure throughout the 1990s was something that I was able to witness and see the benefits that happened there. But throughout the six years, and members who weren't here at the time have referenced it, but throughout most of that time, Northern Ireland received very little attention. It has always been an inconvenience to the Brexiteers. They have never really articulated a solution to the conundrum of the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland. And too many people across this House do not know and do not understand the history. Now, clearly, there's circulating amongst the ERG or somewhere a briefing pack that starts at 1800 with the Act of Union, moves swiftly on to 1998 and finds us back here today. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, it would well behove many members to walk along the corridor to the library to check the Hansards from this place throughout the 19th and 20th century. It would behove the party opposite to understand the arguments between Disraeli and Gladstone about that coming storm from the West, because it is a different place now than it was throughout those times. And careless words spoken in this place throughout those two centuries have impacts in Ireland, across uh, the, the Republic and across Northern Ireland. Peace and stability must always guide us all. We all want that to happen. But nothing in this bill does anything to bring peace and stability into Northern Ireland. It brings no power to people in Northern Ireland. It gives all power to singular ministers in this government. The Secretary of State has told us today that she has no agreement from the parties that they will go back to Stormont. And the powers given to the minister from the UK government is uh, complete, unfettered, with no accountability. One of the key parts of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which nobody seems to want to mention this afternoon, which has always been really important to bring peace and stability across communities, is the mutual interest and mutual respect between the UK and Irish government for the two communities that exist in Northern Ireland. Mutual interest and mutual respect. So I know the party opposite don't like this, but Ireland remains a member state and is that mutual interest. So when people casually talk about the EU being the enemy, what they really mean is that Ireland remains the enemy. For the Brexiteers, there has always been one solution to the problem of Northern Ireland, and that is for the Irish to leave the European Union. This is not, Brexit has never been about the UK leaving. It's always been about the destruction of the European Union. The solution for the Brexiteers, for the ERG that now control the party opposite, is for Ireland to leave. But that's not going to happen. Ireland has been very successful within the European Union. It has transformed society and people there. That is the real politic. The unique circumstances on the island of Ireland have not changed. And somehow we need to remind the party opposite and other members of that place. Northern Ireland is on the cusp of something. It is on the cusp of either great prosperity with the dual regulatory system or it is on the cusp of economic failure. It is our duty to decide which of those two paths we now want to support people there with. Investment does await. The fulcrum of being part of the EU and the United Kingdom is potentially very exciting 
for business and prosperity in Northern Ireland. Or we choose stagnation, indecision, fighting in the courts, arguments over the niceties of legal arguments and international treaties over the last 200 years, frightening off that investment which is so crucial for prosperity and security. But it's not just personal uh, now for me here. The fact of our break in an international agreement, the, the instability that causes, def definitely impacts businesses and people in my Bristol South constituency. Our international reputation, our stability, our rules-based economy as a safe place to do business is being totally trashed by this government. Our reputation is being shredded. And in the remaining minutes I have, Madam Deputy Speaker, I just want to alert members if they didn't follow uh, on the uh, Public Administration and Constitution Affairs Committee, of which I'm a member. We are currently doing an investigation into international treaties. We've had Lord Frost, and last week we had Professor Bartels from um, University of Cambridge. And when asked about the state of necessity, Professor Bartels said, I will say that you resort to a defence of necessity when it is necessary. In other words, you don't have anything else. The ultimate test of legislation is will it work, and this is clear that this will not work. It's a distraction. It's a distraction from the psychodrama within the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister, and it's truly shameful. Yeah. 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 Dr Andrew Murison. I'm grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's always a great pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady, although I have to say I profoundly disagree with the implication that those of us who decided Britain's place in the world was best served by, by leaving the European Union view the EU, let alone the Republic of Ireland, for goodness sake, as the enemy, to use her words. Clearly, that is not the case. My uh, right honourable friend, the Minister, who winds up, will be sport for choice in choosing speeches to comment upon. But if I can say so, in a very brief period of time, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Lagan Valley, in an intervention on the Honourable Member for North Down, pretty much nailed it uh, in his assertion. Uh, it is clearly the case uh, that the status quo is not compatible with the Good Friday Agreement, with the Acts of Union, and that the doctrine of necessity certainly applies in this case. It's remarkable, isn't it, that the protocols supporters appear to be uh, the party's opposite. Those that drafted it sit on these benches and are trying uh, to change it. I also enjoyed the remarks one or two uh, right honourable members made opposite, appearing to trenchantly support the other place in the hope uh, that they will defenestrate this bill, which I sincerely hope they fail to do. That said, though I welcome this bill, I hope it will be improved in committee and in the other place, in particular some of the swinging powers that this bill gives ministers will be clipped. I have to say to ministers also, whilst assuring them of my support this evening, that I remain somewhat bewildered by their refusal to consider, uh, in a meaningful way, triggering Article 16. That is already available to them, and nobody has marshalled a credible argument uh, that satisfies me, certainly, uh, that it could not be done, should not be done. The grounds for triggering Article 16 are clearly there, in that we don't have anything approaching proper governance in Northern Ireland, not at all. Despite the May elections, the Assembly has failed to assemble and the institutions are not working. Surely, to goodness, those are grounds, the strongest grounds possible for triggering Article 16, far stronger, I must say, uh, than the grounds chosen by the President of the European Commission early in 2021 to trigger this thing, albeit very briefly and ignominiously, uh, on the grounds of trying to prevent uh, vaccines transiting from the Republic of Ireland to Northern Ireland. Of course I will. I'm very grateful, my friend. He makes a very important point. Would he agree, too, that from a legal perspective, if Article 16 were to, were to be triggered, then at least we will be able to argue that we'd used all means available to us under the protocol, which is necessary to meet the necessity test, i.e. the state has exhausted all the options open to it before it then acts unilaterally. That's exactly the value of using Article 16. I absolutely agree with 
that it's, all, it's argued, of course it is, that the that triggering Article 16 is meant to be temporary. Well, those of us who have been around a bit realise that temporary very often turns into something far more permanent. Uh, but it would certainly be a reasonable first step in dealing with this, which we've all, we all agree here, pretty much all of us apart from the SDLP, uh, is an unsatisfactory uh, situation. Uh, and I'm still unsure, uh, despite my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary's um, uh, remarks earlier today, why it is that the government is not doing that. Perhaps the Minister, when he winds up, might like to uh, address that. Uh, I would also like to know where in this legislation there is a threat to the single market. Trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is pretty much a rounding error, as a point has been made by others. Uh, companies like Sainsbury's don't exist in the Republic of, of Ireland. Goods going to Sainsbury's in Northern Ireland from GB cannot possibly land up on shelves in uh, Sainsbury shelves in the Republic because there are no Sainsbury shelves in the Republic. There are more checks on this border uh, than on Chile. And checks for what? It's not clear to me at this particular point in time why we need to be doing checks since we have uh, agreement on tariff, we have standards and regulations that have not yet had the opportunity to diverge. Many contributions today have talked about the doctrine of necessity. What they haven't mentioned is that there is a second part to the doctrine of necessity. It's a lesser part, but it's germane nevertheless. It isn't dealing with grave or imminent peril. It allows parties to rescind an obligation if to do so would not quotes, seriously impair an essential interest of the states towards, towards which the obligation exists or of the international community as a whole. Where in this legislation and where indeed in triggering Article 16 would the threat to the single market come from? Indeed, I would argue, and ministers certainly have, uh, that the legislation before us is helpful in many respects to the single market, and it certainly is uh, to the internal market. So why is the European Union doing all this? Why isn't it giving Mr Sefovich Sef 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 uh, the powers that he needs in order to negotiate pro properly uh, with, firstly, uh, Lord Frost, and secondly, the Foreign <coughs> Secretary? Now, we can all suggest geopolitical reasons for doing it, and, of course, there are member states that are perfectly happy uh, for their own benefit uh, with the status quo. The Republic of Ireland probably is rather enjoying uh, the export opportunities that currently exist because Northern Ireland can't get, it, get what it needs from GB. Um, but we have to hope that the EU, even at this stage, will recognise the damage this is doing uh, to the Good Friday Agreement and the prospects of ongoing peace and harmony in Northern Ireland, even at this late stage. Uh, consider the interests of the people of Northern Ireland first, in which case this legislation will not be needed. Now, the government, in my view, signed the Northern Ireland Protocol in good faith. It was entitled to receive the same back from the European Union. After 18 months, it is plain as a pipe staff that that reciprocation has not happened. It's not as if there are not technical solutions to the problems that currently exist. I wrote about this in my report when I chaired the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee, and it distresses me that all this, all this time on, uh, nothing appears uh, to be done about the recommendations I made, and which others have made subsequently, that would deal with this perfectly elegantly. And of course, it may very well get worse, uh, with the SPS offset through the Movement Assistance Scheme uh, likely to be viewed as ultra vares by the uh, European Court of Justice and the prospect of energy VAT, which I hope very much will be reduced in GB, not being reduced in Northern Ireland, completely contrary uh, to the Good Friday uh, Agreement and the Acts of Union. The Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Leeds Central, who is no longer in his place, said the EU needs to move. Well, it does. It won't. I hope this legislation gets it moving. Martin Doherty Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's always good to follow the South, uh, member for South West Wiltshire, even though I'm going to profoundly disagree with them. I think it's also interesting that we now have a tantalising real-time example 
of what happens in the UK and a part of the UK is actually able to diverge from the current UK economic model. And it turns out not simply accepting lower growth than the south east of England in perpetuity in exchange for a guaranteed lump sum can actually be quite beneficial. And of course the government, the UK government it would seem, wants to put an end to it. But I think it's important, Madam Deputy Speaker, to take a historical view of where we are, because I think it behoves the British Government to remember its history, for its predecessors have been here before, Madam Deputy Speaker, quite a few times. The end of the Seven Years' War in 1763, there might have been a few folk here who were there back then, uh, was a catastrophic success for a newly fledged Great Britain. Victory over the perfidious Europeans gained a supremacy over both uh, the North American continent and possessions elsewhere. And let me quote from Professor Alan Taylor's Pulitzer Prize winning History of the American Revolution. Here he cites Henry Ellis, a colonial governor. What did Britain gain by the most glorious and successful war on which she ever engaged? A height of glory which excited the envy of the surrounding nations and an extent of empire uh, we were equally unable to maintain, defend or govern. Taylor adds, because of that triumph, the empire would reap a revolution in British America. And as we stand here, Madam Deputy Speaker, in these sunlit Brexit uplands, we must also consider the price that this modern-day uh, facsimile of George and Britain would have us pay for attaining their own heights of glory, because even then, the idea that this place, this legislature, should be supreme above all others also led them to make similar mistakes. Now, the contradictions of British North America, of course, were uh, slightly different to those we face today. Um, in short, while the colonialists like to distinguish themselves from their French and Spanish rivals uh, because they had a form of, now, let's not call it devolution, let's call it self-rule, that they were more democratic. We now know that that was somewhat erroneous, as it was a form of self-rule that was very much restricted to Protestant landowners. But while this made the ruling of the original 13 colonies relatively straightforward, the newly won possessions in New France did not fit that model. And so this parliament decided to pass the Quebec Act, which didn't go down too well with the Puritans in New England or elsewhere. The vastly expanded sphere of influence was also much more expensive to maintain. And so despite the warnings that this would not be appreciated, they decided to levy taxes for the first time on their colonial possessions, first through the Sugar Act, then the Currency Act, and then the Stamp Act, all the time ignoring the consequences for those who were being subjected to them, and slowly driving the wedge between England's interests and that of its periphery. Uh, the ministers maybe should listen. And we know what happened next. And the reason I take us on this American detour, Madam Deputy Speaker, is because we live in hope that the ministers on the benches opposite will reflect on how this wonderful wheeze designed to reassert primacy of this parliament here isn't going to work in places where people look to legislators which are closer to them. Well, they, I, no, I, I won't, I'm afraid I won't at this moment in time. I want to make some progress. Well, and quite, no, no, I'm going to make some progress. And quite simply, maybe in the 18th century or the 21st, bringing forward legislation that damages the economic self-interest of those in the periphery in order to benefit those in the core is never going to end well, especially when it solely satisfies the desires, in this case those of the parliamentary sovereignist fetishists, which do not represent any real majority, even in the core. Let me maybe bring it to a conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, from a quote from Edwin, uh, Edmund Burke, not only the father of conservatism, but an Irishman and a unionist to boot. Now, well, remember, many will remember his quote from the reflections on the revolution in France. Uh, people will not look forward to posterity who never look backwards to their ancestors. Besides, the people of England will know well that the idea of, in the idea of inheritance furnishes a sure principle of conservation and a sure principle of transmission. But I think the one that is more pertinent to our discussions is a few paragraphs later. The institutions of policy, the goods of fortune, the gifts of providence are handed down to us and from us in the same course and order. How providential it is then that this conservative unionist government's blessed inheritance 
And this state's institutions of policy are to repeat the same mistakes that it's always made. And it's a shame, Madam Deputy Speaker, for the people of Northern Ireland that the economic and political damage of this bill is to be visited on them in this manner. David Simmons. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I was very struck by the comments of the member for Bristol South, who talked about the fact that when we debate issues relating to Ireland in this place, we don't often pay sufficient respect and attention to the complex politics of Northern Ireland. And I think it's been good that in the debate tonight, there's been a very thorough airing of different perspectives that certainly have illuminated my thinking on it. And when we consider that Ireland remains the fourth largest destination for UK exports, the tenth largest source of imports into the United Kingdom. For Northern Ireland, 40% of goods exports go to Ireland and 36% of imports come across from Ireland. It's clear that it is a very important economic relationship and in the context of addressing the cost of living and other things which we know are important from debates in this House, a very important relationship. And I'm persuaded, as my honourable friend, the member for Newcastle and Deline outlined in his contribution earlier on, that although we have many concerns about elements of this bill, it's right to give the government the benefit of the doubt, to create that space for the negotiation which we've heard is happening in good faith, with a view to seeking a negotiated agreement to address these issues, and recognising if that goes wrong, we need to have the ability to protect our position in due course. Now, Rice, Northern and Pinner is a very long way from Northern Ireland. But it's of enormous interest to my constituents, because my constituency includes a very large number of people who are small and medium-sized exporters and importers. And I've heard of many constituency surgeries, directly from many of those businesses, that the issues that are contained both directly in this debate about Northern Ireland, but more generally the issues it is that affect our international trade, are incredibly important to them. I wanted to start by highlighting the very exciting judgment of the European Court of Justice, number C213-19, which is the judgment in respect of legal action against the United Kingdom for long-term and persistent failure to undertake proper border controls during our period as a member of the European Union. And by long-term, I mean going back at least to 2005. So governments of all parties have a degree of responsibility in this matter. And clearly it is important in this House that we ensure in that context of trust that when we talk about arrangements, whether it is green lanes and red lanes or any other part of the United Kingdom's international trading arrangements, that we demonstrate that we have effective customs and border controls in which people can have confidence. Because my small and medium importers and exporters do not wish to be undercut, as that judgment highlights, by fake imported goods brought in through the United Kingdom, which for some time was notorious as an EU member state for failing to undertake this work properly. So we need to take that, Madam Deputy Speaker, very seriously. And in respect of our attitude to international law, I very much agree with the point that was made by the member for Abercrombie. It is not a fair comparison to say that this bears any relationship to what's being said about the likes of Vladimir Putin. But I certainly heard at my recent visit to the European Court of Justice uh, in Strasbourg, that when those who are charged with enforcing those judgments, many of which are about commercial disputes, they're about property assets, they're about the ability of families to enforce their rights to family life, that when they are enforcing those judgments in countries where governments are disinclined to follow the law, there is always a degree of pushback from the diplomats representing those countries who say, well, if a founding father state of the European Convention on Human Rights is saying it disagrees with those laws, why should we follow them? And that impacts my constituents and all of our constituents. So we need to demonstrate that we remain absolutely committed to upholding the highest standards of the rule of law. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think it's really important as we debate these issues that we remain focused on the benefits we expect this future arrangement to bring to the people of Northern Ireland as part of our United Kingdom. It is true, and many members have referred to it, that the latest release 
from the Office of National Statistics suggests that where my constituency is in London, we saw a 2.3% GDP growth, a strong rebound from COVID. And the second highest part of the United Kingdom was Northern Ireland with 1.4% GDP growth. And it's certainly been helpful to me to hear from a number of members on the benches opposite about some of the nuances of that, what it means for services versus goods and how that is impacting in the communities of Northern Ireland, because we do need to get this right. But the complexity of it is demonstrated by the point that was made at the dispatch box at the very start of this debate, that making sure that the benefits of decisions that we make extend to all parts of our United Kingdom. And that example of the removal of VAT from products that are designed to improve uh, green energy and improve environmental friendliness. I note that on the 7th of December 2021, the European Council of Finance Ministers took the decision to enable the exemption, the removal of VAT on all of these products, about four months before that decision was made and presented to this House, a decision which I very much support. I would ask when ministers are summing up, can they explain why it is that when that benefit has been felt across England, Wales and Scotland, and we are told that it's not possible to see that benefit in Northern Ireland, given that it also exists and existed before it existed in this place under EU rules, why we've not been able to ensure that people in Northern Ireland could have the benefit of the investment that that would prompt in ensuring that homes and businesses enjoyed the highest standards of environmental friendliness. So finishing, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I started, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt very much to the Government this evening. As this goes through the House, there will be the opportunity to explore many of the issues that I and others have raised. But it is important that we demonstrate that we are taking these issues extremely seriously and that we are demonstrating for the benefit of our biggest trading partner in the European Union and also our people in our United Kingdom that we are determined to negotiate in good faith and achieve an agreement together. Yeah. Yeah. Ian Paisley. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for Ruslip for his very thoughtful comments and speech. And it's a pleasure to follow him in this debate. Madam Deputy Speaker, this debate reminds me a wee bit like the story of the man who asked for directions in Northern Ireland. He said, could you tell me how to get the listen of Gunya? And the man said, I wouldn't start from here. And that debate, this debate around the protocol in Northern Ireland is a wee bit like that whenever we, uh, go, whenever we actually start to examine it. Because the government knows, and indeed the member for Maidenhead, the former Prime Minister, made it very, very clear in her comments tonight, her very um, cutting comments tonight to the front bench, that our party warned in 2019 and before onwards about this matter, warned that it would cause problems, warned that the protocol was going to uh, not work, and that uh, those warnings unfortunately fell on deaf ears. So it is right and proper that the government does take actions this evening. I remember sitting in the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee and the former Secretary of State, who is unfortunately not in this place but who spoke earlier, the former Secretary of State, whenever he commented on the protocol, and I asked him directly then, would the protocol put in place any barriers, any friction to trade in Northern Ireland? He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It will all be light touch. Well, it's the heaviest touch I think anyone has ever seen in terms of trading relationships within these islands. And uh, so the words which were given to us by the then government and by the current government, we do weigh very carefully and cautiously. And I believe that this bill and the government's decision to bring it to the House is welcome. I do believe that their mettle will now be tested. I believe their steadfastness will now be tested. And as it was put on the record by the Foreign Secretary, their patriotism will now be tested by this matter. And I think that this House will then be left to judge, is the government sincere? I know on these benches we definitely hope that they are. And we believe that our word can be counted on and trusted. It is now up to the government to prove by its actions that its words can be counted and believed in and uh, be shown to be true. The Foreign Secretary, in, in a communication to the um, Select Affairs Committee, made it very, very clear that the problems of the protocol are about the disruption and divergence of trade, the significant costs and bureaucracy for businesses, and the undermining of the three, three strands of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and the collapse of the power-sharing arrangements at Stormont. 
And whilst we don't have time tonight to take each of those issues, I think the Foreign Sec Secretary quite rightly outlined some of the problems. Would the member give way? Of course, I'll give way. Uh, I thank the member for giving way, and in doing so, it's the diversion of trade and how that has impacted upon local suppliers from the rest of the GB market and how they are not being able to access the Northern Ireland market because of the bureaucracy and additional paperwork that is required. I, I, I thank the member uh, for, for drawing that to attention. This diversion of trade is absolutely critical and it was raised by the previous speaker uh, before me. By volume and value, local purchases from Great Britain are worth $13.4 billion to Northern Ireland. That is four times more valuable as imports from the Republic of Ireland, which stand at $3.6 billion. So just think of that, and I hope that answers the question that was put by the member of Ruslip about the value of trade in Northern Ireland. There, of the 16,000 businesses in Northern Ireland, 14,900 of them are small and medium-sized enterprises. And those small and medium enter enterprises cannot cope with the paperwork, the bureaucracy, and the cost of doing business in Northern Ireland. That's not a teething problem. Madam Deputy Speaker, that is a nightmare for trade. The uh, Department, or, or sorry, the Consumer Council last year published statistics about Northern Ireland. It said that over two thirds, that's sixty-eight percent, of people in Northern Ireland have experienced uh, UK online retailers no longer delivering to Northern Ireland. Sixty-eight percent have experienced this. Uh, 65 per cent, nearly two thirds, have experienced delays in delivery of goods from GB online retailers to Northern Ireland. Over half, 53 per cent, have experienced reduced access to products offered by GB, by GB retailers into Northern Ireland. Over 51 per cent have experienced an increase in the cost of goods bought online. Nearly a third, that's 29 per cent, have been charged customs related fees for parcels coming from GB. And this is part of the United Kingdom. This is not some far flung part of the world. This is a few hundred miles away. Part of this UK, and this is the impact that the protocol is having on the daily lives of citizens in Northern Ireland. Now, of course, people say, oh, but there's grace periods. Mm -hmm. Oh, last month, Mr. Sheskin made it clear that the grace periods, in his view, are illegal and they should not be used. And yet we hear from all across this House, oh, let's have negotiations. We do not have a willing negotiating partner in this negotiation. Hence, for the last year, the government has told Europe in a white paper Article 16 could be invoked. And instead of having a welcome from the opposition and from other parties, for the last almost 12 months we have heard, do not dare invoke Article 16. Absolutely. It's a step too far. It would be an atrocious action. And yet tonight, when the government says it's not gone too far, we have to go beyond Article 16. We have to bring in this bill to solve these problems that have been discussed. The member for Leeds Central puts out a little gambit to the House tonight. Oh, why don't we invoke Article 16? Only within 20 seconds to be shot down by his front bench because they would not support invoking Article 16. I think the hypocrisy is not lost on members in this House of how difficult a situation we're in and how urgent the requirement is upon this government to fix it. And I call on the government to move expeditiously to fix this matter. We have had over 300 hours of negotiations up until March of this year with the EU, and they have not budged. Their mandate will not move. And the Labour Party may have been suffering from amnesia or else make believe when they thought they were ne negotiating with us on this matter in their earlier comments. But there have been no negotiations with the Democratic Unionist Party, with the Labour Party. There have been no negotiations with the, far, with the Shadow Foreign Secretary and this party on any of this matter. And the Shadow Secretary of State can mutter and mumble from a sedentary position. He knows it is true. There's been none. Because there have been no negotiations in this process because Europe pulled stumps. They have not extended their mandate because they don't want to negotiate. I wish they would. We would quite happily, because 
within the provisions of the protocol, it is very clear that under Article 18, under Article 13 brackets 8, under Article 164, it can be lawfully suspended, and it should be. And indeed, we would welcome that to have happened, but it has now come so far. The price is great, Madam Deputy Speaker. Fixing this protocol issue, we get devolution back. So let's fix it. Stephen Kinnock. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for North Antrim. Madam Deputy Speaker, as a patriot, there are many things that make me proud to be British. But perhaps what makes me proudest of all is that so many people and so many governments across the world see Britain as a law-abiding country that plays by the rules, as a country that is a consistent, reliable and trustworthy international partner, as a country that treats its allies with respect and always defends the rules-based international order, and as a country that acts in good faith, which has a sense of fair play hardwired into its DNA, and as a country that is capable of tremendous feats of statecraft, such as the Good Friday Agreement, one of the proudest achievements of any Labour government. And yet here we are this evening, Madam Deputy Speaker, debating a bill that takes a unilateral wrecking ball to an international treaty that the Prime Minister himself signed and described as an excellent deal just 30 months ago. Because let's be clear, this bill fundamentally undermines our reputation as a nation that upholds the rule of law. And this really matters, Madam Deputy Speaker, because geography is destiny. Whether the party opposite likes it or not, what happens on the European continent is of pivotal importance to Britain's security and prosperity. Because when Europe thrives, we thrive. When Europe slumps, we slump. And when Europe fights, we fight. Well, Martin, your friend, give way on that I will give way. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm very grateful to Martin, Wolfram for giving way. Um, he's making an excellent speech and obviously speaking from great experience internationally. Does he agree with me that not only he's about, I presume, to refer to the events in Ukraine, not only the Ukraine war is a very pressing issue where we need to cooperate fully, but there are many other international crises which we're dealing with at the moment as a country, including the climate emergency and a number of other matters. Does he agree with me, therefore, that it's vital that we work in partnership with our colleagues? My honourable friend makes an excellent point and he understands that uh, foreign policy begins at home, that if you don't have your own house in order, your ability to project influence, to build alliances and to speak with moral authority is fundamentally undermined and that is precisely the point that he's making. From trade to diplomacy, from defeating Putin's barbarism to tackling the climate emergency and from scientific cooperation to responding to the rise of an increasingly authoritarian China, our democratic partners and allies across the Channel should always be at the heart of our foreign policy. But instead of recognising this basic reality, ministers are stuck in what my honourable friend the Shadow Foreign Secretary has called a fever dream of 2016. Rather than seek constructive solutions, they pick fights with their, our closest neighbours and introduce this deeply destructive bill, which is a clear breach of international law and which is designed solely to inflame tensions and chase Daily Mail headlines. With inflation soaring, with the country facing a cost of living crisis, with war on the European continent, this is the worst possible time for this bill to arrive. So why are they doing it, Madam Deputy Speaker? Who in their right mind would seek to sow division when now more than ever we need to be standing shoulder to shoulder with our European friends and partners? Well, the explanation is clear, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister has made a calculation, and as usual, his calculation has nothing to do with the national interest and everything to do with saving his own skin. Because the Prime Minister knows that it's the European Research Group and their fellow travellers that are calling the shots, and he knows that he must have their support if he is to continue squatting in Downing Street. Just like his two predecessors, his fate now lies in the hands of the ERG. And just like his two predecessors, he foolishly seems to believe that he can appease them yeah. by throwing them some red meat from time to time. It really is extraordinary, Madam Deputy Speaker, that Conservative Prime Minister after Conservative Prime Minister has failed to learn a simple lesson of 21st century British politics, 
which is that you can never satisfy the ERG. No matter how much red meat you throw to them, their hunger will never be sated. They will always come back for more. And right now, Madam Deputy Speaker, they are once again at the height of their powers because the outcome of the no-confidence vote has maximised their leverage and given them a Prime Minister who, when they order him to jump, responds by asking how high. And not only that, it's given them a Foreign Secretary whose leadership ambitions depend on their support. So the planets really have a line for the ERG, Madam Deputy Speaker, on the benches opposite. But for our country, not so much. Because out there in the real world, the impacts of the Prime Minister's botched Brexit are being felt by working families and businesses across the country. Our exporters are suffocating under mountains of red tape. Import frictions are driving inflation up. And next year, we're forecast to have the lowest growth of any country in the G20 apart from Russia. The fact is the party opposite is unable to point to a single net economic benefit of the disastrously bad deal that they negotiated. Not one. Indeed, last week, the Minister for Brexit Opportunities was asked to name a single benefit of the Prime Minister's botched Brexit deal. The only thing he could come up with is that the road signs in the Dartford Tunnel can be changed from metres to yards. You couldn't make it up, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's almost as, ab as absurd as the apparent legal basis for this bill, which we are told is the doctrine of necessity that requ requires grave and imminent peril. But if the peril is so imminent, why has the government chosen a route that will require months of passage through Parliament? Well, we know the answer to that question too, Madam Deputy Speaker, because the only thing that's in grave and imminent peril is the Prime Minister's job. But the fact that the Prime Minister's botched Brexit deal is so clearly failing to deliver any of the economic benefits that were promised is not only bad news for the jobs and livelihoods of the British people, it's also bad news for our relations with the European Union and with in our international reputation more broadly. Because the more obvious it becomes that the deal is fundamentally flawed and failing, the more the Prime Ministers and others who heralded it as a triumph when they signed it will start looking for scapegoats, pointing fingers and lashing out. They'll blame the EU. They'll blame those who voted Remain. They'll blame the civil service. They'll blame the judges. In short, they'll create a smokescreen of sob stories and grievance, which they hope will obscure their own profound incompetence. And they will use the passage of this bill and other ruses, such as the Bill of Rights and the Rwanda Plan, to whinge and rant about the saboteurs and the conspirators, because they will always try to play the victim card, and they'll never stand up and take responsibility. And there's nothing patriotic about that, Madam Deputy Speaker. So to sum up, the purpose of this bill is not constructive, it is deliberately destructive. It is not seeking to solve a problem, it's seeking to fuel grievance and shirk responsibility. It's not dis diplomacy or statecraft, it's a piece of reputation trashing vandalism. And this House should treat it with the contempt that it deserves. Thank you. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome this bill and its second reading in this House today, and I welcome that the Government now recognises the very significant problems caused by the protocol, the damage it is doing to political stability, to community relations and to vast swathes of our, of our economy in Northern Ireland and indeed to businesses in GB. The bill is recognition of and an appropriate response to the unreasonableness that is intrinsic within the protocol and how, despite protracted engagement with the EU, the only thing more unreasonable than the protocol itself is the EU's attitude. Their obstinance approach to those intent on finding common sense solutions, solutions that will undo the damage we see in Northern Ireland, brings us here today. Solutions that with good will on all sides can work for everyone. That is what my party desires, solutions that work for everyone and can be supported by everyone. Madam Deputy Speaker, I know there are members in this House who today will rail against this legislation and we have heard some of them already. It is worth reminding the House that some of those same voices are those who have called for the rigorous implementation 
of the protocol, but have realised begrudgingly at least some of the issues with the protocol. The same people say the way to deal with the protocol is through negotiation, and no reasonable person is opposed to negotiation. However, might I suggest they listen to Mara Sajdrovic, who holds some form of demigod status in the eyes of the SDLP and Alliance, who has stated adamantly that renegotiating the protocol is unrealistic. Madam Deputy Speaker, while those who oppose this bill deal with the unrealistic, this party and now the government are dealing with the real problems caused by the protocol. The huge administrative burden and associated cost foisted upon businesses because of the sea border, the increase in transport costs that is making bring goods to Northern Ireland more expensive, the banning of items from import into Northern Ireland from other parts of the United Kingdom, the constitutional change for which there is no consent. It is time for these parties to wake up, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I would commend the many that have spoke in support uh, of this bill right across this House today. Uh, the transfer window is open. Members can transfer. They can switch. Uh, from Team EU to Team Northern Ireland, and it is time they joined with those of us whose intent is to resolve these issues for the betterment of our economy. Of fundamental importance, too, is the urgent need to restore the consensus principle that has been so fundamental in our political process. Madam Deputy Speaker, this House has heard in so many debates around the withdrawal agreement and protocol that the Belfast Agreement must be protected. Madam Deputy Speaker, members across this House need to ask themselves if they really mean that, because if they do, they will recognise the cornerstone of our political process is consensus. We need to get back to consensus progress, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker. The reality is that no unionist elected to this place or the Northern Ireland Assembly accepts the protocol, not one. That ought to be of concern to all who value the progress made in Northern Ireland. So I make a sincere appeal to members and to those I urge parties for whom unionist opposition to the protocol has been met with ridicule, with sneering and ignorance, dismissal, to ask themselves if they share that desire to get us back on track to consensus progress and stop the slide into division and destruction of what we have achieved. Madam Deputy Speaker, I urge the government to stay on the course and ensure the bill, that, that this bill passes this House with haste, but also without amendment that is only designed at undoing the proposed solutions contained within it. We need to get Northern Ireland back on track. I urge colleagues to back this bill and help do just that. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, um, it's always a pleasure to speak in this House. On any occasion, even bigger pleasure to speak in tonight on this issue. Uh, as we all know, this is of a tremendous importance to us all across Northern Ireland. Indeed, I would say further across all of this United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Some fantastic speeches so far. Uh, I thank all of those who contributed uh, and those who did it in a positive way. As, as one, and I'm very pleased to be the MP for Strangford. It's not a secret. It's probably been the, uh, one of the highlights of my life. Uh, it's always a pleasure to reflect those viewpoints in this chamber as well. Uh, and the majority of the people of my constituency of Strangford are very clear in their opposition to the, 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 the uh, border down the Irish Sea. They're very opposed to the restrictions that come in off the back of that. 99% of my businesses in my constituency have expressed their concern. So whenever I hear people saying, well, you know, the business's life was doing well, I think it was a member for North Down said that, you know, well, we're not that far away, but he's in a different world. Uh, I mean, he's in North Down, I'm in Frankfurt, he's in a different world, so I can't really quite understand what he's on about. Um, at the same time, uh, last week, the Secretary of State um, uh, in questions to Northern Ireland questions referred to, uh, he said there was 200 businesses uh, that had stopped trading between the United Kingdom of Northern Ireland. Well, I, I could tell tell everyone in this house I have at least 200 businesses in my area alone that are not trading today, so I suspect the number is greater. Examples, farmers, uh, when do they take their cattle to Carlisle uh, markets as they do, if they don't sell the cattle, they have to put them in quarantine for six weeks and pay that money before they can get them home, all because 
of, of the protocol and the, and the problems that we have. My fishermen uh, uh, from Port of Ogi, and I represent those in Ardglass and, and Kilkeel as well because their MP doesn't come to this place, but then that's up to him. He would, he would speak out in the square outside, but he wouldn't come in here. It wouldn't darken this place. Um, but I speak for them as well. They have extra uh, tariffs for them for their fish, you know, the bureaucracy and the red tape. And for them, this isn't working. For the engineering works, for the car salesmen, for the nurseries, for the people who just, just to buy just seeds from, from, the, from the nurseries across here, they can't buy them anymore. The packet of seeds that was £2 is now £16 because the, 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 the postage and packages has added that price onto it. So these are the examples of, of my constituents and what they face each and every day. And then there are others in this house as well who tell us that um, this isn't affecting, it only affects the unionists. No, it doesn't. Because I've had nationalists who come to me and I quote them, and I'm going to say it again, I said it earlier on in the intervention, uh, who, who, from, uh, from a national tradition, and yet feel afraid to voice complaints to their own <coughs> plea due to fear of reprisal. But I speak with confidence when I say that Northern Ireland as a whole needs this bill not simply for cultural identity, which is imperative, but for financial viability for small businesses and the effects of the EU's vindictive approach to block VAT and state aids. In fact, not simply those who designate as unions, but those who designate as, as a nationalist as well. So it affects everybody in the province and it affects their pocket. Uh, and it's quite clear. I can recall uh, as, a, as a boy, the Margaret Thatcher, former Prime Minister, she, she told us in Northern Ireland that you know what, uh, uh, Northern Ireland is British as Finchley. Well, to, with, the, with the bill and, the, and, and as the Brexit bill has come through, with the land border down the sea, it's quite clear to me that we're not as British as Finchley. But I want to be, uh, because I'm very proud of my British heritage. I'm very proud to have served in the British Army for 14 and a half years. I'm very proud to be British. And, and, and from Northern Ireland, I, I, I love to tell everybody that I'm a member of this parliament. I love to tell people I'm from the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland because it means something to me. But it means something to every one of us sitting here. And it means so much that we want to have this Northern Ireland protocol brought forward in a way uh, that can make us as British as what you are. So that's what I want to be. That's what we want to be. And we need this Northern Ireland protocol still here tonight to make that happen. The, the, um, the, the absolute disgraceful disregard shown towards the unionist people of the province by delegates uh, from other countries and, and the EU, boy, they, they stink to the high heavens, I tell you. Uh, <laughs> that, I, I would say that without any doubt. And if they're sitting in an EU and Brussels today, listen, I'm telling you again, they stink to the high heavens. And the quicker we're, we're, we're away from those ones, the better. Um, this is a very simple issue that's been misunderstood and clearly needs as a matter of urgency. The protocol stops tax and VAT. The protocol hampers small businesses from their number one market. The protocol makes Northern Ireland, my country, a third country. The protocol undermines the Belfast Agreement. And finally, for the good of nationalist, unionist and republican as well, yes, and there's some here, uh, the protocol must come to an end and allow common sense, common decency and common respect be the bill of the day. I'm very pleased, and I said to, to the Minister on the day that we had our uh, pre-notification of this, I'm very pleased to see the changes in the CJEU. I welcome those because it removes the direct jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of the European Union to this place. And it should be here that the, the people of Strangford, the people of Over Ban and Lagan Valley and East Belfast and all the members who are here, it should be this place that makes those decisions. It shouldn't be Brussels. It shouldn't be the European Court of Justice. So I'm very pleased to see that change coming. And I know that uh, uh, I've said to the Secretary of State about this in the past. Uh, indeed, I think it was about September of last year. My uh, for, uh, friend and colleague for, for North Adam asked questions about East West. I asked questions about the European Court of Justice. Very pleased to see the changes coming through this bill. So uh, again, it, it is for me uh, a, a very positive thing. So when it comes to, believe it or not, from dog biscuits to daffodils, from picture frames to potato bread, from engine parts to eggs, from artificial flowers to antibiotics, <coughs> the EU has had ample opportunity to change their approach and allow trade to continue unhampered. The, UP, the EU is just like a, a giant sponge. You know, all they want to do is they want to take everything from you, but they don't want to give you anything. So tonight we're asking for, for the EU sponge to be lifted off our back and, and to give us the same opportunities as the rest of the United Kingdom. And, and for us, it's about uh, making sure the EU knows their place. It's past time to stop begging them and asking them to act like the sovereign state we are. And, and it's up to us to take back control of British produce, of British people and British protocol. The working uh, poor to the wealthy business owners protocol has detrimentally affected 
and I believe this will not that tonight we have the Northern Ireland Protocol to make the changes to make it happen. I love this Great Britain of the United Kingdom and, and, and Northern Ireland. It's no secret. It's a, it's a pleasure and a, and, a, and a pride for me to be here. I'm proud to have my Union flag, Union flag flying above my house. I'm proud to have my Ulster flag flying. I'm proud to have the Queen's Jubilee Platinum flag flying as well. That's what I am. I want to be as British as everybody else. Do the right thing for us. Yeah. Yeah. Shadow Minister Peter Kyle. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I want to begin by, with an apology to victims of crimes committed during the Troubles in Northern Ireland. They were expecting the committee stage of the Legacy Bill today. Several had booked, their, had booked and paid for their plane and train tickets, their money now wasted. For the Government, changing parliamentary timetable might be trivial, but for victims and their families, such behaviour only adds to the pain and frustration of decades of hurt. And it exposes the truth that Northern Ireland and its unique sensitivities are just not taken seriously by this Government. As the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead said, if time were truly important, as the Government's legal argument of necessity implies, then this Bill would have been introduced as emergency legislation, or at least rushed through. There is only one real necessity in this Bill at this time, and that is to try and distract from the catastrophic performance at the ballot box last week, and to fire the starting gun for the Foreign Secretary's leadership bid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Once again, exactly. the Tory civil war is infecting our politics. Once again, Northern Ireland is paying the price. Yeah. This House deserves yeah. better. Yep. Northern Ireland be deserves good. better. Yep. Victims of the Troubles certainly deserve better. Yep. Government are claiming to act on behalf of communities in Northern Ireland by tearing up the protocol. Yet in the very same week, they are simultaneously ignoring the opposition from all Northern Ireland communities because opposition to their bill to deal with the murders and acts of terror during the Troubles is universal. Every party from every community opposes it, yet they plough on. Government is picking and choosing the parts of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement according to whatever its political needs are in any particular moment. For example, one justification for tearing up their Brexit deal is the loss of community support for the protocol. This totally ignores one essential fact. They never had it to start with. The DUP and Unionists have been very consistent from the very beginning when it comes to the protocol. They opposed it. When ministers were drafting and negotiating the protocol, the consent of the Unionists was never sought and it was never given. As the right honourable member from North Thanet said, they even voted against it in this House. So now, how can it be claimed to have disappeared? It was never there to begin with. In fact, in 2019, when the Prime Minister presented the protocol to Parliament, he said in his response to Lord Dodds, and I quote, the people of this country have taken a great decision embracing the entire four nations of this country. By a simple majority vote that went 52-48 and which we are honouring now. He went on. I think that principle should be applied elsewhere, and I see no reason why it should not be applied in Northern Ireland as well. It is fully compatible with the Good Friday Agreement. That was the Prime Minister speaking here to this House on the 19th of October 2019. And now we have an entire bill which reveals the Prime Minister was not truthful with the House as he tried to sell the protocol. Let's turn to another promise made and broken by this government. Page 5 of the Tory manifesto could not be clearer. It says, and I quote, no renegotiation. So when the Foreign Secretary says, as she did at the dispatch box just earlier today, that, and I quote, the EU are not agreeing to change the text of the protocol, as, her, as is her basis for this bill, it exposes yet another broken manifesto promise. 14 million voters who believed that promise has been betrayed. But this is all perfectly in line with this government's approach to Northern Ireland. It picks and chooses issues depending on where it, whether it serves whatever grievance they happen to have and be peddling at any moment in time. Their approach is reckless and neglectful. When the politics of Northern Ireland demands sustained, diligent support, 
The government looks the other way. When the Northern Ireland executive collapsed in February, the Prime Minister didn't visit Stormont to fulfil the vital role of honest broker to help parties find a way forward. He did make it to Saudi Arabia, India and the United Arab Emirates. Five months later, and only when the challenges in Stormont became unignorable, he found time for a fleeting visit. The biggest challenge facing Northern Ireland isn't the protocol. It's this neglectful government. All parties in Northern Ireland want to see progress on the protocol. On these benches, we have called for the EU and government to get back round the negotiating table. There are large areas of common ground which show that successful negotiation is possible, as my right honourable friend, the member for Leeds Central, outlined very eloquently. The UK, EU and all parties in Northern Ireland have identified areas of improvement and many of them clearly overlap. This appears to be the only negotiation in history that has failed because everyone agrees. We have consistently said the EU must show more flexibility over Northern Ireland. But the way to unlock it is by engaging, negotiating, the very things Britain used to be good at. Because the overwhelming number of issues raised in this bill are negotiable with statecraft, diligence, and graft. Take the veterinary agreement. New Zealand negotiated and signed one with the EU. No rows, no psychodrama, no law-breaking legislation. They just sat round the table and put the hard work in. With statecraft, diligence and graft, it's possible to reach an agreement on outstanding issues with the protocol. A veterinary agreement, data sharing deal, would remove the need for the vast majority of remaining checks. And that's what this ultimately comes down to, identifying those remaining products that face undue red tape in their journey to Northern Ireland. With Britain's great history of instigating, supporting and delivering global, historic agreements, is it not reasonable to expect our government just to get on and deliver it? And that's why we oppose this bill. It takes us further away from the negotiated progress. That is the only way forward. And it's worth putting the scale of the, the current Tory incompetence in perspective. The previous generation, including John Major and Tony Blair, they negotiated a framework that delivered peace in Northern Ireland. This lot can't even negotiate a prawn sandwich across the Irish Sea. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Madam Deputy well, Speaker. Secretary of State, order, order, order! Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, I would like to begin by thanking uh, all members who have spoken during this second reading debate. Uh, I will attempt, obviously, to respond to as many of the points raised as possible, um, maybe leaving out the Honourable Gentleman's choice of sandwich that he's been talking about uh, this evening and on various interviews. But there have been a huge number of thoughtful and uh, insightful speeches from a wide range of views across this House. Uh, this afternoon that I think shows the interest and the support for ensuring, certainly from our side of the House, uh, a resolution to the issues affecting the people of Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland Protocol, whilst agreed with the best of intentions, is causing practical problems for people and businesses in Northern Ireland, including trade disruption and diversion, significant costs and bureaucracy for traders. It cannot be right that it is easier to send goods from Great Yarmouth to Glasgow than it is to Belfast, still a part and an important part of the United Kingdom. Everybody in the United Kingdom should be able to access products and goods in the same way. Political life in Northern Ireland is, as it has been, built on compromise and power sharing between communities, as the member for North Antrim outlined. But the protocol does not have the support of all communities in Northern Ireland. As a result, we are seeing both political and social stress in Northern Ireland, including the lack of functioning of both the Northern Ireland Executive and the Northern Ireland Assembly, as rightly outlined by my right and honourable friend, the member for South Swindon. It is clear that the protocol has become a major political problem, and it is putting strain on the delicate balance inherent within the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And it is worth noting, and it might be forgotten from what some members opposite have said today, that in fact 
all parties, at some stage or another over the last few months, all party leaders in Northern Ireland have been clear that there is a need to change the Northern Ireland Protocol. This legislation is about preserving the wider social and political stability in Northern Ireland, finding a more stable and sustainable solution and ensuring that the frictions faced by businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland on goods coming from the rest of the United Kingdom are removed. It remains the preference of us, the UK Government, to achieve these benefits through negotiations. And these are negotiations that have been conducted by the Foreign Secretary and predecessors over the last 18 months. The lack of flexibility we have seen from the EU, as rightly outlined by my honourable friend, the member for Newcastle on the line, has led us to the point where it is right that we make a decision about taking forward a solution that works for the people of the United Kingdom and within the United Kingdom, the people of Northern Ireland. This bill will enable us to implement a successful negotiated settlement as well. It is important to recognise that this will require significant change in approach from the EU Commission, as a number of honourable friends have outlined this afternoon. I am afraid this change has not yet been forthcoming. The scale of problems and the depth of feelings aroused by the protocol have unfortunately, if anything, been exasperated rather than eased by the current EU approach. Whether it was through in just a moment, yes. Whether it was through triggering Article 16 over crucial vaccine supplies to Northern Ireland in January of 2021, or launching infraction proceedings following emergency easements to ensure the movement of food and parcels to Northern Ireland in March 2021, or repeatedly failing to show pragmatic flexibility in over 300 hours of negotiations over the last nine months, and continuing to insist on processes which would actually add to, rather than remove, the burdens currently felt by businesses moving goods to Northern Ireland. I'll give way to my honourable friend. My Has he noticed how it is the Labour case always to take the side of the EU when it is, yeah. when it is the EU in this case that is damaging the Good Friday Agreement and diverting trade expressly against the legal provisions of the protocol? My right honourable friend makes a, a very fair point, I have to say, and he will know from uh, attending some, some of the oral questions for Northern Ireland. Um, office that I have regularly had to stand in this dispatch box to listen to the uh, honourable gentleman opposite me continually taking the side of the EU, but then he does want to rejoin the EU, so I suppose we should not be surprised. We should also be very clear about the reality of when we hear about the flexibility of the uh, European Union and the offer that they have made uh, based on their October offer, that would actually be a backward step from the situation we currently have that is already not working for businesses and people in Northern Ireland. Yes. I thank the Secretary of State for giving way. Does he agree with me that if the Scottish Nationalist Party tonight vote against this, uh, this, this great piece of legislation, they will be voting to continue the situation where Scottish seed potatoes, the best quality, the best healthy seed potatoes in the world, will be banned from exports yeah. to Northern Ireland? Yeah. My right honourable friend is renowned for always speaking good sense, as he has done again with that intervention. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, I can go further. Um, one of the examples I was given not too long ago was the frustration of people in Northern Ireland not being able to secure supply from Great Britain of trees to plant for the Platinum Jubilee for the Queen's Canopy because of the threat to the single market. Well, the last time I saw trees uproot and walk across a border, it was Game of Thrones. And I would uh, happily <laughs> commend the Game of Thrones studio tour to everybody in this chamber when they visit Northern Ireland. Um, but that isn't a real situation of threat to the EU single market in a moment. The lack of progress and the subsequent failure of the Northern Ireland power sharing arrangements is exactly why we as a government must be prepared to act in the best interest of Northern Ireland and for the stability and delivery of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. Happy to well, he talks about the movement of, movement of goods. When I was Shadow Northern Ireland Minister, I have repeatedly asked him in the run-up to the final decisions why he did not prepare British businesses better about the agreement that he had made. He consistently said there is unfettered access always both ways. Why were British businesses not prepared for the deal that he agreed? Yeah. Well, first of all, I say to the um, Honourable Lady, we have delivered unfettered access to Northern Ireland to Great Britain. I appreciate she is talking about where we have got the real challenges, Great Britain moving to Northern Ireland. There were flexibilities and vagueness and actually some areas of the protocol in terms of the implementation that were not resolved. That's why we had the grace periods. That's why we had to extend the grace periods. We now have the standstill. 
That's exactly why the EU's offer that they pretend offers flexibility is actually a backward step from where we are today and why nobody in this House should accept it unless they are determined to do damage to Northern Ireland. Madam Deputy Speaker, this legislation will fix the practical problems that the protocol has created in Northern Ireland. It will enable us to avoid a hard border, protect the integrity of the United Kingdom and safeguard the EU single market. Now, the right honourable gentleman, the member for the right honourable gentleman, the member for Tottenham, uh, spoke at some length in his opening remarks over half an hour this morning, earlier today. And yet, in the totality of those remarks, and the same for the honourable member for Hove, we heard no plan, no proposal, no alternative from the party opposite. Just words. Although there were two interesting points, I would say. The Honourable Member uh, raised the issue of the Magna Carta as something to show uh, how important treaties are. He's right, Magna Carta is an important piece of our history. He may want to recall that there were 63 clauses in it. Treaties evolved, that's why only four of them remain in place today. He also outlined, and I quote, he said, in our discussions, the DUP has consistently said that it wanted a negotiated settlement. I would gently say to him that seemed to be a surprise to all the members of the DUP. So he learnt something else. And he might be talking from a sedentary position, he might want to check Hansard. Now, what we have heard, as I say, is an outline of noise without any real proposals or any alternative. A lot of members, however, have raised important points around the issues of legality, particularly my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead. My right honourable friend, the member for Bromley and Chislehurst, a member for North Dorset, my honourable friend, the member for North Dorset, and others. I can assure this House that this legislation is not just necessary, it is lawful. Proceeding with this bill is legal in international law and in support of our prior obligations to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. The protocol is undermining all three strands of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, as the honourable member for Lagan Valley well outlined earlier on and the institutions that underpin it. It is the Government's assessment that the legislation is currently the only way to provide the means to alleviate the socio-political conditions whilst continuing to support the Protocol's overall objectives of including supporting North-South trade and cooperation and the interests of both the EU and the UK in ensuring that we will protect their single market whilst ensuring we are protecting the UK internal market. That is all aspects of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Now, we recognise that necessity can only exceptionally be invoked to lawfully justify non-performance of international obligations, and this was covered by my right honourable friend, the member for South Swindon, I think very eloquently. This is a genuinely exceptional situation, and it is only in the challenging, complex and unique circumstances of Northern Ireland that the Government has decided to bring forth this legislation. It has always been the position of this Government that should the operation of the protocol or withdrawal agreement be deemed to undermine the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, that this would take precedence as the prior commitment under international law. This was outlined by the then Attorney-General and the Secretary of State for DEXU, the Department of Exit in the European Union, back in March 2019. This was not just the understanding of the UK Government, it was the basis on which the protocol was agreed by both parties. And the text of the protocol itself is clear that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement should be protected in all its parts. We should all take note of the important and powerful words of Lord Trimble, an architect of the Good Friday Agreement. Now, many colleagues have also this afternoon raised the issue of Article 16. And whilst we have always reserved the right to take safeguarding measures under Article 16 and have made the case that since the summer of last year the threshold had been met, this bill is the most effective, efficient and sustainable way to address the far-reaching problems that have arisen as a result of the application of the protocol. Article 16 in itself does not solve the problems in the way this bill will. It is not only temporary, but it starts another process. And honourable members, such as my right honourable friend, the member for South Swindon, and others, including the member Stone, have talked about the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly. And we have been clear with all parties in Northern Ireland that we do need to see it. And I want to see the executive back up and running to deliver for the people in Northern Ireland. That has to be a priority for all of us. We want to see that assembly and executive as soon as possible. The people of Northern Ireland deserve a stable and accountable devolved government that delivers on the issues that matter most to them. And it is clear from the comments today that this bill 
is a key component that will see the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly return, as we have heard from comments from the member for East Antrim as well as the, member, the right honourable gentleman member for Lagan Valley. And I think we can all welcome those comments. It builds on the work that, and the, what I have heard in the conversations I have had in meeting with all party leaders who want to see Stormont returned. The new decade new approach agreement restored the devolved institutions after a three year impasse. And we all need to work together to uphold the stability that agreement provided. We as a government have a strong record in making sure the institutions are up and running after having too many years of hiatus. That new decade new approach agreement, as set out in legislation, provides for a period of up to 24 weeks for Northern Ireland's political representatives to restore functioning devolved institutions. I expect the parties to make full use of this time to engage with one another in earnest to restore fully functioning devolved institutions and to develop a programme of government which I have written to all the party leaders to encourage the work on. We do have a role on the international stage. The UK has shown what it stands for in the world, not just with rhetoric, but through actions, through our extensive support of Ukraine, our unprecedented offer to those fleeing political instability in Hong Kong, and our leadership of international institutions which are demonstrating again this week at the G7 and NATO summits. We have led the way on climate change as so many other areas. and That is why it is important, and we are focused on ensuring that we are acting within the bounds of international law. Indeed, we have repeatedly emphasised that it is only the rare exceptional circumstances in Northern Ireland that make this inter intervention necessary. Happy to give way. I thank the Minister for giving way. Just a, a point about a, a tweet that he issued on the 1st of January 2021, where he said, there is no Irish sea border. As we've seen today, the preparations the government and business have taken to prepare for the end of the transition period are keeping goods flowing freely around the country, including between GB and NI. Can you explain to the House how that tweet is compatible with this piece of legislation? Yeah, absolutely, and I appreciate the opportunity the Honourable Gentleman has given me to highlight that back in January, what that highlights is exactly what we expected to see from the behaviour from the European Union around the flexibility of how to implement the protocol. What we have actually seen since is reinforcing our point is that lack of flexibility, that lack of understanding actually of the nuances of Northern Ireland that have led us to the place that we are today. And I would just say gently to him when he's uh, chuntering from a sedentary position. But if he looks at the decisions we took last year to ensure that goods could continue to flow to Northern Ireland, they are decisions that we took under criticism at the time from the EU that have been vital to ensure stability in Northern Ireland and access to at least those products that have flown since, which those international parliaments themselves have recognised. The EU themselves have recognised there are problems with the Northern Ireland Protocol. They are just not willing to show the flexibility at the moment that is needed to resolve those issues. But we are clear that we will ensure that we protect the EU single market a tiny proportion of which could be deemed to be a theoretical risk, and that is why it is important that we get the balance right. Yes, perhaps you could uh, Secretary of State for giving way. Can the Secretary of State use the opportunity tonight, because there will be businesses listening to his every word this evening. In fact, it is probably box office uh, tonight in Northern Ireland, uh, amongst many businesses. And From clauses 4 through to clauses 13 of this bill, can I confirm that goods that enter into what has been called the Green Channel, going from GB to Northern Ireland, that they will, they will be treated the exact same way and manner as goods travelling from England to Scotland or England to Wales. The Honourable Gentleman makes a, a very important point, and it is absolutely our determination that this will show good, flexible, free flowing products from Great Britain to Northern Ireland in the same way as they would move from Great Yarmouth to Carlisle or to Birmingham or to London. That is what we want to deliver. One of the reasons we have taken what colleagues refer to as the Henry VIII powers is to, give us, to ensure that we are working with business to make sure that those regulations do deliver that free flow, flexible, lack of bureaucratic process that at the moment is deterring businesses from accessing Northern Ireland. I give way. Uh, uh, the Secretary of State refers to a very important point, and that is the regulations that this bill will give, um, uh, enable to be brought forward. And clause one is clear that nothing in this bill should harm the Act of Union. Will the Secretary of State confirm that, in respect of the regulations that will be brought forward from this bill, that they too will not do anything to harm the Act of Union? Absolutely, and that is why I think it was important to have that on the face of the bill. The right honourable gentleman is absolutely right. And it is also, let us just be clear, 
It is just under a quarter of a century now that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement has been the foundation of peace, stability and political progress in Northern Ireland. All three strands of the agreement, as we stand here today, are now under threat. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is a direct result of the protocol. This bill is the route to a solution. It is legal, it is necessary, it is right for the United Kingdom. Most importantly, it is not just right for the whole of the UK, it is right for the people and businesses of Northern Ireland. And it creates the environment to facilitate the return of a fully functioning executive. Absolutely. Now, while the party opposite have voiced criticisms, they propose no alternatives. Yeah. We yeah. are taking the decision to act to protect the hard won gains of the peace process in Northern Ireland. We owe it to the people of Northern Ireland to fix the problems, and that is why, as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, I commend this bill to the House. The question is. That the bill be now read a second time, as many as that opinion say, aye. Oh, no. On the contrary, no. no. Division, clear the lobby. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Tell aye. us for the ayes, Scott Mann and Michael Tomlinson. Tell us for the noes, Navendra Mishra and Mary Glid.
Raja. The eyes to the right, 295. The nose to the left, 221. The eyes to the right, 295. The nose to the left, 221. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. We now come to the programme motion to be moved formally. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the money resolution to be moved formally. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the ways and means motion to be moved formally. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And so we come to motion number five uh, relating to the European Security Committee and motion number six on the European Statutory Instruments Committee. Sir Bill Wigan to move. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move. The yeah. question is, as on the order paper, as may as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. And motion number seven relating to the Health and Social Care Committee. Not moved. Not moved. Mm. Motion number eight on the Home Affairs Committee. Motion number nine on the Justice Committee. And motion number ten on the Welsh Affairs Committee. Sir Bill Wigan. Thank you, Madam Minister. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order papers, may as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I beg to move that the House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. <laughs>